A preliminary chapter to Round the Moon by Jules Verne, a sequel to From the Earth to the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne Preliminary Chapter Recapitulating the First Part of This Work and Serving as a Preface to the Second During the year 1860-something, the whole world was greatly excited by scientific experiment unprecedented in the annals of science. The members of the Gun Club, a circle of artillerymen formed at Baltimore after the American War, conceived the idea of putting themselves in communication with the moon, yes, with the moon, by sending to her a projectile. Their president, Barbicane, the promoter of the enterprise, having consulted the astronomers of the Cambridge Observatory upon the subject, took all necessary means to ensure the success of this extraordinary enterprise, which had been declared practicable by the majority of competent judges. After setting on foot a public subscription, which realized nearly one million two hundred thousand dollars, they began the gigantic work. According to the advice forwarded from the members of the observatory, the gun destined to launch the projectile had to be fixed in a country situated between the zero and twenty-eighth degrees of north or south latitude, in order to aim at the moon when at the zenith and its initiatory velocity was fixed at 12,000 yards to the second. Launched on the 1st of December, at 10 hours, 46 minutes, 40 seconds p.m., it ought to reach the moon four days after its departure, that is, on the 5th of December, at midnight precisely, at the moment of her attaining her perigee, that is, her nearest distance from the earth, which is exactly 86,410 leagues, French, or 238,833 miles, mean distance, English. The principal members of the gun club, President Barbicane, Major Elphinstone, the secretary Joseph T. Maston, and other learned men, held several meetings at which the shape and composition of the projectile were discussed, also the position and nature of the gun, and the quality and quantity of the powder to be used. It was decided, first, that the projectile should be a shell made of aluminum with a diameter of 108 inches and a thickness of 12 inches to its walls, and should weigh 19,250 pounds. Secondly, that the gun should be a columbiad cast in iron, 900 feet long, and run perpendicularly into the earth. Thirdly, that the charge should contain 400,000 pounds of gun cotton, which, giving out six billions of liters of gas in rear of the projectile, would easily carry it towards the orb of night. These questions determined President Barbicane, assisted by Murchison, the engineer, to choose a spot situated in Florida, in 27 degrees 7 minutes north latitude, and 77 degrees 3 minutes west Greenwich longitude. It was on this spot, after stupendous labor, that the Columbiad was cast with full success. Things stood thus when an incident took place which increased the interest attached to this great enterprise a hundredfold. A Frenchman, an enthusiastic Parisian, as witty as he was bold, asked to be enclosed in the projectile, in order that he might reach the moon and reconnoitre this terrestrial satellite. The name of this intrepid adventurer was Michel Ardin. He landed in America, was received with enthusiasm, held meetings, saw himself carried in triumph, reconciled President Barbicane to his mortal enemy, Captain Nicholl, and as a token of reconciliation, persuaded them both to start with him in the projectile. The proposition being accepted, the shape of the projectile was slightly altered. It was made of a cylindro-conical form. 
this species of aerial car was lined with strong springs and partitions to deaden the shock of departure. It was provided with food for a year, water for some months, and gas for some days. A self-acting apparatus supplied the three travellers with air to breathe. At the same time, on one of the highest points of the Rocky Mountains, the gun club had a gigantic telescope erected, in order that they might be able to follow the course of the projectile through space. All was then ready. On the 30th November, at the hour fixed upon, from the midst of an extraordinary crowd of spectators, the departure took place, and for the first time three human beings quitted the terrestrial globe, and launched into interplanetary space with almost a certainty of reaching their destination. These bold travellers, Michel Ardin, President Barbicane, and Captain Nicholl, ought to make the passage in ninety-seven hours, thirteen minutes, and twenty seconds. Consequently, their arrival on the lunar disk could not take place until the 5th December at twelve at night, at the exact moment when the moon should be full, and not on the 4th, as some badly informed journals had announced. But an unforeseen circumstance, that is, the detonation produced by the Columbiad, had the immediate effect of troubling the terrestrial atmosphere by accumulating a large quantity of vapour, a phenomenon which excited universal indignation, for the moon was hidden from the eyes of the watchers for several nights. The worthy Joseph T. Maston, the staunchest friend of the three travellers, started for the Rocky Mountains, accompanied by the Honourable J. Belfast, director of the Cambridge Observatory, and reached the station of Long's Peak, where the telescope was erected which brought the moon within an apparent distance of two leagues. The Honourable Secretary of the Gun Club wished himself to observe the vehicle of his daring friends. The accumulation of clouds in the atmosphere prevented all observations on the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th of December. Indeed, it was thought that all observations would have to be put off to the 3rd of January in the following year, for the moon entering its last quarter on the 11th would then only present an ever-decreasing portion of her disk, insufficient to allow of their following the course of the projectile. At length, to the general satisfaction, a heavy storm cleared the atmosphere on the night of the 11th and 12th December, and the moon, with half-illuminated disk, was plainly to be seen upon the black sky. That very night a telegram was sent from the station of Long's Peak by Joseph T. Maston and Belfast to the gentlemen of the Cambridge Observatory, announcing that on the 11th of December at 8 hours 47 minutes p.m., the projectile launched by the Columbiad of Stones Hill had been detected by Messrs. Belfast and Maston, that it had deviated from its course from some unknown cause, and had not reached its destination, but that it had passed near enough to be retained by the lunar attraction, that its rectilinear movement had been changed to a circular one, and that following an elliptical orbit round the star of night, it had become its satellite. The telegram added that the elements of this new star had not yet been calculated, and indeed three observations made upon a star in three different positions are necessary to determine these elements. Then it showed that the distance separating the projectile from the lunar surface might be reckoned at about 2,833 miles. It ended with this double hypothesis. Either the attraction of the moon would draw it to herself, and the travellers thus attain their end, or that the projectile, held in one immutable orbit, would gravitate around the lunar disk to all eternity. With such alternatives, what would be the fate of the travellers? Certainly they had food for some time, but supposing they did succeed in their rash enterprise, how would they return? Could they ever return? Should they hear from them? These questions, debated by the most learned pens of the day, strongly engrossed the public attention. It is advisable here to make a remark which ought to be well considered by hasty observers. When a purely speculative discovery is announced to the public, 
it cannot be done with too much prudence. No one is obliged to discover either a planet, a comet, or a satellite, and whoever makes a mistake in such a case exposes himself justly to the derision of the mass. Far better is it to wait, and that is what the impatient Joseph T. Maston should have done before sending this telegram forth to the world, which, according to his idea, told the whole result of the enterprise. Indeed, this telegram contained two sorts of errors, as was proved eventually. First, errors of observation, concerning the distance of the projectile from the surface of the moon, for on the 11th December it was impossible to see it. And what Joseph T. Maston had seen, or thought he saw, could not have been the projectile of the Columbiad. Secondly, errors of theory on the fate in store for the said projectile, for in making it a satellite of the moon it was putting it in direct contradiction to all mechanical laws. One single hypothesis of the observers of Long's Peak could ever be realized that which foresaw the case of the travellers, if still alive, uniting their efforts with the lunar attraction to attain the surface of the disk. Now these men, as clever as they were daring, had survived the terrible shock consequent on their departure, and it is their journey in the projectile car which is here related in its most dramatic as well as its most singular details. This recital will destroy many illusions and surmises, but it will give a true idea of the singular changes in store for such an enterprise. It will bring out the scientific instincts of Barbicane, the industrious resources of Nicol, and the audacious humor of Michel Ardan. Besides this, it will prove that their worthy friend, Joseph T. Maston, was wasting his time while leaning over the gigantic telescope he watched the course of the moon through the starry space. End of chapter Chapter 1 of Round the Moon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne Chapter 1 From 20 minutes past 10 to 47 minutes past 10 p.m. As 10 o'clock struck, Michel Ardin, Barbicane, and Nicol took leave of the numerous friends they were leaving on the earth. The two dogs, destined to propagate the canine race on the lunar continents, were already shut up in the projectile. The three travellers approached the orifice of the enormous cast-iron tube, and a crane let them down to the conical top of the projectile. There an opening made for the purpose gave them access to the aluminum car. The tackle belonging to the crane being hauled from outside, the mouth of the Columbiad was instantly disencumbered of its last supports. Nicol, once introduced with his companions inside the projectile, began to close the opening by means of a strong plate, held in position by powerful screws. Other plates, closely fitted, covered the lenticular glasses, and the travellers, hermetically enclosed in their metal prison, were plunged in profound darkness. "'And now, my dear companions,' said Michel Ardan, "'let us make ourselves at home. I am a domesticated man and strong in housekeeping. We are bound to make the best of our new lodgings and make ourselves comfortable. And first let us try and see a little. Gas was not invented for moles.' So saying, the thoughtless fellow lit a match by striking it on the sole of his boot, and approached the burner fixed to the receptacle in which the carbonized hydrogen, stored at high pressure, sufficed for the lighting and warming of the projectile for a hundred and forty-four hours, or six days and six nights. The gas caught fire, and thus lighted, the projectile looked like a comfortable room with thickly padded walls, furnished with a circular divan, and a roof rounded in the shape of a dome. The objects it contained, 
arms, instruments, and utensils, securely fastened against the rounds of wadding, could bear the shock of departure with impunity. Humanly speaking, every possible precaution had been taken to bring this rash experiment to a successful termination. Michel Ardin examined everything, and declared himself satisfied with his installation. "'It is a prison,' said he, "'but a travelling prison, and, with the right of putting my nose to the window, I could well stand a lease of a hundred years. <laughs> "'You smile, Barbicane. Have you any arrière pensée Do you say to yourself, this prison may be our tomb?' tomb perhaps still i would not change it for mahomet's which floats in space but never advances an inch whilst michel ardan was speaking barbicane and nickel were making their last preparations nickel's chronometer marked twenty minutes past ten p m when the three travellers were finally enclosed in their projectile this chronometer was set within the tenth of a second by that of murchison the engineer barbicane consulted it my friends, said he, it is twenty minutes past ten. At forty-seven minutes past ten, Murchison will launch the electric spark on the wire which communicates with the charge of the Columbiad. At that precise moment we shall leave our spheroid. Thus we have still twenty-seven minutes to remain on the earth. Twenty-six minutes, thirteen seconds, replied the methodical Nicol. Well— exclaimed Michel Ardan, in a good-humoured tone. Much may be done in twenty-six minutes. The gravest questions of morals and politics may be discussed, and even solved. Twenty-six minutes well employed are worth more than twenty-six years in which nothing is done. Some seconds of a Pascal or a Newton are more precious than the whole existence of a crowd of raw simpletons." "'And you conclude, then, you everlasting talker?' asked Barbicane. "'I conclude that we have twenty-six minutes left,' replied Ardin. Twenty-four only,' said Nicol. "'Well, twenty-four, if you like, my noble captain,' said Ardin. Twenty-four minutes in which to investigate—' "'Michel,' said Barbicane, "'during the passage we shall have plenty of time to investigate the most difficult questions.' For the present we must occupy ourselves with our departure. Are we not ready? Doubtless, but there are still some precautions to be taken, to deaden as much as possible the first shock. Have we not the water cushions placed between the partition breaks, whose elasticity will sufficiently protect us? I hope so, Michel, replied Barbicane gently, but I am not sure. Ha! <laughs> the choker exclaimed michel ardan he hopes he is not sure and he waits for the moment when we are in case to make this deplorable admission i beg to be allowed to get out and how asked barbicane huh, said michel ardan it is not easy we are in the train and the guard's whistle will sound before twenty-four minutes are over twenty said nickel for some moments the three travellers looked at each other. Then they began to examine the objects imprisoned with them. "'Everything is in its place,' said Barbicane. "'We have now to decide how we can best place ourselves to resist the shock. Position cannot be an indifferent matter, and we must as much as possible prevent the rush of blood to the head.' "'Just so,' said Nicol. "'Then,' replied Michel Ardan, ready to suit the action to the word. Let us put our heads down and our feet in the air, like the clowns in the Grand Circus. <laughs> no, said Barbicane. Let us stretch ourselves on our sides. We shall resist the shock better that way. Remember that, when the projectile starts, it matters little whether we are in it or before it. It amounts to much the same thing. If it is only much the same thing, I may cheer up said Michel Ardan. "'Do you approve of my idea, Nicol? asked Barbicane. "'Entirely,' replied the captain. "'We've still thirteen minutes and a half.' "'That Nicol is not a man,' exclaimed Michel. "'He is a chronometer with seconds, an escape, 
and eight holes. But his companions were not listening. They were taking up their last positions with the most perfect coolness. They were like two methodical travellers in a car, seeking to place themselves as comfortably as possible. We might well ask ourselves of what materials are the hearts of these Americans made, to whom the approach of the most frightful danger added no pulsation. Three thick and solidly made couches had been placed in the projectile. Nickel and Barbicane placed them in the centre of the disc forming the floor. There the three travellers were to stretch themselves some moments before their departure. During this time, Ardin, not being able to keep still, turned in his narrow prison like a wild beast in a cage, chatting with his friends, speaking to the dogs Diana and Satellite, to whom, as may be seen, he had given significant names. "'Ah, Diana! Ah, Satellite!' he exclaimed, teasing them. "'So you are going to show the moon-dogs the good habits of the dogs of the earth. That will do honour to the canine race. If ever we do come down again, I will bring a cross-type of moon-dogs, which will make us stir.' "'If there are dogs in the moon,' said Barbicane, "'There are,' said Michel Ardin, "'just as there are horses, cows, donkeys, and chickens. I bet that we shall find chickens.' "'A hundred dollars we shall find none,' said Nicol. "'Done, my captain,' replied Ardin, clasping Nicol's hand. "'But, by the by, you have already lost three bets with our president, as the necessary funds for the enterprise have been found, as the operation of casting has been successful, and lastly, as the Columbiad has been loaded without accident, six thousand dollars.' "'Yes,' replied Nicol. Thirty-seven minutes, six seconds past ten. It is understood, Captain. Well, before another quarter of an hour you will have to count nine thousand dollars to the President, four thousand because the Columbiad will not burst, and five thousand because the projector will rise more than six miles in the air. I have the dollars, replied Nicol, slapping the pocket of his coat. I only ask to be allowed to pay. "'Come, Nicol, I see that you are a man of method, which I could never be. But indeed you have made a series of bets of very little advantage to yourself, allow me to tell you.' "'And why?' asked Nicol. And "'Because if you gain the first, the Columbiad will have burst, and the projectile with it, and Barbicane will no longer be there to reimburse your dollars.' "'My stake is deposited at the bank in Baltimore.' replied Barbicane simply, and if Nicol is not there it will go to his heirs. "'Ah! you practical men!' exclaimed Michel Ardin. "'I admire you the more for not being able to understand you.' Forty-two minutes past ten, said Nicol. "'Only five minutes more,' answered Barbicane. "'Yes, five little minutes,' replied Michel Ardin and we are enclosed in a projectile at the bottom of a gun nine hundred feet long, and under this projectile are rammed four hundred thousand pounds of gun-cotton, which is equal to one million six hundred pounds of ordinary powder. And friend Murchison, with his chronometer in hand, his eye fixed on the needle, his finger on the electric apparatus, is counting the seconds— preparatory to launching us into interplanetary space. "'Enough, Michel, enough,' said Barbicane, in a serious voice. "'Let us prepare. A few instants alone separate us from an eventful moment. One clasp of the hand, my friends.' "'Yes!' exclaimed Michel Ardin, more moved than he wished to appear, and the three bold companions were united in a last embrace. "'God preserve us!' said the religious Barbicane. Michel Ardin and Nicol stretched themselves on the couches placed in the centre of the disc. Forty-seven minutes past ten, murmured the captain. Twenty seconds more. Barbicane quickly put out the gas, and lay down by his companions, and the profound silence was only broken by the ticking of the chronometer, marking the seconds. 
Suddenly a dreadful shock was felt, and the projectile, under the force of six billions of litres of gas, developed by the combustion of the peroxyl, mounted into space. End of chapter. Chapter 2 of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 2 The First Half Hour. What had happened? What effect had this frightful shock produced? Had the ingenuity of the constructors of the projectile obtained any happy result? Had the shock been deadened, thanks to the springs, the four plugs, the water cushions, and the partition breaks? Had they been able to subdue the frightful pressure of the initiatory speed of more than eleven thousand yards, which was enough to traverse Paris or New York in a second? This was evidently the question suggested to the thousand spectators of this moving scene. They forgot the aim of the journey, and thought only of the travellers. And if one amongst them, Joseph T. Maston, for example, could have cast one glimpse into the projectile, what would he have seen? Nothing, then. The darkness was profound. But its cylindro-conical partitions had resisted wonderfully. Not a rent or a dent anywhere. The wonderful projectile was not even heated under the intense deflagration of the powder, nor liquefied, as they seemed to fear, in a shower of aluminum. The interior showed but little disorder. Indeed, only a few objects had been violently thrown towards the roof, but the most important seemed not to have suffered from the shock at all. Their fixtures were intact. On the movable disc, sunk down to the bottom by the smashing of the partition breaks and the escape of the water, three bodies lay apparently lifeless. Barbicane, Nicholl, and Michel Ardin. Did they still breathe? Or was the projectile nothing now but a metal coffin, bearing three corpses into space? Some minutes after the departure of the projectile, one of the bodies moved, shook its arms, lifted its head, and finally succeeded in getting on its knees. It was Michel Ardin. He felt himself all over, gave a sonorous hem, and then said, "'Michel Ardin is whole. How about the others?' The courageous Frenchman tried to rise, but could not stand. His head swam from the rush of blood. He was blind. He was like a drunken man. Brr, said he. It produces the same effect as two bottles of Corton, though perhaps less agreeable to swallow. Then, passing his hands several times across his forehead and rubbing his temples, he called in a firm voice, Nicole, Barbicane! He waited anxiously. No answer, not even a sigh, to show that the hearts of his companions were still beating. He called again. The same silence. The devil! he exclaimed. They look as if they had fallen from a fifth story on their heads. Bah! he added, with that imperturbable confidence which nothing could check. If a Frenchman can get on his knees, two Americans ought to be able to get on their feet. But first, let us light up. Ardin felt the tide of life return by degrees. His blood became calm and returned to its accustomed circulation. Another effort restored his equilibrium. He succeeded in rising, drew a match from his pocket, and approaching the burner, lighted it. The receiver had not suffered at all. The gas had not escaped. Besides, the smell would have betrayed it, and in that case Michel Ardin could not have carried a lighted match with impunity through the space filled with hydrogen. The gas mixing with the air would have produced a detonating mixture and the explosion would have finished what the shock had perhaps begun. When the burner was lit, Ardin leaned over the bodies of his companions. They were lying one on the other, an inert mass, nickel above, barbicane underneath. Ardin lifted the captain, propped him up against the divan, 
and began to rub vigorously. This means, used with judgment, restored Nicol, who opened his eyes, and, instantly recovering his presence of mind, seized Ardin's hand and looked around him. "'And Barbicane?' said he. "'Each in turn,' replied Michel Ardin. "'I began with you, Nicol, because you were on top. Now let us look to Barbicane.' Saying which, Ardin and Nicol raised the president of the gun-club and laid him on the divan. He seemed to have suffered more than either of his companions. He was bleeding, but Nicol was reassured by finding that the hemorrhage came from a slight wound on the shoulder, a mere graze which he bound up carefully. Still, Barbicane was a long time coming to himself, which frightened his friends, who did not spare friction. "'He breathes, though,' said Nicol, putting his ear to the chest of the wounded man. "'Yes,' replied Ardin. "'He breathes like a man who has some notion of that daily operation. Rub, Nicol, let us rub harder.' And the two improvised practitioners worked so hard and so well that Barbicane recovered his senses. He opened his eyes, sat up, took his two friends by the hands, and his first words were, "'Nicol, are we moving?' Nicol and Barbicane looked at each other. They had not yet troubled themselves about the projectile. Their first thought had been for the traveller, not for the car. "'Well, are we really moving?' repeated Michel Ardin. "'Or quietly resting on the soil of Florida?' asked Nicol. "'Or at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico?' added Michel Ardin. "'What an idea!' exclaimed the President." and this double hypothesis suggested by his companions had the effect of recalling him to his senses. In any case, they could not yet decide on the position of the projectile. Its apparent immovability, and the want of communication with the outside, prevented them from solving the question. Perhaps the projectile was unwinding its course through space. Perhaps after a short rise it had fallen upon the earth, or even in the Gulf of Mexico a fall which the narrowness of the peninsula of Florida would render not impossible. The case was serious, the problem interesting, and one that must be solved as soon as possible. Thus, highly excited, Barbicane's moral energy triumphed over physical weakness, and he rose to his feet. He listened. Outside was perfect silence, but the thick padding was enough to intercept all sounds coming from the earth but one circumstance struck Barbicane, that the temperature inside the projectile was singularly high. The President drew a thermometer from its case and consulted it. The instrument showed eighty-one degrees Fahrenheit. "'Yes!' he exclaimed. "'Yes, we are moving! This stifling heat, penetrating through the partitions of the projectile, is produced by its friction on the atmospheric strata. It will soon diminish, because we are already floating in space.' and after having been nearly stifled, we shall have to suffer intense cold. What? said Michel Ardin. According to your showing, Barbicane, we are already beyond the limits of the terrestrial atmosphere? Without a doubt, Michel. Listen to me. It is fifty-five minutes past ten. We have been gone about eight minutes, and if our initiatory speed has not been checked by the friction— Six seconds would be enough for us to pass through the forty miles of atmosphere which surrounds the globe. "'Just so,' replied Nicol. "'But in what proportion do you estimate the diminution of speed by friction?' "'In the proportion of one-third, Nicol. This diminution is considerable, but according to my calculations it is nothing less. If, then, we had an initiatory speed of twelve thousand yards, on leaving the atmosphere, this speed will be reduced to 9,165 yards. In any case, we have already passed through this interval, and— And then, said Michel Ardin, friend Nicol has lost his two bets, $4,000 because the Columbiad did not burst, $5,000 because the projectile has risen more than six miles. Now, Nicol, pay up. Let us prove it first, said the captain and we will pay afterwards. It is quite possible that Barbicane's reasoning is correct, and that I have lost my nine thousand dollars. 
but a new hypothesis presents itself to my mind, and it annuls the wager. "'What is that?' asked Barbicane quickly. "'The hypothesis that, for some reason or other, fire was never set to the powder, and we have not started at all.' "'My goodness, Captain!' exclaimed Michel Ardan. "'That hypothesis is worthy of my brain. It cannot be a serious one. For have we not been half annihilated by the shock? Did I not recall you to life? Is not the President's shoulder still bleeding from the blow it has received?' "'Granted,' replied Nicholl. "'But one question.' "'Well, Captain?' "'Did you hear the detonation, which certainly ought to be loud?' no replied ardan much surprised certainly i did not hear the detonation and you barbicane nor i neither very well said nicholl well now murmured the president why did we not hear the detonation the three friends looked at each other with a disconcerted air it was quite an inexplicable phenomenon the projectile had started and consequently there must have been a detonation. "'Let us find out where we are,' said Barbicane, and let down the panel. This very simple operation was soon accomplished. The nuts which held the bolts to the outer plates of the right-hand scuttle gave way under the pressure of the English wrench. These bolts were pushed outside, and buffers covered with India rubber stopped up the holes which let them through. Immediately the outer plate fell back upon its hinges like a porthole, and the lenticular glass which closed the scuttle appeared. A similar one was let into the thick partition on the opposite side of the projectile, another in the top of the dome, and finally a fourth in the middle of the base. They could, therefore, make observations in four different directions, the firmament by the side and most direct windows, the earth or the moon by the upper and under openings in the projectile. Barbicane and his two companions immediately rushed to the uncovered window, but it was lit by no ray of light. Profound darkness surrounded them, which, however, did not prevent the President from exclaiming, No, my friends, we have not fallen back upon the earth. No, nor are we submerged in the Gulf of Mexico. Yes, we are mounting into space. See those stars shining in the night, and that impenetrable darkness heaped up between the earth and us? Hurrah! Hurrah! cried Michel Ardan and Nicholl in one voice. Indeed, this thick darkness proved that the projectile had left the earth, for the soil, brilliantly lit by the moonbeams, would have been visible to the travellers if they had been lying on its surface. This darkness also showed that the projectile had passed the atmospheric strata, for the diffused light spread in the air would have been reflected on the metal walls, which reflection was wanting. This light would have lit the window, and the window was dark. Doubt was no longer possible. The travellers had left the earth. "'I have lost,' said Nicholl. "'I congratulate you,' replied Ardan. "'Here are the nine thousand dollars,' said the captain, drawing a roll of paper dollars from his pocket. "'Will you have a receipt for it?' asked Barbicane, taking the sum. "'If you do not mind,' answered Nicholl, "'it is more business-like.' And coolly and seriously, as if he had been at his strong-box, the President drew forth his notebook, tore out a blank leaf, wrote a proper receipt in pencil, dated and signed it with the usual flourish, and gave it to the captain, who carefully placed it in his pocket-book. Michel Ardan, taking off his hat, bowed to his two companions without speaking. So much formality under such circumstances left him speechless. He had never before seen anything so American. This affair settled, Barbicane and Nicholl had returned to the window, and were watching the constellations. The stars looked like bright points on the black sky, and from that side they could not see the orb of night, which, travelling from east to west, would rise by degrees towards the zenith. Its absence drew the following remark from Ardan. "'And the moon! Will she perchance fail at our rendezvous?' "'Do not alarm yourself,' 
said Barbicane. Our future globe is at its post, but we cannot see her from this side. Let us open the other. As Barbicane was about leaving the window to open the opposite scuttle, his attention was attracted by the approach of a brilliant object. It was an enormous disk, whose colossal dimension could not be estimated. Its face, which was turned to the earth, was very bright. One might have thought it a small moon reflecting the light of the larger one. She advanced with great speed, and seemed to describe an orbit round the earth, which would intersect the passage of the projectile. This body revolved upon its axis, and exhibited the phenomena of all celestial bodies abandoned in space. "'Ah!' exclaimed Michel Ardin. "'What is that? Another projectile!' Barbicane did not answer. The appearance of this enormous body surprised and troubled him. A collision was possible, and might be attended with deplorable results. Either the projectile would deviate from its path, or a shock, breaking its impetus, might precipitate it to the earth. Or, lastly, it might be irresistibly drawn away by the powerful asteroid. The President caught at a glance the consequences of these three hypotheses, either of which would, one way or the other, bring their experiment to an unsuccessful and fatal termination. His companion stood silently looking into space. The object grew rapidly as it approached them, and by an optical illusion the projectile seemed to be throwing itself before it. "'By Jove!' exclaimed Michel Ardin. "'We shall run into one another!' Instinctively the travellers drew back. Their dread was great, but it did not last many seconds. The asteroid passed several hundred yards from the projectile and disappeared, not so much from the rapidity of its course as that its face being opposite the moon, it was suddenly merged into the perfect darkness of space. "'A happy journey to you!' exclaimed Michel Ardin, with a sigh of relief. "'Surely infinity of space is large enough for a poor little projectile to walk through without fear. Now what is this portentous globe which nearly struck us?' "'I know,' replied Barbicane. "'Oh, indeed, you know everything!' "'It is,' said Barbicane, "'a simple meteorite, but an enormous one, which the attraction of the earth has retained as a satellite.' "'Is it possible?' exclaimed Michel Ardin. "'The earth, then, has two moons, like Neptune?' "'Yes, my friend, two moons, though it passes generally for having only one. But this second moon is so small, and its speed so great, that the inhabitants of the earth cannot see it. It was by noticing disturbances that a French astronomer, Monsieur Petit, was able to determine the existence of this second satellite and calculate its elements. According to his observations, this meteorite will accomplish its revolution round the earth in three hours and twenty minutes, which implies a wonderful rate of speed. "'Do all astronomers admit the existence of this satellite?' asked Nicholl. "'No,' replied Barbicane. "'But if, like us, they had met it, they could no longer doubt it. Indeed, I think that this meteorite, which, had it struck the projectile, would have much embarrassed us, will give us the means of deciding what our position in space is.' "'How?' said Ardin. "'Because its distance is known, and when we met it, we were exactly 4,650 miles from the surface of the terrestrial globe. "'More than two thousand French leagues!' exclaimed Michel Ardin. "'That beats the express trains of the pitiful globe called the Earth.' "'I should think so,' replied Nicholl, consulting his chronometer. "'It is eleven o'clock, and it is only thirteen minutes since we left the American continent.' "'Only thirteen minutes?' said Barbicane. Yes, said Nicholl, and if our initiatory speed of twelve thousand yards has been kept up, we shall have made about twenty thousand miles in the hour. That is all very well, my friends, said the President, but the insoluble question still remains. Why did we not hear the detonation of the Columbiad? For want of an answer, the conversation dropped, and Barbicane began thoughtfully to let down the shutter of the second side. 
he succeeded, and through the uncovered glass the moon filled the projectile with a brilliant light. Nicol, as an economical man, put out the gas, now useless, and whose brilliancy prevented any observation of the interplanetary space. The lunar disk shone with wonderful purity. Her rays, no longer filtered through the vapory atmosphere of the terrestrial globe, shone through the glass, filling the air in the interior of the projectile with silvery reflections. The black curtain of the firmament, in reality, heightened the moon's brilliancy, which, in this void of ether unfavorable to diffusion, did not eclipse the neighboring stars. The heavens, thus seen, presented quite a new aspect, and one which the human eye could never dream of. One may conceive the interest with which these bold men watched the orb of night, the great aim of their journey. In its motion the Earth's satellite was insensibly nearing the zenith, the mathematical point which it ought to attain ninety-six hours later. Her mountains, her plains, every projection was as clearly discernible to their eyes as if they were observing it from some spot upon the earth, but its light was developed through space with a wonderful intensity. The disk shone like a platinum mirror. Of the earth flying from under their feet, the travellers had lost all recollection. It was Captain Nicholl who first recalled their attention to the vanishing globe. Yes, said Michel Ardin. Do not let us be ungrateful to it. Since we are leaving our country, let our last looks be directed to it. I wish to see the earth once more before it is quite hidden from my eyes. To satisfy his companions, Barbicane began to uncover the window at the bottom of the projectile, which would allow them to observe the earth direct. The disk, which the force of the projection had beaten down to the base, was removed, not without difficulty. Its fragments, placed carefully against the wall, might serve again upon occasion. Then a circular gap appeared, nineteen inches in diameter, hollowed out of the lower part of the projectile. A glass cover, six inches thick and strengthened with upper fastenings, closed it tightly. Beneath was fixed an aluminum plate, held in place by bolts. The screws being undone, and the bolts let go, the plate fell down, and visible communication was established between the interior and the exterior. Michel Ardin knelt by the glass. It was cloudy, seemingly opaque. "'Well!' he exclaimed. "'And the earth?' "'The earth?' said Barbicane. "'There it is.' "'What? That little thread? That silver crescent?' "'Doubtless, Michel. In four days, when the moon will be full, at the very time we shall reach it, the earth will be new, and will only appear to us as a slender crescent which will soon disappear, and for some days will be enveloped in utter darkness. That the earth, repeated Michel Ardin, looking with all his eyes at the thin slip of his native planet. The explanation given by President Barbicane was correct. The earth, with respect to the projectile, was entering its last phase. It was in its octant, and showed a crescent finely traced on the dark background of the sky. Its light, rendered bluish by the thick strata of the atmosphere, was less intense than that of the crescent moon, but it was of considerable dimensions, and looked like an enormous arch stretched across the firmament. Some parts brilliantly lighted, especially on its concave part, showed the presence of high mountains, often disappearing behind thick spots, which are never seen on the lunar disk. They were rings of clouds placed concentrically round the terrestrial globe. Whilst the travellers were trying to pierce the profound darkness, a brilliant cluster of shooting stars burst upon their eyes. Hundreds of meteorites, ignited by the friction of the atmosphere, irradiated the shadow of the luminous train, and lined the cloudy parts of the disk with their fire. At this period the earth was at its perihelium, and the month of December is so propitious to these shooting stars that astronomers have counted as many as twenty-four thousand in an hour. But Michel Ardin, disdaining scientific reasonings, preferred thinking that the earth was thus saluting the departure of her three children with their most brilliant fireworks. 
Indeed, this was all they saw of the globe lost in the shadow, an inferior orb of the solar world, rising and setting to the great planets like a simple morning or evening star. This globe, where they had left all their affections, was nothing more than a fugitive crescent. Long did the three friends look without speaking, though united in heart, whilst the projectile sped onward with an ever-decreasing speed. Then an irresistible drowsiness crept over their brain. Was it weariness both of body and mind? No doubt, for after the over-excitement of those last hours passed upon earth, reaction was inevitable. "'Well,' said Nicol, "'since we must sleep, let us sleep.' And stretching themselves on their couches, they were all three soon in a profound slumber. But they had not forgotten themselves more than a quarter of an hour, when Barbicane sat up suddenly, and rousing his companions with a loud voice, exclaimed, "'I have found it!' "'What have you found?' asked Michel Ardin, jumping from his bed. "'The reason why we did not hear the detonation of the Columbiad.' "'And it is,' said Nicol, "'because our projectile travelled faster than the sound.' End of chapter. Chapter Three of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter Three Their Place of Shelter. This curious but certainly correct explanation once given, the three friends returned to their slumbers. Could they have found a calmer or more peaceful spot to sleep in? On the earth, houses, towns, cottages, and country feel every shock given to the exterior of the globe. On sea, the vessels rocked by the waves are still in motion. In the air, the balloon oscillates incessantly on the fluid strata of diverse densities. This projectile alone, floating in perfect space, in the midst of perfect silence, offered perfect repose. Thus the sleep of our adventurous travellers might have been indefinitely prolonged, if an unexpected noise had not awakened them at about seven o'clock in the morning of the 2nd of December, eight hours after their departure. This noise was a very natural barking. "'The dogs! It is the dogs!' exclaimed Michel Ardin, rising at once. "'They are hungry,' said Nicol. "'By Jove!' replied Michel. "'We have forgotten them!' "'Where are they?' asked Barbicane. They looked and found one of the animals crouched under the divan. Terrified and shaken by the initiatory shock, it had remained in the corner till its voice returned with the pangs of hunger.' It was the amiable Diana, still very confused, who crept out of her retreat, though not without much persuasion, Michel Ardin encouraging her with most gracious words. "'Come, Diana,' said he, "'come, my girl, thou whose destiny will be marked in the Synegetic annals, thou whom the pagans would have given as companion to the god Anubis, and Christians as friend to saint Roch thou who art rushing into interplanetary space and wilt perhaps be the eve of all selenite dogs come diana come here diana flattered or not advanced by degrees uttering plaintive cries good said barbicane i see eve but where is adam adam replied michel adam cannot be far off he is there somewhere we must call him satellite here satellite but satellite did not appear diana would not leave off howling they found however that she was not bruised and they gave her a pie which silenced her complaints as to satellite he seemed quite lost they had to hunt a long time before finding him in one of the upper compartments of the projectile 
whither some unaccountable shock must have violently hurled him. The poor beast, much hurt, was in a piteous state. "'The devil!' said Michelle. They brought the unfortunate dog down with great care. Its skull had been broken against the roof, and it seemed unlikely that he could recover from such a shock. Meanwhile he was stretched comfortably on a cushion. Once there, he heaved a sigh. "'We will take care of you,' said Michel. "'We are responsible for your existence. I would rather lose an arm than a paw of my poor satellite.' Saying which, he offered some water to the wounded dog, who swallowed it with avidity. This attention paid, the travellers watched the earth and the moon attentively. The earth was now only discernible by a cloudy disk ending in a crescent, rather more contracted than that of the previous evening, but its expanse was still enormous compared with that of the moon, which was approaching nearer and nearer to a perfect circle. "'By Jove!' said Michel Ardin. "'I am really sorry that we did not start when the earth was full, that is to say, when our globe was in opposition to the sun.' "'Why?' asked Nicol. "'Because we should have seen our continents and seas in a new light, the first resplendent under the solar rays, the latter cloudy as represented on some maps of the world. I should like to have seen those poles of the earth on which the eye of man has never yet rested.' "'I dare say,' replied Barbicane, "'but if the earth had been full, the moon would have been new.' that is to say, invisible, because of the rays of the sun. It is better for us to see the destination we wish to reach than the point of departure. "'You are right, Barbicane,' replied Captain Nicholl. "'And besides, when we have reached the moon, we shall have time during the long lunar nights to consider at our leisure the globe on which our likenesses swarm.' "'Our likenesses!' exclaimed Michel Ardin. They are no more our likenesses than the Selenites are. We inhabit a new world, peopled by ourselves, the projectile. I am Barbicane's likeness, and Barbicane is Nichols. Beyond us, around us, human nature is at an end, and we are the only population of this microcosm until we become pure Selenites. In about eighty-eight hours, replied the captain. "'Which means to say,' asked Michel Ardin, "'that it is half-past eight, replied Nicholl. "'Very well,' retorted Michel. "'Then it is impossible for me to find even the shadow of a reason why we should not go to breakfast.' Indeed, the inhabitants of the new star could not live without eating, and their stomachs were suffering from the imperious laws of hunger. Michel Ardin, as a Frenchman, was declared chief cook.' an important function, which raised no rival. The gas gave sufficient heat for the culinary apparatus, and the provision-box furnished the elements of this first feast. The breakfast began with three bowls of excellent soup, thanks to the liquefaction in hot water of those precious cakes of Liebig, prepared from the best parts of the ruminants of the pompous. To the soup succeeded some beefsteaks, compressed by an hydraulic press, as tender and succulent as if brought straight from the kitchen of an English eating-house. Michel, who was imaginative, maintained that they were even red. "'Preserved vegetables, fresher than nature,' said the amiable Michel, succeeded the dish of meat, and was followed by some cups of tea with bread and butter, after the American fashion. The beverage was declared exquisite and was due to the infusion of the choicest leaves, of which the Emperor of Russia had given some chests for the benefit of the travellers. And lastly, to crown the repast, Ardin brought out a fine battle of nuit, which was found by chance in the provision-box. The three friends drank to the union of the earth and her satellite. And as if he had not already done enough for the generous wine which he had distilled on the slopes of Burgundy, the sun chose to be of the party. At this moment the projectile emerged from the conical shadow cast by the terrestrial globe, 
and the rays of the radiant orb struck the lower disk of the projectile direct, occasioned by the angle which the moon's orbit makes with that of the earth. "'The sun!' exclaimed Michel Ardin. "'No doubt,' replied Barbicane. "'I expected it.' "'But,' said Michel, "'the conical shadow which the earth leaves in space extends beyond the moon.' far beyond it if the atmospheric refraction is not taken into consideration said barbicane but when the moon is enveloped in this shadow it is because the centres of the three stars the sun the earth and the moon are all in one and the same straight line then the nodes coincide with the phases of the moon and there is an eclipse if we had started when there was an eclipse of the moon all our passage would have been in the shadow, which would have been a pity. Why? Because, though we are floating in space, our projectile, bathed in the solar rays, will receive their light and heat. It economizes the gas, which is in every respect a good economy. Indeed, under these rays, which no atmosphere can temper, either in temperature or brilliancy, the projectile grew warm and bright as if it had passed suddenly from winter to summer. The moon above, the sun beneath, were inundating it with their fire. "'It is pleasant here,' said Nicholl. "'I should think so,' said Michel Ardin. "'With a little earth spread on our aluminum planet we shall have green peas in twenty-four hours. I have but one fear, which is that the walls of the projectile might melt.' "'Calm yourself, my worthy friend.' replied Barbicane. The projectile withstood a very much higher temperature than this as it slid through the strata of the atmosphere. I should not be surprised if it did not look like a meteor on fire to the eyes of the spectators in Florida. "'But then Joseph T. Maston will think we are roasted!' "'What astonishes me,' said Barbicane, "'is that we have not been. That was a danger we had not provided for.' "'I feared it,' said Nicholl, simply. "'And you never mentioned it, my sublime captain!' exclaimed Michel Ardin, clasping his friend's hand. Barbicane now began to settle himself in the projectile, as if he was never to leave it. One must remember that this aerial car had a base with a superficies of fifty-four square feet. Its height to the roof was twelve feet carefully laid out in the inside, and little encumbered by instruments and travelling utensils which each had their particular place, it left the three travellers a certain freedom of movement. The thick window, inserted in the bottom, could bear any amount of weight, and Barbicane and his companions walked upon it as if it were solid plank. But the sun, striking it directly with its rays, lit the interior of the projectile from beneath thus producing singular effects of light. They began by investigating the state of their store of water and provisions, neither of which had suffered, thanks to the care taken to deaden the shock. Their provisions were abundant, and plentiful enough to last the three travellers for more than a year. Barbicane wished to be cautious, in case the projectile should land on a part of the moon which was utterly barren. As to water and the reserve of brandy, which consisted of fifty gallons, there was only enough for two months, but according to the last observations of astronomers, the moon had a low, dense, and thick atmosphere, at least in the deep valleys, and there springs and streams could not fail. Thus, during their passage, and for the first year of their settlement on the lunar continent, these adventurous explorers would suffer neither hunger nor thirst. Now about the air in the projectile. There, too, they were secure. Ricet and Reynaud's apparatus, intended for the production of oxygen, was supplied with chloride of potassium for two months. They necessarily consumed a certain quantity of gas, for they were obliged to keep the producing substance at a temperature of above 400 degrees, but there again they were all safe. The apparatus only wanted a little care. But it was not enough to renew the oxygen. They must absorb the carbonic acid produced by expiration. 
During the last twelve hours the atmosphere of the projectile had become charged with this deleterious gas. Nicol discovered the state of the air by observing Diana panting painfully. The carbonic acid, by a phenomenon similar to that produced in the famous Grotto del Cane, had collected at the bottom of the projectile owing to its weight. Poor Diana, with her head low, would suffer before her masters from the presence of this gas. But Captain Nicholl hastened to remedy this state of things by placing on the floor several receivers containing caustic potash, which he shook about for a time, and this substance, greedy of carbonic acid, soon completely absorbed it, thus purifying the air. An inventory of instruments was then begun. The thermometers and barometers had resisted, all but one minimum thermometer, the glass of which was broken. An excellent aneroid was drawn from the wadded box which contained it and hung on the wall. Of course it was only affected by and marked the pressure of the air inside the projectile, but it also showed the quantity of moisture which it contained. At that moment its needle oscillated between 25.24 and 25.08. It was fine weather. Barbicane had also brought several compasses, which he found intact. One must understand that under present conditions their needles were acting wildly, that is, without any constant direction. Indeed, at the distance they were from the earth, the magnetic pole could have no perceptible action upon the apparatus. But the box placed on the lunar disk might perhaps exhibit some strange phenomena. In any case, it would be interesting to see whether the Earth's satellite submitted, like herself, to its magnetic influence. A hypsometer to measure the height of the lunar mountains, a sextant to take the height of the sun, glasses which would be useful as they neared the moon, all these instruments were carefully looked over, and pronounced good in spite of the violent shock. As to the pickaxes and different tools which were Nicholl's especial choice, as to the sacks of different kinds of grain and shrubs which Michel Ardin hoped to transplant into selenite ground, they were stowed away in the upper part of the projectile. There was a sort of granary there, loaded with things which the extravagant Frenchman had heaped up. What they were no one knew, and the good-tempered fellow did not explain. Now and then he climbed up by cramp-irons riveted to the walls, but kept the inspection to himself. He arranged and rearranged. He plunged his hand rapidly into certain mysterious boxes, singing in one of the falsest of voices an old French refrain to enliven the situation. Barbicane observed with some interest that his guns and other arms had not been damaged. These were important because, heavily loaded, they were to help to lessen the fall of the projectile, when drawn by the lunar attraction, after having passed the point of neutral attraction, onto the moon's surface, a fall which ought to be six times less rapid than it would have been on the earth's surface, thanks to the difference of bulk. The inspection ended with general satisfaction, when each returned to watch space through the side windows, and the lower glass cover lid. There was the same view. The whole extent of the celestial sphere swarmed with stars and constellations of wonderful purity, enough to drive an astronomer out of his mind. On one side the sun, like the mouth of a lighted oven, a dazzling disk without a halo, standing out on the dark background of the sky. On the other, the moon returning its fire by reflection, and apparently motionless in the midst of the starry world. Then a large spot seemingly nailed to the firmament, bordered by a silvery cord. It was the earth. Here and there nebulous masses like large flakes of starry snow, and from the zenith to the nadir, an immense ring formed by an impalpable dust of stars, the Milky Way in the midst of which the sun ranks only as a star of the fourth magnitude. The observers could not take their eyes from this novel spectacle, of which no description could give an adequate idea. 
What reflections it suggested! What emotions hitherto unknown awoke in their souls! Barbicane wished to begin the relation of his journey while under its first impressions, and hour after hour took notes of all facts happening in the beginning of the enterprise. He wrote quietly, with his large square writing, in a business-like style. During this time Nicol, the calculator, looked over the minutes of their passage, and worked out figures with unparalleled dexterity. Michel Ardin chatted first with Barbicane, who did not answer him, and then with Nicol, who did not hear him, with Diana, who understood none of his theories, and lastly with himself, questioning and answering, coming and going, busy with a thousand details, at one time bent over the lower glass, at another roosting in the heights of the projectile, and always singing. In this microcosm he represented French loquacity and excitability, and we beg you to believe that they were well represented. The day, or rather, for the expression is not correct, the lapse of twelve hours, which forms a day upon earth, closed with a plentiful supper carefully prepared. No accident of any nature had yet happened to shake the traveller's confidence. So, full of hope, Already sure of his success, they slept peacefully, whilst the projectile under a uniformly decreasing speed was crossing the sky. End of chapter Chapter 4 of Round the Moon by Jules Verne this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 4 A Little Algebra. The night passed without incident. The word night, however, is scarcely applicable. The position of the projectile with regard to the sun did not change. Astronomically, it was daylight on the lower part and night on the upper. So when, during this narrative, these words are used, they represent the lapse of time between the rising and setting of the sun upon the earth. The traveller's sleep was rendered more peaceful by the projectile's excessive speed, for it seemed absolutely motionless. Not a motion betrayed its onward course through space. The rate of progress, however rapid it might be, cannot produce any sensible effect on the human frame when it takes place in a vacuum, or when the mass of air circulates with the body which is carried with it. What inhabitant of the earth perceives its speed, which, however, is at the rate of 68,000 miles per hour? Motion under such conditions is felt no more than repose, and when a body is in repose, it will remain so as long as no strange force displaces it. If moving, it will not stop, unless an obstacle comes in its way. This indifference to motion or repose is called inertia. Barbicane and his companions might have believed themselves perfectly stationary, being shut up in the projectile. Indeed, the effect would have been the same if they had been on the outside of it. Had it not been for the moon, which was increasing above them, they might have sworn that they were floating in complete stagnation. That morning, the 3rd of December, the travellers were awakened by a joyful but unexpected noise. It was the crowing of a cock, which sounded through the car. Michel Ardin, who was the first on his feet, climbed to the top of the projectile, and shutting a box, the lid of which was partly open, said in a low voice, "'Will you hold your tongue? Ah, that creature will spoil my design.' But Nicol and Barbicane were awake. "'A cock!' said Nicol. Uh, "'Why, no, my friends,' Michel answered quickly. "'It was I who wished to awake you by this rural sound.' So saying, he gave vent to a splendid cock-a-doodle-doo, which would have done honour to the proudest of poultry-yards. <laughs> the two Americans could not help laughing. 
"'Fine talent, that,' said Nicol, looking suspiciously at his companion. "'Oh, yes,' said Michel. "'A joke in my country. It is very Gallic. They play the cock so in the best society.' Then, turning the conversation, "'Barbicane, do you know what I have been thinking of all night?' "'No,' answered the President. "'Of our Cambridge friends. You have already remarked that I am an ignoramus in mathematical subjects, and it is impossible for me to find out how the savants of the observatory were able to calculate what initiatory speed the projectile ought to have on leaving the Columbiad in order to attain the moon.' "'You mean to say,' replied Barbicane, to attain that neutral point where the terrestrial and lunar attractions are equal. For, starting from that point, situated about nine-tenths of the distance travelled over, the projectile would simply fall upon the moon on account of its weight. "'So be it,' said Michel. "'But, once more, how could they calculate the initiatory speed?' "'Nothing can be easier,' replied Barbicane. "'And you knew how to make that calculation?' asked Michel Ardin. "'Perfectly. Nicol and I would have made it if the observatory had not saved us the trouble.' "'Very well, old Barbicane,' replied Michel. "'They might have cut off my head, beginning at my feet, before they could have made me solve that problem.' "'Because you do not know algebra,' answered Barbicane quietly. Ah, there you are, you eaters of X to the first power. You think you have said all when you have said algebra. Michel, said Barbicane, can you use a forge without a hammer, or plow without a plowshare? Hardly. Well, algebra is a tool, like the plow or the hammer, and a good tool to those who know how to use it. Seriously? Quite seriously. And can you use that tool in my presence? If it will interest you. And show me how they calculated the initiatory speed of our car? Yes, my worthy friend, taking into consideration all the elements of the problem. The distance from the center of the earth to the center of the moon, of the radius of the earth, of its bulk, and of the bulk of the moon— I can tell exactly what ought to be the initiatory speed of the projectile, and that by a simple formula. Let us see. You shall see it. Only I shall not give you the real course drawn by the projectile between the moon and the earth in considering their motion round the sun. No, I shall consider these two orbs as perfectly motionless, which will answer all our purpose. And why? because it will be trying to solve the problem called the problem of the three bodies, for which the integral calculus is not yet far enough advanced. Then, said Michel Ardin in his sly tone, mathematics has not said their last word? Certainly not, replied Barbicane. Well, perhaps the Selenites have carried the integral calculus farther than you have. And, by the by, what is integral calculus? It is a calculation the converse of the differential, replied Barbicane seriously. Much obliged. It is all very clear, no doubt. And now, continued Barbicane, a slip of paper and a bit of pencil, and before a half-hour is over I will have found the required formula. Half an hour had not elapsed before Barbicane, raising his head, showed Michel Ardin a page covered with algebraical signs, in which the general formula for the solution was contained. "'Well, and does Nicol understand what that means?' "'Of course, Michel,' replied the captain. "'All these signs, which seem cabalistic to you, form the plainest, the clearest, and the most logical language to those who know how to read it.' "'And you pretend, Nicol asked Michel, that by means of these hieroglyphics, more incomprehensible than the Egyptian ibis, you can find what initiatory speed it was necessary to give to the projectile? Incontestably, replied Nicol, and even by the same formula 
I can always tell you its speed at any point in its transit. On your word? On my word. Then you are as cunning as our president. No, Michel. The difficult part is what Barbicane has done. That is, to get an equation which will satisfy all the conditions of the problem. The remainder is only a question of arithmetic, requiring merely the knowledge of the four rules. That is something, replied Michel Ardin, who for his life could not do addition right, and who defined the rule as a Chinese puzzle which allowed one to obtain all sorts of totals. The expression V0, which you see in that equation, is the speed which the projectile will have on leaving the atmosphere. Just so, said Nicholl. It is from that point that we must calculate the velocity, since we know already that the velocity at departure was exactly one and a half times more than on leaving the atmosphere. I understand no more, said Michel. It is a very simple calculation, said Barbicane. Not as simple as I am, retorted Michel. That means that when our projectile reached the limits of the terrestrial atmosphere, it had already lost one-third of its initiatory speed. As much as that? Yes, my friend, merely by friction against the atmospheric strata. You understand that the faster it goes, the more resistance it meets with from the air. Well, that I admit, answered Michel, and I understand it although your X's and zeros and algebraic formulae are rattling in my head like nails in a bag. First effects of algebra, replied Barbicane, and now, to finish, we are going to prove the given number of these different expressions, that is, work out their value. Finish me, replied Michel. Barbicane took the paper, and began again to make his calculations with great rapidity. Nicholl looked over, and greedily read the work as it proceeded. "'That's it! That's it!' at last he cried. "'Is it clear?' asked Barbicane. "'It is written in letters of fire,' said Nicholl. "'Wonderful fellows!' muttered Ardin. "'Do you understand it at last?' asked Barbicane. "'Do I understand it?' cried Ardin. "'My head is splitting with it!' "'And now,' said Nicholl, "'to find out the speed of the projectile when it left the atmosphere, we have only to calculate that.' The captain, as a practical man equal to all difficulties, began to write with frightful rapidity. Divisions and multiplications grew under his fingers. The figures were like hail on the white page." Barbicane watched him, whilst Michel Ardin nursed a growing headache with both hands. "'Very well?' asked Barbicane, after some minutes' silence. "'Well,' replied Nicholl, "'every calculation made, V0, that is to say, the speed necessary for the projectile on leaving the atmosphere, to enable it to reach the equal point of attraction, ought to be—' "'Yes,' said Barbicane. Twelve thousand yards. What? exclaimed Barbicane, starting. You say, twelve thousand yards. The devil! cried the president, making a gesture of despair. What is the matter? asked Michel Ardin, much surprised. What is the matter? Why, if at this moment our speed had already diminished one-third by friction, the initiatory speed ought to have been— Seventeen thousand yards. And the Cambridge Observatory declared that twelve thousand yards was enough at starting, and our projectile, which only started with that speed— Well? asked Nicholl. Well, it will not be enough. Good. We shall not be able to reach the neutral point. The deuce! We shall not even get halfway. In the name of the projectile— exclaimed Michel Ardin, jumping as if it was already on the point of striking the terrestrial globe, and we shall fall back upon the earth. End of chapter.
Chapter Five of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne, Chapter Five: The Cold of Space. This revelation came like a thunderbolt. Who could have expected such an error and calculation? Barbicane would not believe it. Nickel revised his figures. They were exact. As to the formula which had determined them, they could not suspect its truth. It was evident that an initiatory velocity of 17,000 yards in the first second was necessary to enable them to reach the neutral point. The three friends looked at each other silently. There was no thought of breakfast. Barbicane, with clenched teeth, knitted brows, and hands clasped convulsively, was watching through the window. Nicol had crossed his arms, and was examining his calculations. Michel Ardain was muttering, "'That is just like those scientific men. They never do anything else. I would give twenty pistoles if we could fall upon the Cambridge Observatory and crush it, together with the whole lot of dabblers and figures which it contains.' Suddenly a thought struck the captain, which he at once communicated to Barbicane. "'Ah!' said he. "'It is seven o'clock in the morning. We have already been gone thirty-two hours. More than half our passage is over, and we are not falling that I am aware of.' Barbicane did not answer, but after a rapid glance at the captain, took a pair of compasses wherewith to measure the angular distance of the terrestrial globe. Then, from the lower window, he took an exact observation, and noticed that the projectile was apparently stationary. Then, rising and wiping his forehead, on which large drops of perspiration were standing, he put some figures on paper. Nicol understood that the President was deducting from the terrestrial diameter the projectile's distance from the earth. He watched him anxiously. No, exclaimed Barbicane, after some moments, no, we are not falling. No, we are already more than fifty thousand leagues from the earth. We have passed the point at which the projectile would have stopped if its speed had only been twelve thousand yards at starting. We are still going up. "'That is evident,' replied Nicol, "'and we must conclude that our initial speed, under the power of the four hundred thousand pounds of gun-cotton, must have exceeded the required twelve thousand yards. Now I can understand how, after thirteen minutes only, we met the second satellite, which gravitates round the earth at more than two thousand leagues' distance. "'And this explanation is the more probable,' added Barbicane because, in throwing off the water enclosed between its partition breaks, the projectile found itself lightened of a considerable weight. "'Just so,' said Nicol. "'Ah, my brave Nicol, we are saved!' "'Ah, very well, then,' said Michel Ardain quietly. "'As we are safe, let us have breakfast.' Nicol was not mistaken. The initial speed had been, very fortunately, much above that estimated by the Cambridge Observatory, but the Cambridge Observatory had nevertheless made a mistake. The travellers, recovered from this false alarm, breakfasted merrily. If they ate a great deal, they talked more. Their confidence was greater after than before the incident of the algebra. "'Why should we not succeed?' said Michel Ardain. "'Why should we not arrive safely? We are launched.' We have no obstacle before us, no stones in our way. The road is open, more so than that of a ship battling with the sea, more open than that of a balloon battling with the wind. And if a ship can reach its destination, a balloon go where it pleases, why cannot our projectile attain its end and aim? It will attain it, said Barbicane. If only to do honor to the Americans— added Michel Ardain, the only people who could bring such an enterprise to a happy termination, and the only one which could produce a President Barbicane. Ah, now we are no longer uneasy. I begin to think, 
what will become of us we shall get right royally weary barbicane and nickel made a gesture of denial but i have provided for the contingency my friends replied michel you have only to speak and i have chess draughts cards and dominoes at your disposal nothing is wanting but a billiard table what exclaimed barbicane you brought away such trifles certainly replied michel and not only to distract ourselves but also with the laudable intention of endowing the selenite smoking divans with them my friend said barbicane if the moon is inhabited its inhabitants must have appeared some thousands of years before those of the earth for we cannot doubt that their star is much older than ours if then these selenites have existed there hundreds of thousands of years and if their brain is of the same organization as the human brain they have already invented all that we have invented and even what we may invent in future ages they have nothing to learn from us and we have everything to learn from them what said michel you believe that they have artists like phidias michelangelo or raphael yes poets like homer virgil milton lamartine and hugo i am sure of it philosophers like plato aristotle descartes kant i have no doubt of it scientific men like archimedes euclid pascal newton i could swear it comic writers like arnal and photographers like like nadar certain then friend barbicane if they are as strong as we are and even stronger these selenites why have they not tried to communicate with the earth why have they not launched a lunar projectile to our terrestrial regions who told you that they have never done so said barbicane seriously indeed added nicholl it would be easier for them than for us for two reasons first because the attraction on the moon's surface is six times less than that on the earth which would allow a projectile to rise more easily secondly because it would be enough to send such a projectile only at eight thousand leagues instead of eighty thousand which would require the force of projection to be ten times less strong then continued michel i repeat it why have they not done it and i repeat said barbicane who told you that they have not done it when thousands of years before man appeared on earth and the projectile where is the projectile i demand to see the projectile my friend replied barbicane the sea covers five-sixths of our globe from that we may draw five good reasons for supposing that the lunar projectile if ever launched is now at the bottom of the atlantic or the pacific unless it sped into some crevasse at that period when the crust of the earth was not yet hardened hold barbicane said michel you have an answer for everything and i bow before your wisdom but there is one hypothesis that would suit me better than all the others which is that the selenites being older than we are wiser and have not invented gunpowder at this moment diana joined in the conversation by a sonorous barking she was asking for her breakfast ah said michel ardin in our discussion we have forgotten diana and satellite immediately a good-sized pie was given to the dog which devoured it hungrily do you see barbicane said michel we should have made a second noah's ark of this projectile and borne with us to the moon a couple of every kind of domestic animal i dare say but room would have failed us oh said michel we might have squeezed a little the fact is replied nicholl that cows bulls and horses and all ruminants would have been very useful on the lunar continent but unfortunately the car could neither have been made a stable nor a shed well we might at least have brought a donkey only a little donkey that courageous beast which old selenus loved to mount i love those old donkeys they are the least favored animals in creation 
they are not only beaten when alive, but even after they are dead. "'How do you make that out?' asked Barbicane. "'Why,' said Michel, "'they make their skins into drums.' Barbicane and Nicol could not help laughing at this ridiculous remark. But a cry from their merry companion stopped them. The latter was leaning over the spot where Satellite lay. He rose, saying, "'My good Satellite is no longer ill.' "'Ah!' said Nicol. "'No,' answered Michel. "'He is dead.' "'There,' added he, in a piteous tone, "'that is embarrassing.' i much fear my poor diana that you will leave no progeny in the lunar regions indeed the unfortunate satellite had not survived its wound it was quite dead michel ardan looked at his friends with a rueful countenance one question presents itself said barbicane we cannot keep the dead body of this dog with us for the next forty-eight hours no certainly not replied Nicol. But our scuttles are fixed on hinges. They can be let down. We will open one and throw the body out into space. The President thought for some moments, and then said, Yes, we must do so, but at the same time taking very great precautions. Why? asked Michel. For two reasons which you will understand, answered Barbicane. The first relates to the air shut up in the projectile, and of which we must lose as little as possible. But we manufacture the air? Only in part. We make only the oxygen, my worthy Michel, and with regard to that we must watch that the apparatus does not furnish the oxygen in too great a quantity, for an excess would bring us very serious physiological troubles. But if we make the oxygen, we do not make the azote that medium which the lungs do not absorb, and which ought to remain intact, and that azote will escape rapidly through the open scuttles. "'Oh, the time for throwing out poor satellite?' said Michel. "'Agreed, but we must act quickly.' "'And the second reason?' asked Michel. "'The second reason is that we must not let the outer cold, which is excessive, penetrate the projectile or we shall be frozen to death but the sun the sun warms our projectile which absorbs its rays but it does not warm the vacuum in which we are floating at this moment where there is no air there is no more heat than diffused light and the same with darkness it is cold where the sun's rays do not strike direct this temperature is only the temperature produced by the radiation of the stars that is to say, what the terrestrial globe would undergo if the sun disappeared one day. "'Which is not to be feared,' replied Nicol. "'Who knows?' said Michel Ardan. "'But, in admitting that the sun does not go out, might it not happen that the earth might move away from it?' "'There,' said Barbicane, "'there is Michel with his ideas.' "'And,' continued Michel, do we not know that in 1861 the earth passed through the tail of a comet? Or let us suppose a comet whose power of attraction is greater than that of the sun. The terrestrial orbit will bend towards the wandering star, and the earth becoming its satellite will be drawn such a distance that the rays of the sun will have no action on its surface. That might happen, indeed, replied Barbicane but the consequences of such a displacement need not be so formidable as you suppose. And why not? Because the heat and the cold would be equalized on our globe. It has been calculated that, had our earth been carried along in its course by the comet of 1861, at its perihelion, that is, its nearest approach to the sun, it would have undergone a heat 28,000 times greater than that of summer. But this heat, which is sufficient to evaporate the waters, would have formed a thick ring of cloud, which would have modified that excessive temperature. Hence the compensation between the cold of the aphelion and the heat of the perihelion. "'At how many degrees,' asked Nicol, "'is the temperature of the planetary spaces estimated?' "'Formerly,' replied Barbicane, "'it was greatly exaggerated.' 
but now, after the calculations of Fourier, of the French Academy of Science, it is not supposed to exceed sixty centigrade below zero. Pooh, said Michel, that's nothing. It is very much, replied Barbicane. The temperature which was observed in the polar regions, at Melville Island and Fort Reliance, that is seventy-six Fahrenheit below zero. "'If I mistake not,' said Nicholl, "'Monsieur Poulier, another savant, estimates the temperature of space at two hundred fifty degrees Fahrenheit below zero. We shall, however, be able to verify these calculations for ourselves.' Not at present, because the solar rays, beating directly upon our thermometer, would give, on the contrary, a very high temperature. But when we arrive in the moon, during its fifteen days of night at either face, we shall have leisure to make the experiment, for our satellite lies in a vacuum. "'What do you mean by a vacuum?' asked Michel. "'Is it perfectly such?' "'It is absolutely void of air.' and is the air replaced by nothing whatever by the ether only replied barbicane and pray what is the ether the ether my friend is an agglomeration of imponderable atoms which relatively to their dimensions are as far removed from each other as the celestial bodies are in space it is these atoms which by their vibratory motion produce both light and heat in the universe. They now proceeded to the burial of satellite. They had merely to drop him into space, in the same way that sailors drop a body into the sea. But, as President Barbicane suggested, they must act quickly, so as to lose as little as possible of that air whose elasticity would rapidly have spread it into space. The bolts of the right scuttle, the opening of which measured about twelve inches across, were carefully drawn, whilst Michel, quite grieved, prepared to launch his dog into space. The glass, raised by a powerful lever, which enabled it to overcome the pressure of the inside air on the walls of the projectile, turned rapidly on its hinges, and satellite was thrown out. Scarcely a particle of air could have escaped, and the operation was so successful that later on Barbicane did not fear to dispose of the rubbish which encumbered the car. End of chapter Chapter 6 of Round the Moon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne Chapter 6 Question and Answer On the 4th of December, when the travelers awoke after 54 hours' journey, the chronometer marked 5 o'clock of the terrestrial morning. In time it was just over 5 hours and 40 minutes, half of that assigned to their sojourn in the projectile, but they had already accomplished nearly seven-tenths of the way. This peculiarity was due to their regularly decreasing speed. Now when they observed the earth through the lower window, it looked like nothing more than a dark spot drowned in the solar rays. No more crescent, no more cloudy light. The next day, at midnight, the earth would be new, at the very moment when the moon would be full. Above, the orb of night was nearing the line followed by the projectile, so as to meet it at the given hour. All around the black vault was studded with brilliant points, which seemed to move slowly, but at the great distance they were from them, their relative size did not seem to change. The sun and stars appeared exactly as they do to us upon earth. As to the moon, she was considerably larger, but the traveller's glasses, not very powerful, did not allow them as yet to make any useful observations upon her surface, or reconnoitre her topographically or geologically. Thus the time passed in never-ending conversations all about the moon. Each one brought forward his own contingent of particular facts, 
Barbicane and Nickel, always serious, Michel Ardin, always enthusiastic. The projectile, its situation, its direction, incidents which might happen, the precautions necessitated by their fall on to the moon, were inexhaustible matters of conjecture. As they were breakfasting, a question of Michel's, relating to the projectile, provoked rather a curious answer from Barbicane, which is worth repeating. Michel, supposing it to be roughly stopped while still under its formidable initial speed, wanted to know what the consequences of the stoppage would have been. But, said Barbicane, I do not see how it could have been stopped. Uh, but let us suppose so, said Michel. It is an impossible supposition, said the practical Barbicane, unless the impulsive force had failed. But even then its speed would diminish by degrees, and it would not have stopped suddenly. Admit that it had struck a body in space. What body? Why, that enormous meteor which we met. Then, said Nicholl, the projectile would have been broken into a thousand pieces, and we with it. More than that, replied Barbicane, we should have been burnt to death. Burnt! exclaimed Michel. By Jove, I am sorry it did not happen, just to see. And you would have seen, replied Barbicane. It is known now that heat is only a modification of motion. When water is warmed, that is to say, when heat is added to it, its particles are set in motion. Well, said Michel, that is an ingenious theory. And a true one, my worthy friend, for it explains every phenomenon of caloric. Heat is but the motion of atoms, a simple oscillation of the particles of a body. When they apply the brake to a train, the train comes to a stop. But what becomes of the motion which it had previously possessed? It is transformed into heat, and the brake becomes hot. Why do they grease the axles of the wheels? To prevent their heating, because this heat would be generated by the motion which is thus lost by transformation." "'Yes, I understand,' replied Michel. "'Perfectly. For example, when I have run a long time, when I am swimming, when I am perspiring in large drops, why am I obliged to stop? Simply because my motion is changed into heat.' Barbicane could not help smiling at Michel's reply, then, returning to his theory, said, "'Thus, in case of a shock, it would have been with our projectile as with a ball which falls in a burning state, after having struck the metal plate. It is its motion which is turned into heat. Consequently, I affirm that, if our projectile had struck the meteor, its speed thus suddenly checked would have raised a heat great enough to turn it into vapour instantaneously.' "'Then,' asked Nicholl, "'what would happen if the earth's motion were to stop suddenly?' Her temperature would be raised to such a pitch, said Barbicane, that she would be at once reduced to vapor. Well, said Michel, that is a way of ending the earth which will greatly simplify things. And if the earth fell upon the sun? asked Nicholl. According to calculation, replied Barbicane, the fall would develop a heat equal to that produced by sixteen thousand globes of coal each equal in bulk to our own terrestrial globe. "'Good additional heat for the sun,' replied Michel Ardin, "'of which the inhabitants of Uranus or Neptune would doubtless not complain. They must be perished with cold on their planets.' "'Thus, my friends,' said Barbicane, "'all motion suddenly stop produces heat, and this theory allows us to infer that the heat of the solar disk is fed by a hail of meteors falling incessantly on its surface. They have even calculated— Oh, dear, murmured Michel, the figures are coming. They have even calculated, continued the imperturbable Barbicane, that the shock of each meteor on the sun ought to produce a heat equal to that of four thousand masses of coal of an equal bulk. And what is the solar heat? asked Michel. It is equal to that produced by the combustion of a stratum of coal surrounding the sun to a depth of forty-seven miles. And that heat would be able to boil two billions, nine hundred millions of cubic myriameters of water. 
Now, a myriameter is equal to rather more than 10,936 cubic yards English. "'And it does not roast us!' exclaimed Michel. "'No,' replied Barbicane, "'because the terrestrial atmosphere absorbs four-tenths of the solar heat. Besides, the quantity of heat intercepted by the Earth is but a billionth part of the entire radiation.' "'I see that is all for the best,' said Michel, "'and that this atmosphere is a useful invention, "'for it not only allows us to breathe, "'but it prevents us from roasting.' "'Yes,' said Nicholl. "'Unfortunately, it will not be the same in the moon.' "'Bah!' said Michel, always hopeful. "'If there are inhabitants, they must breathe. "'If there are no longer any, "'they must have left enough oxygen for three people, "'if only at the bottom of ravines,' where its own weight would cause it to accumulate, and we will not climb the mountains, that is all. And Michel, rising, went to look at the lunar disk, which shone with intolerable brilliancy. "'By Jove,' said he, "'it must be hot up there.' "'Without considering,' replied Nicholl, "'that the day lasts three hundred sixty hours.' "'And to compensate that,' said Barbicane, "'the nights have the same length.' and as heat is restored by radiation, their temperature can only be that of the planetary space. "'A pretty country, that!' exclaimed Michel. "'Never mind. I wish I was there. Ah, my dear comrades, it will be rather curious to have the earth for our moon, to see it rise on the horizon, to recognize the shape of its continents, and to say to oneself, "'There is America. There is Europe.' then to follow it when it is about to lose itself in the sun's rays. By the by, Barbicane, have the Selenites eclipses? Yes, eclipses of the sun, replied Barbicane, when the centers of the three orbs are on a line, the earth being in the middle. But they are only partial, during which the earth, cast like a screen upon the solar disk, allows the greater portion to be seen. And why? asked Nicholl. Is there no total eclipse? Does not the cone of the shadow cast by the earth extend beyond the moon? Yes, if we do not take into consideration the refraction produced by the terrestrial atmosphere. No, if we take that refraction into consideration. Thus, delta be the horizontal parallel, and p the apparent semi-diameter. Oh, said Michel, do speak plainly, you man of algebra. Very well, replied Barbicane. In popular language, the mean distance from the moon to the earth being sixty terrestrial radii, the length of the cone of the shadow, on account of the refraction, is reduced to less than forty-two radii. The result is that when there are eclipses, the moon finds itself beyond the cone of pure shadow, and that the sun sends her its rays not only from its edges, but also from its center. Then, said Michel, in a merry tone, why are there eclipses when there ought not to be any? Simply because the solar rays are weakened by this refraction, and the atmosphere through which they pass extinguishes the greater part of them. That reason satisfies me, replied Michel. Besides, we shall see when we get there. Now, tell me, Barbicane, do you believe that the moon is an old comet? There's an idea. Yes, said Michel, with an amiable swagger, I have a few ideas of that sort. But that idea does not spring from Michel, answered Nicholl. Well, then, I am a plagiarist. No doubt about it. According to the ancients, the Arcadians pretend that their ancestors inhabited the earth before the moon became her satellite. Starting from this fact, some scientific men have seen in the moon a comet whose orbit will one day bring it so near to the earth that it will be held there by its attraction. "'Is there any truth in this hypothesis?' asked Michel. "'None whatever,' said Barbicane. "'And the proof is that the moon has preserved no trace of the gaseous envelope which always accompanies comets.' "'But,' continued Nicholl, "'before becoming the earth's satellite, could not the moon, when in her perihelion, pass so near the sun as by evaporation to get rid of all those gaseous substances. 
It is possible, friend Nickel, but not probable. Why not? Because, faith, I do not know. Ah! exclaimed Michel, what hundreds of volumes we might make of all that we do not know. Ah, indeed. What time is it? asked Barbicane. Three o'clock, answered Nicholl. How time goes, said Michel, in the conversation of scientific men such as we are. Certainly I feel I know too much. I feel that I am becoming a well. Saying which, Michel hoisted himself to the roof of the projectile, to observe the moon better, he pretended. During this time his companions were watching through the lower glass. Nothing new to note. When Michel Ardin came down, he went to the side scuttle, and suddenly they heard an exclamation of surprise. "'What is it?' asked Barbicane. The president approached the window and saw a sort of flattened sack floating some yards from the projectile. This object seemed as motionless as the projectile, and was consequently animated with the same ascending movement. "'What is that machine?' continued Michel Ardin. Is it one of the bodies of space which our projectile keeps within its attraction, and which will accompany it to the moon? What astonishes me, said Nicholl, is that the specific weight of the body, which is certainly less than that of the projectile, allows it to keep so perfectly on a level with it. Nicholl, replied Barbicane, after a moment's reflection, I do not know what the object is, but I know why it maintains our level. And why? Because we are floating in space, my dear captain, and in space bodies fall or move, which is the same thing, with equal speed whatever be their weight or form. It is the air, which by its resistance creates these differences in weight. When you create a vacuum in a tube, the objects you send through it, grains of dust or grains of lead, fall with the same rapidity. Here in space is the same cause and the same effect. Just so, said Nicholl, and everything we throw out of the projectile will accompany it until it reaches the moon. Ah, fools that we are, exclaimed Michel. Why that expletive? asked Barbicane. Because we might have filled the projectile with useful objects, books, instruments, tools, etc., we could have thrown them all out, and all would have followed in our train. But happy thought, why cannot we walk outside like the meteor? Why cannot we launch into space through the scuttle? What enjoyment it would be to feel oneself thus suspended in ether, more favored than the birds who must use their wings to keep themselves up. Granted, said Barbicane, but how to breathe? Hang the air to fail so inopportunely! But if it did not fail, Michel, your density being less than that of the projectile, you would soon be left behind. Then we must remain in our car? We must. Ah! exclaimed Michel in a loud voice. What is the matter? asked Nicholl. I know, I guess, what this pretended meteor is. It is no asteroid which is accompanying us. It is not a piece of a planet. "'What is it, then?' asked Barbicane. "'It is our unfortunate dog. It is Diana's husband.' Indeed, this deformed, unrecognizable object, reduced to nothing, was the body of satellite, flattened like a bagpipe without wind, and ever mounting, mounting. End of chapter Chapter 7 of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Fern. Chapter 7 A Moment of Intoxication. Thus a phenomenon, curious but explicable, was happening under these strange conditions. Every object thrown from the projectile would follow the same course, and never stop until it did. 
there was a subject for conversation which the whole evening could not exhaust. Besides, the excitement of the three travellers increased as they drew near the end of their journey. They expected unforeseen incidents and new phenomena, and nothing would have astonished them in the frame of mind they then were in. Their overexcited imagination went faster than the projectile, whose speed was evidently diminishing, though insensibly to themselves. But the moon grew larger to their eyes, and they fancied, if they stretched out their hands, they could seize it. The next day, the 5th of November, at five in the morning, all three were on foot. That day was to be the last of their journey, if all calculations were true. That very night, at twelve o'clock, in eighteen hours, exactly at the full moon, they would reach its brilliant disk. The next midnight would see that journey ended, the most extraordinary of ancient or modern times. Thus, from the first of the morning, through the scuttles silvered by its rays, they saluted the orb of night with a confident and joyous hurrah. The moon was advancing majestically along the starry firmament. A few more degrees, and she would reach the exact point where her meeting with the projectile was to take place. According to his own observations, Barbicane reckoned that they would land on her northern hemisphere, where stretch immense plains, and where mountains are rare. A favorable circumstance if, as they thought, the lunar atmosphere was stored only in its depths. Besides, observed Michel Ardin, a plain is easier to disembark upon than a mountain. A selenite deposited in Europe on the summit of Mont Blanc, or in Asia on the top of the Himalayas, would not be quite in the right place. And, added Captain Nicholl, on a flat ground, the projectile will remain motionless when it has once touched, whereas on a declivity it would roll like an avalanche, and not being squirrels we should not come out safe and sound. So it is all for the best. Indeed, the success of the audacious attempt no longer appeared doubtful, but Barbicane was preoccupied with one thought. But not wishing to make his companions uneasy, he kept silence on the subject. The direction the projectile was taking towards the moon's northern hemisphere showed that her course had been slightly altered. The discharge, mathematically calculated, would carry the projectile to the very centre of the lunar disk. If it did not land there, there must have been some deviation. What had caused it? Barbicane could neither imagine nor determine the importance of the deviation, for there were no points to go by. He hoped, however, that it would have no other result than of bringing them nearer the upper border of the moon, a region more suitable for landing. Without imparting his uneasiness to his companions, Barbicane contented himself with constantly observing the moon, in order to see whether the course of the projectile would not be altered, for the situation would have been terrible if it failed in its aim, and being carried beyond the disk should be launched into interplanetary space. At that moment the moon, instead of appearing flat like a disk, showed its convexity. If the sun's rays had struck it obliquely, the shadow thrown would have brought out the high mountains, which would have been clearly detached. The eye might have gazed into the crater's gaping abysses, and followed the capricious fissures which wound through the immense plains. But all relief was as yet leveled in intense brilliancy. They could scarcely distinguish those large spots which give to the moon the appearance of a human face. "'Face, indeed!' said Michel Ardin. But I am sorry for the amiable sister of Apollo, a very pitted face. But the travellers, now so near the end, were incessantly observing this new world. They imagined themselves walking through its unknown countries, climbing its highest peaks, descending into its lowest depths. Here and there they fancied they saw vast seas, scarcely kept together under so rarefied an atmosphere and watercourses emptying the mountain tributaries. Leaning over the abyss, they hoped to catch some sounds from that orb forever mute in the solitude of space. That last day left them. They took down the most trifling details. 
A vague uneasiness took possession of them as they neared the end. This uneasiness would have been doubled had they felt how their speed had decreased. It would have seemed to them quite insufficient to carry them to the end. It was because the projectile then weighed almost nothing. Its weight was ever decreasing, and would be entirely annihilated on that line where the lunar and terrestrial attractions would neutralize each other. But in spite of his preoccupation, Michel Ardan did not forget to prepare the morning repast with his accustomed punctuality. They ate with a good appetite. Nothing was so excellent as the soup liquefied by the heat of the gas, nothing better than the preserved meat. Some glasses of good French wine crowned the repast, causing Michel Ardan to remark that the lunar vines, warmed by that ardent sun, ought to distill even more generous wines, that is, if they existed. In any case, the far-seeing Frenchman had taken care not to forget in his collection some precious cuttings of the Médoc and Côte d'Or, upon which he founded his hopes. Ricet and Reynaud's apparatus worked with great regularity. Not an atom of carbonic acid resisted the potash, and as to the oxygen, Captain Nichols said, it was of the first quality. The little watery vapour enclosed in the projectile, mixing with the air, tempered the dryness, and many apartments in London, Paris, or New York, and many theatres, were certainly not in such a healthy condition. But that it might act with regularity, the apparatus must be kept in perfect order. So each morning Michel visited the escape regulators, tried the taps, and regulated the heat of the gas by the parometer. Everything had gone well up to that time, and the travellers, imitating the worthy Joseph T. Maston, began to acquire a degree of en bon point, which would have rendered them unrecognizable if their imprisonment had been prolonged to some months. In a word, they behaved like chickens in a coop. They were getting fat. In looking through the scuttle, Barbicane saw the spectre of the dog, and other divers objects which had been thrown from the projectile obstinately following them. Diana howled lugubriously on seeing the remains of satellite, which seemed as motionless as if they reposed on the solid earth. "'Do you know, my friends,' said Michel Ardin, "'that if one of us had succumbed to the shock consequent on departure, "'we should have had a great deal of trouble to bury him. "'What am I saying? "'To etherize him, as here ether takes the place of earth. "'You see, the accusing body would have followed us into space like a remorse.' "'That would have been sad,' said Nicholl. "'Ah,' continued Michel, what I regret is not being able to take a walk outside. What voluptuousness to float amid this radiant ether, to bathe oneself in it, to wrap oneself in the sun's pure rays! If Barbicane had only thought of furnishing us with a diving apparatus and an air pump, I could have ventured out and assumed fanciful attitudes of feigned monsters on the top of the projectile. Well, old Michel, replied Barbicane, you would not have made a feigned monster long, for in spite of your diver's dress, swollen by the expansion of air within you, you would have burst like a shell, or rather like a balloon which has risen too high. So do not regret it, and do not forget this. As long as we float in space, all sentimental walks beyond the projectile are forbidden. Michel Ardan allowed himself to be convinced to a certain extent. He admitted that the thing was difficult, but not impossible, a word which he never uttered. The conversation passed from this subject to another, not failing for an instant. It seemed to the three friends as though, under present conditions, ideas shot up in their brains as leaves shoot at the first warmth of spring. They felt bewildered. In the middle of the questions and answers which crossed each other, Nicholl put one question which did not find an immediate solution. "'Ah, indeed,' said he. "'It is all very well to go to the moon, but how to get back again?' His two interlocutors looked surprised. One would have thought that this possibility now occurred to them for the first time. "'What do you mean by that, Nicholl?' asked Barbicane gravely. "'To ask for means to leave a country.' 
added Michelle, when we have not yet arrived there, seems to me rather inopportune. I do not say that, wishing to draw back, replied Nicholl, but I repeat my question, and I ask, how shall we return? I know nothing about it, answered Barbicane. And I, said Michel, if I had known how to return, I would never have started. There's an answer, cried Nicholl. I quite approve of Michel's words, said Barbicane and add that the question has no real interest. Later, when we think it advisable to return, we will take counsel together. If the Columbiad is not there, the projectile will be. That is a step, certainly. A ball without a gun. The gun, replied Barbicane, can be manufactured. The powder can be made. Neither metals, saltpeter, nor coal can fail in the depths of the moon, and we need only go eight thousand leagues in order to fall upon the terrestrial globe by virtue of the mere laws of weight. Enough, said Michel, with animation. Let it be no longer a question of returning. We have already entertained it too long. As to communicating with our former earthly colleagues, that will not be difficult. And how? By means of meteors launched by lunar volcanoes. Well thought of, Michel said Barbicane, in a convinced tone of voice, Laplace has calculated that a force five times greater than that of our gun would suffice to send a meteor from the moon to the earth, and there is not one volcano which has not a greater power of propulsion than that. Hurrah! exclaimed Michel. These meteors are handy postmen, and cost nothing. And how we shall be able to laugh at the post office administration! But now I think of it— what do you think of? A capital idea! Why did we not fasten a thread to our projectile, and we could have exchanged telegrams with the earth? <laughs> the deuce! answered Nicholl. Do you consider the weight of a thread two hundred fifty thousand miles long nothing? As nothing. They could have trebled the Columbiad's charge. They could have quadrupled or quintupled it exclaimed Michel, with whom the verb took a higher intonation each time. "'There is but one little objection to make to your proposition,' replied Barbicane, "'which is that, during the rotary motion of the globe, our thread would have wound itself round it like a chain on a capstan, and that it would inevitably have brought us to the ground.' "'By the thirty-nine stars of the Union,' said Michel, I have nothing but impracticable ideas today, ideas worthy of J.T. Maston. But I have a notion that, if we do not return to Earth, J.T. Maston will be able to come to us. Yes, he'll come, replied Barbicane. He is a worthy and a courageous comrade. Besides, what is easier? Is not the Columbiad still buried in the soil of Florida? Is cotton and nitric acid wanted wherewith to manufacture the peroxyl? Will not the moon again pass to the zenith of Florida? In eighteen years' time will she not occupy exactly the same place as today? Yes, continued Michel. Yes, Manston will come. And with him are friends Elphinstone, Blomsbury, all the members of the gun club, and they will be well received and by and by they will run trains of projectiles between the earth and the moon. Hurrah for J. T. Maston! It is probable that, if the Honourable J. T. Maston did not hear the hurrahs uttered in his honour, his ears at least tingled. What was he doing, then? Doubtless posted in the Rocky Mountains, at the station of Long's Peak, he was trying to find the invisible projectile gravitating in space. If he was thinking of his dear companions, we must allow that they were not far behind him, and that, under the influence of a strange excitement, they were devoting to him their best thoughts. But whence this excitement, which was evidently growing upon the tenets of the projectile? Their sobriety could not be doubted. This strange irritation of the brain, must it be attributed to the peculiar circumstances under which they found themselves? to their proximity to the orb of night, from which only a few hours separated them, to some secret influence of the moon, acting upon their nervous system. 
their faces were as rosy as if they had been exposed to the roaring flames of an oven their voices resounded in loud accents their words escaped like a champagne cork driven out by carbonic acid their gestures became annoying they wanted so much room to perform them and strange to say they none of them noticed this great tension of the mind now said nicholl in a short tone now that i do not know whether we shall ever return from the moon i want to know what are we going to do there what we are going to do there replied barbicane stamping with his foot as if he was in a fencing saloon i do not know you do not know exclaimed michel with a bellow which provoked a sonorous echo in the projectile no i have not even thought about it retorted barbicane in the same loud tone well i know replied michel speak then cried nicholl who could no longer contain the growling of his voice i shall speak if it suits me exclaimed michel seizing his companion's arms with violence it must suit you said barbicane with an eye on fire and a threatening hand it was you who drew us into this frightful journey and we want to know what for yes said the captain now that i do not know where i am going i want to know why i am going why exclaimed michel jumping a yard high why to take possession of the moon in the name of the united states to add a fortieth state to the union to colonize the lunar regions to cultivate them to people them to transport thither all the prodigies of art of science and industry to civilize the selenites unless they are more civilized than we are and to constitute them a republic if they are not already one and if there are no selenites retorted nicholl who under the influence of this unaccountable intoxication was very contradictory who said there were no selenites exclaimed michel in a threatening tone i do howled nicholl captain said michel do not repeat that insolence or i will knock your teeth down your throat the two adversaries were going to fall upon each other and the incoherent discussion threatened to merge into a fight when barbicane intervened with one bound stop miserable men said he separating his two companions if there are no selenites we will do without them yes exclaimed michel who was not particular yes we will do without them we have only to make selenites down with the selenites the empire of the moon belongs to us said nicholl let us three constitute the republic i will be the congress cried michel and i the senate retorted nicholl and barbicane the president howled michel not a president elected by the nation replied barbicane very well a president elected by the congress cried michel and as i am the congress you are unanimously elected hurrah 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 for president barbicane exclaimed nicholl hip 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 vociferated michel ardin then the president and the senate struck up in a tremendous voice the popular song yankee doodle whilst from the congress resounded the masculine tones of the marseillaise then they struck up a frantic dance with maniacal gestures idiotic stampings and somersaults like those of the boneless clowns in the circus diana joining in the dance and howling in her turn jumped to the top of the projectile an unaccountable flapping of wings was then heard amidst most fantastic cockcrows while five or six hens fluttered like bats against the walls then the three travelling companions acted upon by some unaccountable influence above that of intoxication inflamed by the air which had set their respiratory apparatus on fire fell motionless to the bottom of the projectile end of chapter chapter 8 of round the moon this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne Chapter 8 At 78,514 Leagues What had happened? Whence the cause of this singular intoxication, the consequences of which might have been very disastrous? A simple blunder of Michel's, which, fortunately, Nicol was able to correct in time. After a perfect swoon, which lasted some minutes, the captain, recovering first, soon collected his scattered senses. Although he had breakfasted only two hours before, he felt a gnawing hunger, as if he had not eaten anything for several days. Everything about him, stomach and brain, were over-excited to the highest degree. He got up and demanded from Michel a supplementary repast. Michel, utterly done up, did not answer. Nicol then tried to prepare some tea, destined to help the absorption of a dozen sandwiches. He first tried to get some fire, and struck a match sharply. What was his surprise to see the sulphur shine with so extraordinary a brilliancy as to be almost unbearable to the eye? From the gas-burner which he lit rose a flame equal to a jet of electric light. A revelation dawned on Nicol's mind. That intensity of light— the physiological troubles which had arisen in him, the over-excitement of all his moral and quarrelsome faculties, he understood all. "'The oxygen!' he exclaimed. And leaning over the air apparatus, he saw that the tap was allowing the scentless, colourless gas to escape freely, life-giving, but in its pure state, producing the gravest disorders in the system." Michel had blunderingly opened the tap of the apparatus to the full. Nicol hastened to stop the escape of oxygen with which the atmosphere was saturated, which would have been the death of the travellers, not by suffocation, but by combustion. An hour later, the air less charged with it restored the lungs to their normal condition. By degrees the three friends recovered from their intoxication— but they were obliged to sleep themselves sober over their oxygen, as a drunkard does over his wine. When Michel learned his share of the responsibility of this incident, he was not much disconcerted. This unexpected drunkenness broke the monotony of the journey. Many foolish things have been said while under its influence, but all so quickly forgotten. "'And then,' added the merry Frenchman, I am not sorry to have tasted a little of this heady gas. Do you know, my friends, that a curious establishment might be founded with rooms of oxygen, where people whose system is weakened could for a few hours live a more active life? Fancy parties where the room was saturated with this heroic fluid, theatres where it should be kept at high pressure. What passion in the souls of the actors and spectators! What fire! What enthusiasm! And if, instead of an assembly, only a whole people could be saturated, what activity in its functions! What a supplement to life it would derive! From an exhausted nation they might make a great and strong one, and I know more than one state in old Europe which ought to put itself under the regime of oxygen for the sake of its health." Michel spoke with so much animation that one might have fancied that the tap was still too open, but a few words from Barbicane soon scattered his enthusiasm. "'That is all very well, friend Michel,' said he. "'But will you inform us where these chickens came from, which have mixed themselves up in our concert?' "'Those chickens?' "'Yes.' Indeed, half a dozen chickens and a fine cock were walking about, flapping their wings and chattering. "'Ah, the awkward things!' exclaimed Michel. "'The oxygen has made them revolt.' "'But what do you want to do with these chickens?' asked Barbicane. "'To acclimatize them in the moon, by Jove!' "'Then why did you hide them?' "'A joke, my worthy president, a simple joke.' which has proved a miserable failure. I wanted to set them free on the lunar continent without saying anything. Oh, what would have been your amazement on seeing these earthly-winged animals pecking in the lunar fields? 
"'You rascal! You unmitigated rascal!' replied Barbicane. "'You do not want oxygen to mount to the head. You were always what we were under the influence of the gas. You were always foolish.' "'Ah, who says that we were not wise, then?' replied Michel Ardin. After this philosophical reflection, the three friends set about restoring the order of the projectile. Chickens and cock were reinstated in their coop. But whilst proceeding with this operation, Barbicane and his two companions had a most desired perception of a new phenomenon. From the moment of leaving the earth, their own weight, that of the projectile, and the objects it enclosed, had been subject to an increasing diminution. If they could not prove this loss of the projectile, a moment would arrive when it would be sensibly felt upon themselves and the utensils and instruments they used. It is needless to say that a scale would not show this loss, for the weight destined to weigh the object would have lost exactly as much as the object itself. But a spring steel-yard, for example, the tension of which was independent of the attraction, would have given a just estimate of this loss. We know that the attraction, otherwise called the weight, is in proportion to the densities of bodies, and inversely as the squares of the distances. Hence this effect. If the earth had been alone in space, if the other celestial bodies had been suddenly annihilated, the projectile, according to Newton's laws, would weigh less as it got further from the earth, but without ever losing its weight entirely for the terrestrial attraction would always have made itself felt at whatever distance. But in reality, a time must come when the projectile would no longer be subject to the law of weight, after allowing for the other celestial bodies whose effects could not be set down as zero. Indeed, the projectile's course was being traced between the earth and the moon. As it distanced the earth, the terrestrial attraction diminished, but the lunar attraction rose in proportion. There must then come a point where these two attractions would neutralize each other. The projectile would possess weight no longer. If the moon's and the earth's densities had been equal, this point would have been at an equal distance between the two orbs. But taking the different densities into consideration, it was easy to reckon that this point would be situated at forty-seven sixtieths of the whole journey, that is, at seventy-eight thousand five hundred fourteen leagues from the earth. At this point, a body having no principle of speed or displacement in itself would remain immovable forever, being attracted equally by both orbs, and not being drawn more towards one than towards the other. Now, if the projectile's impulsive force had been correctly calculated, it would attain this point without speed, having lost all trace of weight, as well as all the objects within it. What would happen then? Three hypotheses presented themselves. 1. Either it would retain a certain amount of motion and pass the point of equal attraction, and fall upon the moon by virtue of the excess of the lunar attraction over the terrestrial. 2. Or, its speed failing and unable to reach the point of equal attraction, it would fall back upon the earth by virtue of the excess of the terrestrial attraction over the lunar. 3. Or lastly, animated with sufficient speed to enable it to reach the neutral point, but not sufficient to pass it, it would remain forever suspended in that spot like the pretended tomb of Mahomet, between the zenith and the nadir. Such was their situation, and Barbicane clearly explained the consequences to his travelling companions, which greatly interested them. But how should they know when the projectile had reached this neutral point, situated at that distance, especially when neither themselves nor the objects enclosed in the projectile would be any longer subject to the laws of weight. Up to this time the travellers, whilst admitting that this action was constantly decreasing, had not yet become sensible to its total absence. But that day, about eleven o'clock in the morning, Nicholl, having accidentally let a glass slip from his hand, 
the glass, instead of falling, remained suspended in the air. Ah! exclaimed Michel Ardin, that is rather an amusing piece of natural philosophy. And immediately divers other objects, firearms and bottles, abandoned to themselves, held themselves up as by enchantment. Diana, too, placed in space by Michel, reproduced, but without any trick, the wonderful suspension practised by Caston and Robert Houdin. Indeed, the dog did not seem to know that she was floating in air. The three adventurous companions were surprised and stupefied. Despite their scientific reasonings, they felt themselves being carried into the domain of wonders. They felt that weight was really wanting to their bodies. If they stretched out their arms, they did not attempt to fall. Their heads shook on their shoulders. Their feet no longer clung to the floor of the projectile. They were like drunken men having no stability in themselves. Fancy had depicted men without reflection, others without shadow. But here reality, by the neutralization of attractive forces, produced men in whom nothing had any weight, and who weighed nothing themselves. Suddenly Michel, taking a spring, left the floor and remained suspended in the air, like Murillo's monk of the Cousine des Anges. The two friends joined him instantly, and all three formed a miraculous ascension in the centre of the projectile. "'Is it to be believed? Is it probable? Is it possible?' exclaimed Michel. "'And yet it is so. Ah, if Raphael had seen us thus, what an assumption he would have thrown upon canvas!' "'The assumption cannot last.' replied Barbicane. If the projectile passes the neutral point, the lunar attraction will draw us to the moon. Then our feet will be upon the roof, replied Michel. No, said Barbicane, because the projectile's center of gravity is very low. It will only turn by degrees. Then all our portables will be upset from top to bottom. That is a fact. Calm yourself, Michel replied Nicholl. No upset is to be feared. Not a thing will move, for the projectile's evolution will be imperceptible. Just so, continued Barbicane, and when it is past the point of equal attraction, its base, being the heavier, will draw it perpendicularly to the moon. But, in order that this phenomenon should take place, we must have passed the neutral line. Pass the neutral line, cried Michel. Then let us do as the sailors do when they cross the equator. A slight slide movement brought Michel back towards the padded side. Thence he took a bottle and glasses, placed them in space before his companions, and, drinking merrily, they saluted the line with a triple hurrah. The influence of these attractions scarcely lasted an hour. The travellers felt themselves insensibly drawn towards the floor, and Barbicane fancied that the conical end of the projectile was varying a little from its normal direction towards the moon. By an inverse motion the base was approaching first. The lunar attraction was prevailing over the terrestrial. The fall towards the moon was beginning, almost imperceptibly as yet, but by degrees the attractive force would become stronger the fall would be more decided. The projectile, drawn by its base, would turn its cone to the earth, and fall with ever-increasing speed on to the surface of the selenite continent. Their destination would then be attained. Now nothing could prevent the success of their enterprise, and Nicholl and Michel Ardin shared Barbicane's joy. Then they chatted of all the phenomena which had astonished them one after the other particularly the neutralization of the laws of weight. Michel Ardin, always enthusiastic, drew conclusions which were purely fanciful. "'Ah, my worthy friends!' he exclaimed. "'What progress we should make if on earth we could throw off some of that weight, some of that chain which binds us to her! It would be the prisoner set at liberty. No more fatigue of either arms or legs. Or— if it is true that in order to fly on the earth's surface, to keep oneself suspended in the air merely by the play of the muscles, 
there requires a strength of one hundred and fifty times greater than that which we possess a simple act of volition a caprice would bear us into space if attraction did not exist just so said nicholl smiling if we could succeed in suppressing weight as they suppress pain by anaesthesia that would change the face of modern society yes cried michel full of his subject destroy weight and no more burdens well said replied barbicane but if nothing had any weight nothing would keep in its place not even your hat on your head worthy michel nor your house whose stones only adhere by weight not a boat whose stability on the water is caused only by weight not even the ocean whose waves would no longer be equalized by terrestrial attraction and lastly not even the atmosphere whose atoms being no longer held in their places would disperse into space that is tiresome retorted michel nothing like these matter-of-fact people for bringing one back to the bare reality but console yourself michel continued barbicane for if no orb exists from whence all laws of weight are banished you are at least going to visit one where it is much less than on the earth the moon yes the moon on whose surface objects weigh six times less than on the earth a phenomenon easy to prove and we shall feel it asked michel evidently as two hundred pounds will only weigh thirty pounds on the surface of the moon and our muscular strength will not diminish not at all instead of jumping one yard high you will rise eighteen feet high but we shall be regular hercules in the moon exclaimed michel yes replied nicholl for if the height of the selenites is in proportion to the density of their globe they will be scarcely a foot high lilliputians ejaculated michel i shall play the part of gulliver we are going to realize the fable of the giants this is the advantage of leaving one's own planet and overrunning the solar world one moment michel answered barbicane if you wish to play the part of gulliver only visit the inferior planets such as mercury venus or mars whose density is a little less than that of the earth but do not venture into the great planets jupiter saturn uranus neptune for there the order will be changed and you will become lilliputian and in the sun in the sun if its density is thirteen hundred and twenty four thousand times greater and the attraction is twenty-seven times greater than on the surface of our globe keeping everything in proportion the inhabitants ought to be at least two hundred feet high by jove exclaimed michel i shall be nothing more than a pygmy a shrimp gulliver with the giants said nicholl just so replied barbicane and it would not be quite useless to carry some pieces of artillery to defend oneself good replied nicholl your projectiles would have no effect on the sun they would fall back on the earth after some minutes that is a strong remark it is certain replied barbicane the attraction is so great on this enormous orb that an object weighing seventy thousand pounds on the sun would weigh but nineteen hundred twenty pounds on the surface of the earth if you were to fall upon it you would weigh uh, let me see about five thousand pounds a weight which you would never be able to raise again the devil said michel one would want a portable crane however we will be satisfied with the moon for the present there at least we shall cut a great figure we will see about the sun by and by. End of chapter. Chapter Nine of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne Chapter 9 The Consequences of a Deviation Barbicane had now no fear of the issue of the journey, at least as far as the projectile's impulsive force was concerned. Its own speed would carry it beyond the neutral line. It would certainly not return to earth. It would certainly not remain motionless on the line of attraction. One single hypothesis remained to be realized, the arrival of the projectile at its destination by the action of the lunar attraction. It was, in reality, a fall of 8,296 leagues on an orb, it is true, where weight could only be reckoned at one-sixth of the terrestrial weight. A formidable fall, nevertheless, and one against which every precaution must be taken without delay. These precautions were of two sorts, some to deaden the shock when the projectile should touch the lunar soil, others to delay the fall and consequently make it less violent. To deaden the shock, it was a pity that Barbicane was no longer able to employ the means which had so ably weakened the shock at departure, that is to say, by water used as springs and the partition breaks. The partitions still existed, but water failed, for they could not use their reserve, which was precious, in case during the first days the liquid element should be found wanting on lunar soil. And indeed, this reserve would have been quite insufficient for a spring. The layer of water stored in the projectile at their departure, and on which the waterproof disk lay, occupied no less than three feet in depth, and spread over a surface of not less than fifty-four square feet. Besides, the cistern did not contain one-fifth part of it. They must therefore give up this efficient means of deadening the shock of arrival. Happily, Barbicane, not content with employing water, had furnished the movable disk with strong spring plugs, destined to lessen the shock against the base after the breaking of the horizontal partitions. These plugs still existed, they had only to readjust them and replace the movable disk, every piece easy to handle, as their weight was now scarcely felt, was quickly mounted. The different pieces were fitted without trouble, it being only a matter of bolts and screws. Tools were not wanting, and soon the reinstated disc lay on its steel plugs, like a table on its legs. One inconvenience resulted from the replacing of the disc. The lower window was blocked up. Thus it was impossible for the travellers to observe the moon from that opening, while they were being precipitated perpendicularly upon her. But they were obliged to give it up. Even by the side openings they could still see vast lunar regions, as an aeronaut sees the earth from his car. This replacing of the disc was at least an hour's work. It was past twelve when all preparations were finished. Barbicane took fresh observations on the inclination of the projectile, but to his annoyance it had not turned over sufficiently for its fall. It seemed to take a curve parallel to the lunar disk. The orb of night shone splendidly into space, while opposite, the orb of day blazed with fire. Their situation began to make them uneasy. "'Are we reaching our destination?' said Nicholl. "'Let us act as if we were about reaching it,' replied Barbicane. "'You are sceptical retorted Michel Ardin. "'We shall arrive, and that, too, quicker than we like.' This answer brought Barbicane back to his preparations, and he occupied himself with placing the contrivances intended to break their descent. We may remember the scene of the meeting held at Tampa Town, in Florida, when Captain Nicholl came forward as Barbicane's enemy and Michel Ardan's adversary. To Captain Nicholl's maintaining that the projector would smash like glass, Michel replied that he would break their fall by means of rockets properly placed. Thus powerful fireworks, taking their starting point from the base and bursting outside, could, by producing a recoil, check to a certain degree the projectile's speed. These rockets were to burn in space, it is true, 
but oxygen would not fail them, for they could supply themselves with it, like the lunar volcanoes, the burning of which has never yet been stopped by the want of atmosphere round the moon. Barbicane had accordingly supplied himself with these fireworks, enclosed in little steel guns, which could be screwed on to the base of the projectile. Inside, these guns were flush with the bottom. Outside, they protruded about eighteen inches. There were twenty of them. An opening left in the disc allowed them to light the match with which each was provided. All the effect was felt outside. Their burning mixture had been already rammed into each gun. They had, then, nothing to do but to raise the metallic buffers fixed in the base, and replace them by the guns, which fitted closely in their places. This new work was finished about three o'clock, and after taking all these precautions, there remained but to wait. But the projectile was perceptibly nearing the moon, and evidently succumbed to her influence to a certain degree, though its own velocity also drew it in an oblique direction. From these conflicting influences resulted a line which might become a tangent, but it was certain that the projectile would not fall directly on the moon, for its lower part, by reason of its weight, ought to be turned towards her. Barbicane's uneasiness increased as he saw his projectile resist the influence of gravitation. The unknown was opening before him, the unknown in interplanetary space. The man of science thought he had foreseen the only three hypotheses possible. The return to the earth, the return to the moon, or stagnation on the neutral line. And here a fourth hypothesis, big with all the terrors of the infinite, surged up inopportunely. To face it without flinching, one must be a resolute savant like Barbicane, a phlegmatic being like Nicol, or an audacious adventurer like Michel Ardin. Conversation was started upon this subject. Other men would have considered the question from a practical point of view. They would have asked themselves whither their projectile carriage was carrying them, not so with these, they sought for the cause which produced this effect. "'So we have become diverted from our route,' said Michel. "'But why?' "'I very much fear,' answered Nicholl, "'that, in spite of all precautions taken, the Columbiad was not fairly pointed. An error, however small, would be enough to throw us out of the moon's attraction.' "'Then they must have aimed badly?' asked Michel. I do not think so, replied Barbicane. The perpendicularity of the gun was exact, its direction to the zenith of the spot incontestable, and the moon passing to the zenith of the spot, we ought to reach it at the full. There is another reason, but it escapes me. Are we not arriving too late? asked Nicholl. Too late? said Barbicane. Yes, continued Nicholl. The Cambridge Observatory's note says that the transit ought to be accomplished in ninety-seven hours, thirteen minutes, and twenty seconds, which means to say that sooner the moon will not be at the point indicated, and that later it will have passed it. True, replied Barbicane, but we started the first of December at thirteen minutes and twenty-five seconds to eleven at night and we ought to arrive on the fifth at midnight, at the exact moment when the moon would be full, and we are now at the fifth of December. It is now half-past three in the evening. Half-past eight ought to see us at the end of our journey. Why do we not arrive? Might it not be an excess of speed? answered Nicholl, for we know now that its initial velocity was greater than they supposed. No, a hundred times, no, replied Barbicane. An excess of speed, if the direction of the projectile had been right, would not have prevented us reaching the moon. No, there has been a deviation. We have been turned out of our course. By whom? By what? asked Nicholl. I cannot say, replied Barbicane. Very well, then, Barbicane, said Michel. Do you wish to know my opinion on the subject of finding out this deviation? Speak. 
I would not give half a dollar to know it. That we have deviated is a fact. Where we are going to matters little. We shall soon see. Since we are being borne along in space, we shall end by falling into some centre of attraction or other. Michel Ardan's indifference did not content Barbicane. Not that he was uneasy about the future, but he wanted to know at any cost why his projectile had deviated. But the projectile continued its course sideways to the moon, and with it the mass of things thrown out. Barbicane could even prove, by the elevations which served as landmarks upon the moon, which was only two thousand leagues distant, that its speed was becoming uniform, fresh proof that there was no fall. Its impulsive force still prevailed over the lunar attraction, but the projectile's course was certainly bringing it nearer to the moon, and they might hope that at a nearer point the weight, predominating, would cause a decided fall. The three friends, having nothing better to do, continued their observations, but they could not yet determine the topographical position of the satellite. Every relief was leveled under the reflection of the solar rays. They watched thus through the side windows until eight o'clock at night. The moon had then grown so large in their eyes that it filled half of the firmament. The sun, on one side, and the orb of night on the other flooded the projectile with light. At that moment Barbicane thought he could estimate the distance which separated them from their aim at no more than seven hundred leagues. The speed of the projectile seemed to him to be more than two hundred yards, or about one hundred seventy leagues an hour. Under the centripetal force, the base of the projectile tended towards the moon, but the centrifugal still prevailed and it was probable that its rectilineal course would be changed to a curve of some sort, the nature of which they could not at present determine. Barbicane was still seeking the solution of his insoluble problem. Hours passed without any result. The projector was evidently nearing the moon, but it was also evident that it would never reach her. As to the nearest distance at which it would pass her, that would be the result of the two forces, attraction and repulsion, affecting its motion. "'I ask but one thing,' said Michel, "'that we may pass near enough to penetrate her secrets.' "'Cursed be the thing that has caused our projectile to deviate from its course,' cried Nicol. And, as if a light had suddenly broken in upon his mind, Barbicane answered, "'Then cursed be the meteor which crossed our path.' "'What?' said Michel Ardan. "'What do you mean?' exclaimed Nicol. "'I mean,' said Barbicane, in a decided tone, "'I mean that our deviation is owing solely to our meeting with this erring body.' "'But it did not even brush us as it passed,' said Michel. "'What does that matter? Its mass, compared to that of our projectile, was enormous, and its attraction was enough to influence our course.' "'So little?' cried Nicol. "'Yes, Nicol, but however little it might be,' replied Barbicane, "'in a distance of eighty-four thousand leagues, it wanted no more to make us miss the moon.'" End of chapter Chapter Ten of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon, by Jules Verne. Chapter Ten, The Observers of the Moon. Barbicane had evidently hit upon the only plausible reason of this deviation. However slight it might have been, it had sufficed to modify the course of the projectile. It was a fatality. The bold attempt had miscarried by a fortuitous circumstance, and unless by some exceptional event they could now never reach the moon's disk. Would they pass near enough to be able to solve certain physical and geological questions, 
until then insoluble? This was the question, and the only one, which occupied the minds of these bold travellers. As to the fate in store for themselves, they did not even dream of it. What would become of them amid these infinite solitudes, these who would soon want air? A few more days, and they would fall stifled in this wandering projectile. But some days to these intrepid fellows was a century, and they devoted all their time to observe that moon which they no longer hoped to reach. The distance which then separated the projectile from the satellite was estimated at about two hundred leagues. Under these conditions, as regards the visibility of the details of the disk, the travellers were farther from the moon than are the inhabitants of the earth with their powerful telescopes. Indeed, we know that the instrument mounted by Lord Ross at Parsonstown, which magnifies sixty-five hundred times, brings the moon to within an apparent distance of sixteen leagues. And more than that, with the powerful one set up at Long's Peak, the orb of night, magnified forty-eight thousand times, is brought to within less than two leagues, and objects having a diameter of thirty feet are seen very distinctly. So that, at this distance, the topographical details of the moon, observed without glasses, could not be determined with precision. The eye caught the vast outline of those immense depressions, inappropriately called seas, but they could not recognize their nature. The prominence of the mountains disappeared under the splendid irradiation produced by the reflection of the solar rays. The eye, dazzled as if it was leaning over a bath of molten silver, turned from it involuntarily. But the oblong form of the orb was quite clear. It appeared like a gigantic egg, with the small end turned towards the earth. Indeed, the moon, liquid and pliable in the first days of its formation, was originally a perfect sphere. But being soon drawn within the attraction of the earth, it became elongated under the influence of gravitation. In becoming a satellite, she lost her native purity of form. Her centre of gravity was in advance of the centre of her figure, and from this fact some savants draw the conclusion that the air and water had taken refuge on the opposite surface of the moon, which is never seen from the earth. This alteration in the primitive form of the satellite was only perceptible for a few moments. The distance of the projectile from the moon diminished very rapidly under its speed, though that was much less than its initial velocity, but eight or nine times greater than that which propels our express trains. The oblique course of the projectile, from its very obliquity, gave Michel Ardin some hopes of striking the lunar disk at some point or other. He could not think that they would never reach it. No, he could not believe it, and this opinion he often repeated. But Barbicane, who was a better judge, always answered him with merciless logic. No, Michel, no. We can only reach the moon by a fall, and we are not falling. The centripetal force keeps us under the moon's influence, but the centrifugal force draws us irresistibly away from it. This was said in a tone which quenched Michel Ardan's last hope. The portion of the moon which the projectile was nearing was the northern hemisphere, that which the selenographic maps place below, for these maps are generally drawn after the outline given by the glasses, and we know that they reverse the objects. Such was the Mappa Selenographica of Bohr and Merdler, which Barbicane consulted. This northern hemisphere presented vast plains dotted with isolated mountains. At midnight the moon was full. At that precise moment the travellers should have alighted upon it, if the mischievous meteor had not diverted their course. The orb was exactly in the condition determined by the Cambridge Observatory. It was mathematically at its perigee, and at the zenith of the twenty-eighth parallel. An observer placed at the bottom of the enormous Columbiad, pointed perpendicularly to the horizon, would have framed the moon in the mouth of the gun. 
a straight line drawn through the axis of the piece, would have passed through the centre of the orb of night. It is needless to say that during the night of the 5th through the 6th of December, the travellers took not an instant's rest. Could they close their eyes when so near this new world? No. All their feelings were concentrated in one single thought. See? Representatives of the earth, of humanity, past and present, all centred in them. It is through their eyes that the human race look at these lunar regions, and penetrate the secrets of their satellite. A strange emotion filled their hearts as they went from one window to the other. Their observations, reproduced by Barbicane, were rigidly determined. To take them, they had glasses. To correct them, maps. As regards the optical instruments at their disposal, they had excellent marine glasses specially constructed for this journey. They possessed magnifying powers of one hundred. They would thus have brought the moon to within a distance, apparent, of less than two thousand leagues from the earth, but then, at a distance which for three hours in the morning did not exceed sixty-five miles, and in a medium free from all atmospheric disturbances, these instruments could reduce the lunar surface to within less than fifteen hundred yards. End of chapter. Chapter 11 of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 11 Fancy and Reality. "'Have you ever seen the moon?' asked a professor, ironically, of one of his pupils. "'No, sir,' replied the pupil, still more ironically. "'But I must say I have heard it spoken of.' In one sense, the pupil's witty answer might be given by a large majority of sublunary beings. How many people have heard speak of the moon who have never seen it, at least through a glass or a telescope?' How many have never examined the map of their satellite? In looking at a selenographic map, one peculiarity strikes us. Contrary to the arrangement followed for that of the Earth and Mars, the continents occupy more particularly the southern hemisphere of the lunar globe. These continents do not show such decided, clear, and regular boundary lines as South America, Africa, and the Indian Peninsula. Their angular, capricious, and deeply indented coasts are rich in gulfs and peninsulas. They remind one of the confusion in the islands of the Sound, where the land is excessively indented. If navigation ever existed on the surface of the moon, it must have been wonderfully difficult and dangerous, and we may well pity the Selenite sailors and hydrographers. The former, when they came upon these perilous coasts, the latter when they took the soundings of its stormy banks. We may also notice that, on the lunar sphere, the South Pole is much more continental than the North Pole. On the latter, there is but one slight strip of land separated from other continents by vast seas. Towards the South, continents clothe almost the whole of the hemisphere. It is even possible that the Selenites have already planted the flag on one of their poles, whilst Franklin, Ross, Kane, Dumont d'Urville, and Lambert have never yet been able to attain that unknown point of the terrestrial globe. As to islands, they are numerous on the surface of the moon, nearly all oblong or circular, and as if traced with the compass, they seem to form one vast archipelago equal to that charming group lying between Greece and Asia Minor, and which mythology in ancient times adorned with most graceful legends. Involuntarily the names of Naxos, Tenedos, and Carpathos rise before the mind, and we seek vainly for Ulysses' vessel or the clipper of the Argonauts. 
So at least it was in Michel Ardin's eyes. To him it was a Grecian archipelago that he saw on the map. To the eyes of his matter-of-fact companions, the aspect of these coasts recalled rather the parceled-out land of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, and where the Frenchmen discovered traces of the heroes of fable, these Americans were marking the most favourable points for the establishment of stores in the interests of lunar commerce and industry. After wandering over these vast continents, the eye is attracted by still greater seas. Not only their formation, but their situation and aspect remind one of the terrestrial oceans, but again, as on earth, these seas occupy the greater portion of the globe. But in point of fact, these are not liquid spaces, but plains, the nature of which the travellers hoped soon to determine. Astronomers, we must allow, have graced these pretended seas with at least odd names, which science has respected up to the present time. Michel Ardan was right when he compared this map to a Tendre card, got up by a Scuderi or a Cyrano de Bergerac. Only, said he, it is no longer the sentimental card of the seventeenth century, it is the card of life, very neatly divided into two parts, one feminine, the other masculine, the right hemisphere for woman, the left for man. In speaking thus, Michel made his prosaic companions shrug their shoulders. Barbicane and Nicol looked upon the lunar map from a very different point of view to that of their fantastic friend. Nevertheless, their fantastic friend was a little in the right. Judge for yourselves. In the left hemisphere stretches the Sea of Clouds, where human reason is so often shipwrecked. Not far off lies the Sea of Rains, fed by all the fever of existence. Near this is the Sea of Storms, where man is ever fighting against his passions, which too often gain the victory. Then, worn out by deceit, treasons, infidelity, and the whole body of terrestrial misery, what does he find at the end of his career? That vast sea of humours, barely softened by some drops of the waters from the gulf of dew. Clouds, rain, storms, and humours, does the life of man contain aught but these? And is it not summed up in these four words? The right hemisphere, dedicated to the ladies, encloses smaller seas, whose significant names contain every incident of a feminine existence. There is the Sea of Serenity, over which the young girl bends, the Lake of Dreams, reflecting a joyous future, the Sea of Nectar, with its waves of tenderness and breezes of love, the Sea of Fruitfulness, the Sea of Crises, then the Sea of Vapours, whose dimensions are perhaps a little too confined, and lastly, that vast sea of tranquillity, in which every false passion, every useless dream, every unsatisfied desire, is at length absorbed, and whose waves emerge peaceably into the lake of death. <laughs> what a strange succession of names! What a singular division of the moon's two hemispheres, joined to one another like man and woman, and forming that sphere of life carried into space. And was not the fantastic Michel right in thus interpreting the fancies of the ancient astronomers? But whilst his imagination thus roved over the seas, his grave companions were considering things more geographically. They were learning this new world by heart. They were measuring angles and diameters. End of chapter Chapter Twelve of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter Twelve Orographic Details. 
The course taken by the projectile, as we have before remarked, was bearing it toward the moon's northern hemisphere. The travellers were far from the central point which they would have struck, had their course not been subject to an irremediable deviation. It was past midnight, and Barbicane then estimated the distance at 750 miles, which was a little greater than the length of the lunar radius, and which would diminish as it advanced nearer to the North Pole. The projectile was not then at the altitude of the equator, but across the tenth parallel, and from that latitude, carefully taken on the map to the pole, Barbicane and his two companions were able to observe the moon under the most favorable conditions. Indeed, by means of glasses, the above-named distance was reduced to little more than fourteen miles. The telescope of the Rocky Mountains brought the moon much nearer, but the terrestrial atmosphere singularly lessened its power. Thus Barbicane, posted in his projectile, with the glasses to his eyes, could seize upon details which were almost imperceptible to earthly observers. "'My friends,' said the President, in a serious voice, "'I do not know whither we are going. I do not know if we shall ever see the terrestrial globe again. Nevertheless, let us proceed as if our work would one day be useful to our fellow men. Let us keep our minds free from every other consideration. We are astronomers.' and this projectile is a room in the Cambridge Observatory, carried into space. Let us make our observations. This said, work was begun with great exactness, and they faithfully reproduced the different aspects of the moon, at the different distances which the projectile reached. At the time that the projectile was as high as the tenth parallel, north latitude, it seemed rigidly to follow the twentieth degree, east longitude, we must here make one important remark with regard to the map by which they were taking observations. In the selenographical maps where, on account of the reversing of the objects by the glasses, the south is above and the north below, it would seem natural that, on account of that inversion, the east should be the left hand and the west to the right. But it is not so. If the map were turned upside down, showing the moon as we see her, the east would be to the left and the west to the right, contrary to that which exists on terrestrial maps. The following is the reason of this anomaly. Observers in the northern hemisphere, say in Europe, see the moon in the south, according to them. When they take observations, they turn their backs to the north the reverse position to that which they occupy when they study a terrestrial map. As they turn their backs to the north, the east is on their left and the west to their right. To observers in the southern hemisphere, Patagonia, for example, the moon's west would be quite to their left and the east to their right, as the south is behind them. Such is the reason of the apparent reversing of these two cardinal points, and we must bear it in mind in order to be able to follow President Barbicane's observations. With the help of Boer and Merdler's Mappa Selenographica, the travellers were able at once to recognize that portion of the disk enclosed within the field of their glasses. "'What are we looking at at this moment?' asked Michel. "'At the northern part of the Sea of Clouds,' answered Barbicane, we are too far off to recognize its nature. Are these plains composed of arid sand, as the first astronomer maintained? Or are they nothing but immense forests, according to Monsieur Warren de la Rue's opinion, who gives the moon an atmosphere, though a very low and a very dense one? That we shall know by and by. We must affirm nothing until we are in a position to do so. This sea of clouds is rather doubtfully marked out upon the maps. It is supposed that these vast plains are strewn with blocks of lava from the neighboring volcanoes on its right, Ptolemy, Perbach, Arzachel. But the projectile was advancing, and sensibly nearing it. Soon there appeared the heights which bound this sea at this northern limit. Before them rose a mountain radiant with beauty, the top of which seemed lost in an eruption of solar rays. "'That is,' asked Michel, "'Copernicus,' replied Barbicane. 
Let us see Copernicus. This mount, situated in nine degrees north latitude and twenty degrees east longitude, rose to a height of ten thousand six hundred feet above the surface of the moon. It is quite visible from the earth, and astronomers can study it with ease, particularly during the phase between the last quarter and the new moon, because then the shadows are thrown lengthwise from east to west, allowing them to measure the heights. This Copernicus forms the most important of the radiating system, situated in the southern hemisphere, according to Tycho Brahe. It rises isolated like a gigantic lighthouse on that portion of the Sea of Clouds, which is bounded by the Sea of Tempests, thus lighting by its splendid rays two oceans at a time. It was a sight without an equal, those long luminous trains, so dazzling in the full moon, and which, passing the boundary chain on the north, extends to the Sea of Rains. At one o'clock of the terrestrial morning, the projectile, like a balloon borne into space, overlooked the top of this superb mountain. Barbicane could recognize perfectly its chief features. Copernicus is comprised in the series of ringed mountains of the first order, in the division of great circles. Like Kepler and Aristarchus, which overlooked the ocean of tempests, sometimes it appeared like a brilliant point through the cloudy light and was taken for a volcano in activity. But it is only an extinct one, like all on that side of the moon. Its circumference showed a diameter of about twenty-two leagues. The glasses discovered traces of stratification produced by successive eruptions, and the neighborhood was strewn with volcanic remains which still choked some of the craters. "'There exist,' said Barbicane, Several kinds of circles on the surface of the moon, and it is easy to see that Copernicus belongs to the radiating class. If we were nearer, we should see the cones bristling on the inside, which in former times were so many fiery mouths. A curious arrangement, and one without an exception on the lunar disk, is that the interior surface of these circles is the reverse of the exterior and contrary to the form taken by terrestrial craters. It follows, then, that the general curve of the bottom of these circles gives a sphere of a smaller diameter than that of the moon. "'And why this peculiar disposition?' asked Nicol. "'We do not know,' replied Barbicane. "'What splendid radiation!' said Michel. "'One could hardly see a finer spectacle, I think.' "'What would you say, then?' replied Barbicane, if chance should bear us towards the southern hemisphere. "'Well, I should say that it was still more beautiful,' retorted Michel Ardin. At this moment the projectile hung perpendicularly over the circle. The circumference of Copernicus formed almost a perfect circle, and its steep escarpments were clearly defined. They could even distinguish a second ringed enclosure. Around spread a grayish plain, of a wild aspect, on which every relief was marked in yellow. At the bottom of the circle, as if enclosed in a jewel case, sparkled for one instant two or three eruptive cones, like enormous dazzling gems. Towards the north the escarpments were lowered by a depression which would probably have given access to the interior of the crater. In passing over the surrounding plains, Barbicane noted a great number of less important mountains, and among others a little ringed one called Guy Lussac, the breadth of which measured twelve miles. Towards the south the plain was very flat, without one elevation, without one projection. Towards the north, on the contrary, till where it was bounded by the Sea of Storms, it resembled a liquid surface agitated by a storm, of which the hills and hollows formed a succession of waves suddenly congealed. Over the whole of this, and in all directions, lay the luminous lines, all converging to the summit of Copernicus. The travellers discussed the origin of these strange rays, but they could not determine their nature any more than terrestrial observers. "'But why?' said Nicol. Should not these rays be simply spurs of mountains which reflect more vividly the light of the sun? 
No, replied Barbicane. If it was so, under certain conditions of the moon, these ridges would cast shadows, and they do not cast any. And indeed these rays only appeared when the orb of day was in opposition to the moon, and disappeared as soon as its rays became oblique. "'But how have they endeavoured to explain these lines of light?' asked Michel. "'For I cannot believe that savants would ever be stranded for want of an explanation.' "'Yes,' replied Barbicane. "'Herschel has put forward an opinion, but he did not venture to affirm it.' "'Never mind. What was the opinion?' "'He thought that these rays might be streams of cooled lava, which shone when the sun beat straight upon them.' It may be so, but nothing can be less certain. Besides, if we pass nearer to Tycho, we shall be in a better position to find out the cause of this radiation. Do you know, my friends, what that plane, seen from the height we are at, resembles? said Michel. No, replied Nicholl. Very well. With all those pieces of lava, lengthened like rockets, it resembles an immense game of spillikins, thrown pell-mell. There wants but the hook to pull them out one by one. "'Do be serious,' said Barbicane. "'Well, let us be serious,' replied Michel quietly. "'And instead of spellicans, let us put bones. This plain would then be nothing but an immense cemetery, on which would repose the mortal remains of thousands of extinct generations. Do you prefer that high-flown comparison?' "'One is as good as the other,' retorted Barbicane. "'My word, you are difficult to please,' answered Michel. "'My worthy friend,' continued the matter-of-fact Barbicane, "'it matters but little what it resembles when we do not know what it is.' "'Well answered,' exclaimed Michel. "'That will teach me to reason with savants.' But the projectile continued to advance with almost uniform speed around the lunar disk. The travellers, we may easily imagine, did not dream of taking a moment's rest. Every minute changed the landscape which fled from beneath their gaze. About half-past one o'clock in the morning they caught a glimpse of the tops of another mountain. Barbicane, consulting his map, recognized Eratosthenes. It was a ringed mountain nine thousand feet high and one of those circles so numerous on this satellite. With regard to this, Barbicane related Kepler's singular opinion on the formation of circles. According to that celebrated mathematician, these crater-like cavities have been dug by the hand of man. "'For what purpose?' asked Nicholl. "'For a very natural one,' replied Barbicane. "'The Selenites might have undertaken these immense works and dug these enormous holes for a refuge and shield from the solar rays which beat upon them during fifteen consecutive days. "'The Selenites are not fools,' said Michel. "'A singular idea,' replied Nicholl. "'But it is probable that Kepler did not know the true dimensions of these circles, for the digging of them would have been the work of giants quite impossible for the Selenites.' "'Why?' "'If weight on the moon's surface is six times less than on the earth,' said Michel. "'But if the Selenites are six times smaller?' retorted Nicholl. "'And if there are no Selenites,' added Barbicane. This put an end to the discussion. Soon Eratosthenes disappeared under the horizon without the projectile being sufficiently near to allow of close observation. This mountain separated the Apennines from the Carpathians. In the lunar orography they have discerned some chains of mountains which are chiefly distributed over the northern hemisphere. Some, however, occupy certain portions of the southern hemisphere also. About two o'clock in the morning Barbicane found that they were above the twentieth lunar parallel. The distance of the projectile from the moon was not more than six hundred miles. Barbicane, now perceiving that the projectile was steadily approaching the lunar disk, did not despair, if of reaching her, at least of discovering the secrets of her configuration. End of chapter
Chapter Thirteen of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter Thirteen Lunar Landscapes. At half past two in the morning, the projectile was over the thirteenth lunar parallel and at the effective distance of five hundred miles, reduced by the glasses to five. It still seemed impossible, however, that it could ever touch any part of the disk. Its mode of speed, comparatively so moderate, was inexplicable to President Barbicane. At that distance from the moon it must have been considerable to enable it to bear up against her attraction. Here was a phenomenon the cause of which escaped them again. Besides, time failed them to investigate the cause. All lunar relief was defiling under the eyes of the travellers, and they would not lose a single detail. Under the glasses the disk appeared at the distance of five miles. What would an aeronaut, born to this distance from the earth, distinguish on its surface? We cannot say, since the greatest ascension has not been more than twenty-five thousand feet. This, however, is an exact description of what Barbicane and his companions saw at this height. Large patches of different colors appeared on the disk. Selenographers are not agreed upon the nature of these colors. There are several, and rather vividly marked. Julius Schmidt pretends that, if the terrestrial oceans were dried up, a selenite observer could not distinguish on the globe a greater diversity of shades between the oceans and the continental plains than those on the moon present to a terrestrial observer. According to him, the color common to the vast plains known by the names of seas is a dark gray mixed with green and brown. Some of the large craters present the same appearance. Barbicane knew this opinion of the German selenographer, an opinion shared by Bohr and Merdler. Observation has proved that Wright was on their side, and not on that of some astronomers who admit the existence of only grey on the moon's surface. In some parts green was very distinct, such as springs, according to Julius Schmidt, from the seas of serenity and humours. Barbicane also noticed large craters, without any interior cones, which shed a bluish tint similar to the reflection of a sheet of steel freshly polished. These colors belonged really to the lunar disk, and did not result, as some astronomers say, either from the imperfection in the objective of the glasses, or from the interposition of the terrestrial atmosphere. Not a doubt existed in Barbicane's mind with regard to it, as he observed it through space, and so could not commit any optical error. He considered the establishment of this fact as an acquisition to science. Now were these shades of green, belonging to tropical vegetation, kept up by a low, dense atmosphere? He could not yet say. Farther on he noticed a reddish tint quite defined. The same shade had before been observed at the bottom of an isolated enclosure, known by the name of Lichtenberg's Circle, which is situated near the Hercynian Mountains, on the borders of the moon, but they could not tell the nature of it. They were not more fortunate with regard to another peculiarity of the disk, for they could not decide upon the cause of it. Michel Ardin was watching near the President when he noticed long white lines, vividly lighted up by the direct rays of the sun. It was a succession of luminous furrows, very different from the radiation of Copernicus not long before, they ran parallel with each other. Michel, with his usual readiness, hastened to explain, "'Look there! Cultivated fields!' "'Cultivated fields,' replied Nicol, shrugging his shoulders. "'Ploughed at all events,' retorted Michel Ardin. "'But what labourers those selenites must be!' and what gigantic oxen they must harness to their plough to cut such furrows. "'They are not furrows,' said Barbicane. "'They are rifts.' "'Rifts? Stuff!' replied Michel mildly. 
but what do you mean by rifts in the scientific world barbicane immediately enlightened his companion as to what he knew about lunar rifts he knew that they were a kind of furrow found on every part of the disk which was not mountainous that these furrows generally isolated measured from four hundred to five hundred leagues in length that their breadth varied from one thousand to fifteen hundred yards and that their borders were strictly parallel but he knew nothing more either of their formation or their nature barbicane through his glasses observed these rifts with great attention he noticed that their borders were formed of steep declivities they were long parallel ramparts and with some small amount of imagination he might have admitted the existence of long lines of fortifications raised by selenite engineers of these different rifts some were perfectly straight as if cut by a line others were slightly curved though still keeping their borders parallel some crossed each other some cut through craters here they wound through ordinary cavities such as posidonius or patavius there they wound through the seas such as the sea of serenity these natural accidents naturally excited the imaginations of these terrestrial astronomers the first observations had not discovered these rifts neither hervelius cassim lahir nor herschel seemed to have known them it was schroeter who in seventeen eighty nine first drew attention to them others followed who studied them as pastorf Grütheisen, boer and merdler at this time their number amounts to seventy but if they have been counted their nature has not yet been determined they are certainly not fortifications any more than they are the ancient beds of dried-up rivers for on one side the waters so slight on the moon's surface could never have worn such drains for themselves and on the other they often cross craters of great elevation we must however allow that michel ardin had an idea and that without knowing it he coincided in that respect with julius schmidt why said he should not these unaccountable appearances be simply phenomena of vegetation what do you mean asked barbicane quickly ah do not excite yourself my worthy president replied michel might it not be possible that the dark lines forming that bastion were rows of trees regularly placed you stick to your vegetation then said barbicane i like retorted michel ardin to explain what you savants cannot explain at least my hypothesis has the advantage of indicating why these rifts disappear or seem to disappear at certain seasons and for what reason for the reason that the trees become invisible when they lose their leaves and visible when they regain them your explanation is ingenious my dear companion replied barbicane but inadmissible why because so to speak there are no seasons on the moon's surface and that consequently the phenomena of vegetation of which you speak cannot occur indeed the slight obliquity of the lunar axis keeps the sun at an almost equal height in every latitude above the equatorial regions the radiant orb almost invariably occupies the zenith and does not pass the limits of the horizon in the polar regions thus according to each region there reigns a perpetual winter spring summer or autumn as in the planet jupiter whose axis is but little inclined upon its orbit what origin do they attribute to these rifts that is a question difficult to solve they are certainly anterior to the formation of craters and circles for several have introduced themselves by breaking through their circular ramparts thus it may be that contemporary with the latter geological epochs they are due to the expansion of natural forces but the projectile had now attained the fortieth degree of lunar latitude at a distance not exceeding four hundred miles through the glasses objects appeared to be only four miles distant at this point under their feet 
rose Mount Helicon, 1,520 feet high, and round about the left rose moderate elevations, enclosing a small portion of the Sea of Rains, under the name of the Gulf of Iris. The terrestrial atmosphere would have to be 170 times more transparent than it is to allow astronomers to make perfect observations on the moon's surface, but in the void in which the projectile floated, no fluid interposed itself between the eye of the observer and the object observed. And more, Barbicane found himself carried to a greater distance than the most powerful telescopes had ever done before, either that of Lord Ross or that of the Rocky Mountains. He was therefore under extremely favorable conditions for solving that great question of the habitability of the moon but the solution still escaped him. He could distinguish nothing but desert beds, immense plains, and towards the north, arid mountains. Not a work betrayed the hand of man, not a ruin marked his course, not a group of animals was to be seen indicating life, even in an inferior degree. In no part was there life, in no part was there an appearance of vegetation, of the three kingdoms which share the terrestrial globe between them, one alone was represented on the lunar, and that the mineral. "'Ah, indeed,' said Michel Ardin, a little out of countenance. "'Then you see no one?' "'No,' answered Nicholl. "'Up to this time not a man, not an animal, not a tree. After all, whether the atmosphere has taken refuge at the bottom of cavities, in the midst of the circles, or even on the opposite face of the moon, we cannot decide. Besides, added Barbicane, even to the most piercing eye a man cannot be distinguished farther than three and a half miles off, so that, if there are any selenites, they can see our projectile, but we cannot see them. Towards four in the morning, at the height of the fiftieth parallel, the distance was reduced to three hundred miles. To the left ran a line of mountains capriciously shaped, lying in the full light. To the right, on the contrary, lay a black hollow, resembling a vast well, unfathomable and gloomy, drilled into the lunar soil. This hole was the Black Lake. It was Pluto, a deep circle which can be conveniently studied from the earth, between the last quarter and the new moon, when the shadows fall from west to east. This black color is rarely met with on the surface of the satellite, as yet it has only been recognized in the depths of the circle of Endymion, to the east of the cold sea, in the northern hemisphere, and at the bottom of Grimaldi's circle, on the equator, towards the eastern border of the orb. Pluto is an annular mountain, situated in fifty-one degrees north latitude, and nine degrees east longitude. Its circuit is forty-seven miles long, and thirty-two broad. Barbicane regretted that they were not passing directly above this vast opening. There was an abyss to fathom, perhaps some mysterious phenomenon to surprise, but the projectile's course could not be altered. They must rigidly submit. They could not guide a balloon, still less a projectile, when once enclosed within its walls. Toward five in the morning the northern limits of the Sea of Rains was at length passed. The mountains of Condamine and Fontenelle remained, one on the right, the other on the left. That part of the disk beginning with sixty degrees was becoming quite mountainous. The glasses brought them to within two miles less than that separating the summit of Mont Blanc from the level of the sea. The whole region was bristling with spikes and circles. Towards the sixty degrees, Philolaus stood prominent at a height of 5,550 feet with its elliptical crater, and seen from this distance, the disk showed a very fantastical appearance. Landscapes were presented to the eye under very different conditions from those on the earth, and also very inferior to them. The moon having no atmosphere, the consequences arising from the absence of this gaseous envelope have already been shown. No twilight on her surface, 
night following day and day following night with the suddenness of a lamp which is extinguished or lighted amidst profound darkness no transition from cold to heat the temperature falling in an instant from boiling point to the cold of space another consequence of this want of air is that absolute darkness reigns where the sun's rays do not penetrate that which on earth is called diffusion of light that luminous matter which the air holds in suspension which creates the twilight and the daybreak which produces the umbre and the penumbre and all the magic of chariot oscuro does not exist on the moon hence the harshness of contrasts which only admit of two colours black and white if a selenite were to shade his eyes from the sun's rays the sky would seem absolutely black and the stars would shine to him as on the darkest night judge of the impression produced on barbicane and his two friends by this strange scene their eyes were confused they could no longer grasp the respective distances of the different planes a lunar landscape without the softening of the phenomena of cheria oscuro could not be rendered by an earthly landscape painter it would be spots of ink on a white page nothing more this aspect was not altered even when the projectile at the height of eighty degrees was only separated from the moon by a distance of fifty miles nor even when at five in the morning it passed at less than twenty-five miles from the mountain of Gioja, a distance reduced by the glasses to a quarter of a mile it seemed as if the moon might be touched by the hand it seemed impossible that before long the projectile would not strike her if only at the north pole the brilliant arch of which was so distinctly visible on the black sky michel ardan wanted to open one of the scuttles and throw himself on to the moon's surface a very useless attempt for if the projectile could not attain any point whatever of the satellite michel carried along by its motion could not attain it either at that moment at six o'clock the lunar pole appeared the disk only presented to the traveller's gaze one half brilliantly lit up whilst the other disappeared in the darkness suddenly the projectile passed the line of demarcation between intense light and absolute darkness and was plunged in profound night End of chapter. Chapter fourteen of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter fourteen. The night of three hundred and fifty four hours and a half. At the moment when this phenomenon took place so rapidly, the projectile was skirting the moon's north pole at less than twenty five miles distance. Some seconds had sufficed to plunge it into the absolute darkness of space. The transition was so sudden, without shade, without gradation of light, without attenuation of the luminous waves, that the orb seemed to have been extinguished by a powerful blow. "'Melted! Disappeared!' Michel Ardan exclaimed, aghast. Indeed, there was neither reflection nor shadow. Nothing more was to be seen of that disk, formerly so dazzling. The darkness was complete, and rendered even more so by the rays from the stars. It was that blackness in which the lunar nights are insteeped, which lasts three hundred and four hours and a half at each point of the disk, a long night resulting from the equality of the translatory and rotary movements of the moon. The projectile, emerged in the conical shadow of the satellite, experienced the action of the solar rays no more than any of its invisible points. In the interior, the obscurity was complete. They could not see each other. Hence the necessity of dispelling the darkness. 
However desirous Barbicane might be to husband the gas, the reserve of which was small, he was obliged to ask from it a fictitious light, an expensive brilliancy which the sun then refused. "'Devil take the radiant orb!' exclaimed Michel Ardin, "'which forces us to expend gas instead of giving us his rays gratuitously.' "'Do not let us accuse the sun,' said Nicholl. "'It is not his fault, but that of the moon, which has come and placed herself like a screen between us and it.' "'It is the sun,' continued Michel. "'It is the moon,' retorted Nicholl. An idle dispute, which Barbicane put an end to by saying, "'My friends, it is neither the fault of the sun nor of the moon. It is the fault of the projectile.' which, instead of rigidly following its course, has awkwardly missed it. To be more just, it is the fault of that unfortunate meteor which has so deplorably altered our first direction. Well, replied Michel Ardin, as the matter is settled, let us have breakfast. After a whole night of watching, it is fair to build ourselves up a little. This proposal, meeting with no contradiction, Michel prepared the repast in a few minutes. But they ate for eating's sake. They drank without toasts, without hurrahs. The bold travellers being borne away into gloomy space, without their accustomed cortege of rays, felt a vague uneasiness at their hearts. The strange shadow so dear to Victor Hugo's pen bound them on all sides but they talked over the interminable night of three hundred and fifty-four hours and a half, nearly fifteen days, which the law of physics has imposed on the inhabitants of the moon. Barbicane gave his friends some explanation of the causes and the consequences of this curious phenomenon. "'Curious, indeed,' said they, "'for if each hemisphere of the moon is deprived of solar light for fifteen days,' That above which we now float does not even enjoy, during its long night, any view of the earth so beautifully lit up. In a word, she is no moon, applying this designation to our globe, but on one side of her disk. Now, if this were the case with the earth, if, for example, Europe never saw the moon, and she was only visible at the antipodes, Imagine to yourself the astonishment of a European on arriving in Australia. "'They would make the voyage for nothing but to see the moon,' replied Michel. "'Very well,' continued Barbicane. "'That astonishment is reserved for the Selenites, who inhabit the face of the moon opposite to the earth, a face which is ever invisible to our countrymen of the terrestrial globe.' "'And which we should have seen,' added Nicholl, if we had arrived here when the moon was new, that is to say, fifteen days later. I will add, to make amends, continued Barbicane, that the inhabitants of the visible face are singularly favoured by nature, to the detriment of their brethren on the invisible face. The latter, as you see, have dark nights of three hundred fifty-four hours, without one single ray to break the darkness. The other, on the contrary, when the sun which has given its light for fifteen days sinks below the horizon, see a splendid orb rise on the opposite horizon. It is the earth, which is thirteen times greater than that diminutive moon that we know, the earth which develops itself at a diameter of two degrees, and which sheds a light thirteen times greater than that qualified by atmospheric strata the earth which only disappears at the moment when the sun reappears in its turn. "'Nicely worded,' said Michel. Uh, "'Slightly academical, perhaps.' "'It follows, then,' continued Barbicane, without knitting his brows, "'that the visible face of the disk must be very agreeable to inhabit, since it always looks on either the sun when the moon is full, or on the earth when the moon is new.' But, said Nicholl, that advantage must be well compensated by the insupportable heat which the light brings with it. The inconvenience, in that respect, is the same for the two faces, for the earth's light is evidently deprived of heat. 
but the invisible face is still more searched by the heat than the visible face. I say that for you, Nickel, because Michelle will probably not understand. Thank you, said Michelle. Indeed, continued Barbicane, when the invisible face receives at the same time light and heat from the sun, it is because the moon is new, that is to say, she is situated between the sun and the earth. It follows, then, considering the position which she occupies in opposition, when full, that she is nearer to the sun by twice her distance from the earth, and that distance may be estimated at the two hundredth part of that which separates the sun from the earth, or in round numbers four hundred thousand miles. So that invisible face is so much nearer to the sun when she receives its rays. Quite right, replied Nicholl. On the contrary, continued Barbicane. One moment, said Michel, interrupting his grave companion. What do you want? I ask to be allowed to continue the explanation. And why? To prove that I understand. <laughs> Get along with you, said Barbicane, smiling. On the contrary, said Michel, imitating the tone and gestures of the President, on the contrary, when the visible face of the moon is lit by the sun, it is because the moon is full, that is to say, opposite the sun with regard to the earth. The distance separating it from the radiant orb is then increased in round numbers to four hundred thousand miles, and the heat which she receives must be a little less. Very well said, exclaimed Barbicane. Do you know, Michel, that for an amateur you are intelligent? Yes, replied Michel coolly. We are also on the Boulevard des Italiens. Barbicane gravely clasped the hand of his amiable companion and continued to enumerate the advantages reserved for the inhabitants of the visible face. Amongst others, he mentioned eclipses of the sun, which only take place on this side of the lunar disk, since, in order that they may take place, it is necessary for the moon to be in opposition. These eclipses, caused by the interposition of the earth between the moon and the sun, can last two hours, during which time, by reason of the rays refracted by its atmosphere, the terrestrial globe can appear as nothing but a black point upon the sun. So, said Dickel, there is a hemisphere, that invisible hemisphere, which is very ill supplied, very ill treated by nature. Never mind, replied Michel. If we ever become selenites, we will inhabit the visible face. I like the light. Unless by any chance, answered Nickel, the atmosphere should be condensed on the other side, as certain astronomers pretend. That would be a consideration, said Michel. Breakfast over, the observers returned to their post. They tried to see through the darkened scuttles by extinguishing all light in the projectile, but not a luminous spark made its way through the darkness. One inexplicable fact preoccupied Barbicane. Why? having passed within such a short distance of the moon, about twenty-five miles only, why the projectile had not fallen. If the speed had been enormous, he could have understood that the fall would not have taken place. But with a relatively moderate speed, that resistance to the moon's attraction could not be explained. Was the projectile under some foreign influence? Did some kind of body retain it in the ether? It was quite evident that it could never reach any point of the moon. Whither was it going? Was it going further from, or nearing, the disk? Was it being borne in that profound darkness through the infinity of space? How could they learn, how calculate, in the midst of this night? All these questions made Barbicane uneasy, but he could not solve them. Certainly the invisible orb was there— perhaps only some few miles off, but neither he nor his companions could see it. If there was any noise on its surface, they could not hear it. 
air, that medium of sound, was wanting to transmit the groanings of that moon which the Arabic legends call a man already half granite and still breathing. One must allow that that was enough to aggravate the most patient observers. It was just that unknown hemisphere which was stealing from their sight. That face which fifteen days sooner, or fifteen days later, had been, or would be, splendidly illuminated by the solar rays, was then being lost in utter darkness. In fifteen days where would the projectile be? Who could say? Where would the chances of conflicting attractions have drawn it to? The disappointment of the travellers, in the midst of this utter darkness, may be imagined. All observation of the lunar disk was impossible. The constellations alone claimed all their attention, and we must allow that the astronomers Fay, Charconach, and Seshi never found themselves in circumstances so favourable for their observation. Indeed, nothing could equal the splendour of this starry world, bathed in limpid ether. Its diamonds set in the heavenly vault sparkled magnificently. The eye took in the firmament from the southern cross to the north star, those two constellations which, in twelve thousand years, by reason of the succession of equinoxes, will resign their part of polar stars, the one to Canopus in the southern hemisphere, the other to Vega and the northern. Imagination loses itself in this sublime infinity, amidst which the projectile was gravitating, like a new star created by the hand of man. From a natural cause these constellations shone with a soft luster. They did not twinkle, for there was no atmosphere which, by the intervention of its layers unequally dense and of different degrees of humidity, produces this scintillation. These stars were soft eyes, looking out into the dark night, amidst the silence of absolute space. Long did the travellers stand mute, watching the constellated firmament, upon which the moon, like a vast screen, made an enormous black hole. But at length a painful sensation drew them from their watchings, this was an intense cold, which soon covered the inside of the glass of the scuttles with a thick coating of ice. The sun was no longer warming the projectile with its direct rays, and thus it was losing the heat stored up in its walls by degrees. This heat was rapidly evaporating into space by radiation, and a considerably lower temperature was the result. The humidity of the interior was changed into ice upon contact with the glass, preventing all observation. Nicol consulted the thermometer and saw that it had fallen to seventeen degrees centigrade below zero, or one degree Fahrenheit, so that in spite of the many reasons for economizing, Barbicane, after having begged light from the gas, was also obliged to beg for heat. The projectile's low temperature was no longer endurable. Its tenants would have been frozen to death. "'Well,' observed Michel, "'we cannot reasonably complain of the monotony of our journey. What variety we have had, at least in uh, temperature! Now we are blinded with light and saturated with heat, like the Indians of the Pampas, now plunged into profound darkness.' amidst the cold like the Esquimaux of the North Pole. No, indeed, we have no right to complain. Nature does wonders in our honour. But, asked Nicol, what is the temperature outside? Exactly that of the planetary space, replied Barbicane. Then, continued Michel Ardin, would not this be the time to make the experiment which we dared not attempt? when we were drowned in the sun's rays? "'It is now or never,' replied Barbicane, "'for we are in a good position to verify the temperature of space, and see if Fourier or Puyer's calculations are exact.' "'In any case it is cold,' said Michel. "'See, the steam of the interior is condensing on the glasses of the scuttles. If the fall continues, the vapour of our breath will fall in snow around us.' 
Let us prepare a thermometer, said Barbicane. We may imagine that an ordinary thermometer would afford no result under the circumstances in which this instrument was to be exposed. The mercury would have been frozen in its ball, as below forty-two degrees below zero Fahrenheit it is no longer liquid. But Barbicane had furnished himself with a spirit thermometer on Warferden's system, which gives the minima of excessively low temperatures. Before beginning the experiment, this instrument was compared with an ordinary one, and then Barbicane prepared to use it. "'How shall we set about it?' asked Nicholl. "'Nothing is easier,' replied Michel Ardin, who was never at a loss. "'We open the scuttle rapidly, throw out the instrument. It follows the projectile with exemplary docility, and a quarter of an hour after, draw it in.' "'With the hand?' asked Barbicane. "'With the hand,' replied Michel. "'Well, then, my friend, do not expose yourself,' answered Barbicane. "'For the hand that you draw in again will be nothing but a stump frozen and deformed by the frightful cold.' "'Really?' "'You will feel as if you had had a terrible burn, like that of iron at a white heat. For whether the heat leaves our bodies briskly or enters briskly, it is exactly the same thing. Besides, I am not at all certain that the objects we have thrown out are still following us. "'Why not?' asked Nicholl. "'Because, if we are passing through an atmosphere of the slightest density, these objects will be retarded. Again, the darkness prevents our seeing if they still float around us. But in order not to expose ourselves to the loss of our thermometer, we will fasten it, and we can then more easily pull it back again. Barbicane's advice was followed. Through the scuttle rapidly opened, Nicholl threw out the instrument which was held by a short cord, so that it might more easily be drawn up. The scuttle had not been opened more than a second, but that second had sufficed to let in a most intense cold. "'The devil!' exclaimed Michel Ardin. "'Is cold enough to freeze a white bear!' Barbicane waited until half an hour had elapsed, which was more than time enough to allow the instrument to fall to the level of the surrounding temperature. Then it was rapidly pulled in. Barbicane calculated the quantity of spirits of wine overflowed into the little phial soldered to the lower part of the instrument, and said, "'A hundred and forty degrees centigrade below zero, or minus two hundred and eighteen degrees Fahrenheit.' Monsieur Poulet was right and Fourier wrong. That was the undoubted temperature of the starry space. Such is, perhaps, that of the lunar continents, when the orb of night has lost by radiation all the heat which fifteen days of sun have poured into her. End of chapter Chapter 15 of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 15 Hyperbola or Parabola. We may perhaps be astonished to find Barbicane and his companions so little occupied with the future reserved for them in their metal prison which was bearing them through the infinity of space. Instead of asking where they were going, they passed their time making experiments, as if they had been quietly installed in their own study. We might answer that men so strong-minded were above such anxieties— that they did not trouble themselves about such trifles, and that they had something else to do than to occupy their minds with the future. The truth was that they were not masters of their projectile. They could neither check its course nor alter its direction. A sailor can change the head of his ship as he pleases. An aeronaut can give a vertical motion to his balloon. They, on the contrary, had no power over their vehicle. 
every manoeuvre was forbidden. Hence the inclination to let things alone, or as the sailors say, let her run. Where did they find themselves at this moment, at eight o'clock in the morning, of the day called upon the earth the sixth of December? Very certainly in the neighbourhood of the moon, and even near enough for her to look to them like an enormous black screen upon the firmament. As to the distance which separated them, it was impossible to estimate it. The projectile, held by some unaccountable force, had been within four miles of grazing the satellite's north pole. But since entering the cone of shadow these last two hours, had the distance increased or diminished? Every point of mark was wanting by which to estimate both the direction and the speed of the projectile. Perhaps it was rapidly leaving the disk, so that it would soon quit the pure shadow. Perhaps again, on the other hand, it might be nearing it so much that in a short time it might strike some high point on the invisible hemisphere, which would doubtlessly have ended the journey much to the detriment of the travellers. A discussion arose on this subject, and Michel Ardin, always ready with an explanation, gave it as his opinion that the projectile, held by the lunar attraction, would end by falling on the surface of the terrestrial globe, like an aerolite. First of all, my friend, answered Barbicane, every aerolite does not fall to the earth. It is only a small proportion which do so, and if we had passed into an aerolite, it does not necessarily follow that we should ever reach the surface of the moon. But how if we get near enough? replied Michel. Pure mistake, replied Barbicane. Have you not seen shooting stars rush through the sky by thousands at certain seasons? Yes. Well, these stars, or rather corpuscles, only shine when they are heated by gliding over the atmospheric layers. Now, if they enter the atmosphere, they pass at least within forty miles of the earth, but they seldom fall upon it. The same with our projectile. It may approach very near to the moon, and yet not fall upon it. "'But then,' asked Michel, "'I shall be curious to know how our erring vehicle will act in space?' "'I see but two hypotheses,' replied Barbicane, after some moments' reflection. "'What are they?' "'The projectile has the choice between two mathematical curves, and it will follow one or the other, according to the speed with which it is animated, and which at this moment I cannot estimate. Yes, said Nicholl, it will follow either a parabola or a hyperbola. Just so, replied Barbicane, with certain speed it will assume the parabola, and with a greater the hyperbola. I like those grand words, exclaimed Michel Ardin, one knows directly what they mean. And, pray, what is your parabola, if you please? My friend, answered the captain, the parabola is a curve of the second order, the result of the section of a cone intersected by a plane parallel to one of its sides. Ah, ah, said Michel in a satisfied tone. It is very nearly, continued Nicholl, the course described by a bomb launched from a mortar. Perfect! And the hyperbola? The hyperbola, Michel, is a curve of the second order, produced by the intersection of a conic surface and a plane parallel to its axis, and constitutes two branches, separated one from the other, both tending indefinitely in the two directions. "'Is it possible?' exclaimed Michel Ardin, in a serious tone, as if they had told him of some serious event. "'What I particularly like in your definition of the hyperbola—I was going to say hyperblague—is that it is still more obscure than the word you pretend to define.' Nicholl and Barbicane cared little for Michel Ardin's fun. They were deep in a scientific discussion. What curve would the projectile follow, was their hobby. One maintained the hyperbola, 
the other the parabola. They gave each other reasons bristling with X. Their arguments were couched in language which made Michel jump. The discussion was hot, and neither would give up his chosen curve to his adversary. This scientific dispute lasted so long that it made Michel very impatient. "'Now, gentlemen cosines, will you cease to throw parabolas and hyperbolas at each other's heads? I want to understand the only interesting question in the whole affair. We shall follow one or other of these curves? Good. But where will they lead to?' "'Nowhere,' replied Nicholl. "'How nowhere?' "'Evidently,' said Barbicane, "'they are open curves, which may be prolonged indefinitely.' "'Ah, savants!' cried Michel. "'And what are either the one or the other to us from the moment we know that they equally lead us into infinite space?' Barbicane and Nicholl could not forbear smiling. They had just been creating art for art's sake. Never had so idle a question been raised at such an inopportune moment. The sinister truth remained that, whether hyperbolically or parabolically borne away, the projectile would never again meet either the earth or the moon. What would become of these bold travellers in the immediate future? If they did not die of hunger, if they did not die of thirst, in some days, when the gas failed, they would die from want of air, unless the cold had killed them first. Still important as it was to economize the gas, the excessive lowness of the surrounding temperature obliged them to consume a certain quantity. Strictly speaking, they could do without its light, but not without its heat. Fortunately, the caloric generated by Ricet's and Renault's apparatus raised the temperature of the interior of the projectile a little, and without much expenditure they were able to keep it bearable. But observations had now become very difficult. The dampness of the projectile was condensed on the windows and congealed immediately. This cloudiness had to be dispersed continually. In any case, they might hope to be able to discover some phenomena of the highest interest. But up to this time the disk remained dumb and dark. It did not answer the multiplicity of questions put by these ardent minds, a matter which drew this reflection from Michel, apparently a just one. "'If ever we begin this journey over again, we shall do well to choose the time when the moon is new.' "'Certainly.' said Nicholl, that circumstance will be more favourable. I allow that the moon, immersed in the sun's rays, will not be visible during the transit, but instead we should see the earth, which would be full. And what is more, if we were drawn round the moon, as at this moment, we should at least have the advantage of seeing the invisible part of her disk magnificently lit. Well said, Nicholl, replied Michel Ardin. What do you think, Barbicane? I think this, answered the grave president. If ever we begin this journey again, we shall start at the same time and under the same conditions. Suppose we had attained our end. Would it not have been better to have found continents in broad daylight than a country plunged in utter darkness? Would not our first installation have been made under better circumstances? yes evidently as to the invisible side we could have visited it in our exploring expeditions on the lunar globe so that the time of the full moon was well chosen but we ought to have arrived at the end and in order to have so arrived we ought to have suffered no deviation on the road i have nothing to say to that answered michel ardin here is, however, a good opportunity lost of observing the other side of the moon. But the projectile was now describing in the shadow that incalculable course which no sight mark would allow them to ascertain. Had its direction been altered, either by the influence of the lunar attraction or by the action of some unknown star, Barbicane could not say but a change had taken place in the relative position of the vehicle, and Barbicane verified it about four in the morning. The change consisted in this, 
that the base of the projectile had turned towards the moon's surface, and was so held by a perpendicular passing through its axis. The attraction, that is to say, the weight, had brought about this alteration. The heaviest part of the projectile inclined towards the invisible disk as if it would fall upon it. Was it falling? Were the travellers attaining that much desired end? No. And the observation of a sign point, quite inexplicable in itself, showed Barbicane that his projectile was not nearing the moon, and that it had shifted by following an almost concentric curve. This point of mark was a luminous brightness, which Nicholl sighted suddenly, on the limit of the horizon formed by the black disk. This point could not be confounded with a star. It was a reddish incandescence which increased by degrees, a decided proof that the projectile was shifting towards it and not falling normally on the surface of the moon. "'A volcano! It is a volcano in action!' cried Nicholl. "'A disemboweling of the interior fires of the moon! That world is not quite extinguished!' "'Yes, an eruption,' replied Barbicane, who was carefully studying the phenomenon through his night-glass. "'What should it be, if not a volcano?' "'But then,' said Michel Ardin, "'in order to maintain that combustion, there must be air. So an atmosphere does surround that part of the moon.' "'Perhaps so,' replied Barbicane, "'but not necessarily.' the volcano by the decomposition of certain substances can provide its own oxygen and thus throw flames into space it seems to me that the deflagration by the intense brilliancy of the substances in combustion is produced in pure oxygen we must not be in a hurry to proclaim the existence of a lunar atmosphere the fiery mountain must have been situated about the forty-five degrees south latitude on the invisible part of the disk. But to Barbicane's great displeasure, the curve which the projectile was describing was taking it far from the point indicated by the eruption. Thus he could not determine its nature exactly. Half an hour after being sighted, this luminous point had disappeared behind the dark horizon, but the verification of this phenomenon was of considerable consequence in their selenographic studies. It proved that all heat had not yet disappeared from the bowels of this globe, and where heat exists, who can affirm that the vegetable kingdom, nay, even the animal kingdom itself, has not up to this time resisted all destructive influences? The existence of this volcano in eruption unmistakably seen by these earthly savants, would doubtless give rise to many theories favourable to the grave question of the habitability of the moon. Barbicane allowed himself to be carried away by these reflections. He forgot himself in a deep reverie, in which the mysterious destiny of the lunar world was uppermost. He was seeking to combine together the facts observed up to that time when a new incident recalled him briskly to reality. This incident was more than a cosmical phenomenon, it was a threatened danger, the consequences of which might be disastrous in the extreme. Suddenly, in the midst of the ether, in the profound darkness, an enormous mass appeared. It was like a moon, but an incandescent moon whose brilliancy was all the more intolerable as it cut sharply on the frightful darkness of space. This mass, of a circular form, threw a light which filled the projectile. The forms of Barbicane, Nicol, and Michel Ardin, bathed in its white sheets, assumed that livid spectral appearance which physicians produce with the fictitious light of alcohol impregnated with salt. "'By Jove!' cried Michel Ardin. "'We are hideous!' What is that ill-conditioned moon? A meteor, replied Barbicane. A meteor burning in space? Yes. This shooting globe, suddenly appearing in shadow, at a distance of at most two hundred miles, ought, according to Barbicane, to have a diameter of two thousand yards. 
it advanced at a speed of about one mile and a half per second. It cut the projectile's path, and must reach it in some minutes. As it approached, it grew to enormous proportions. Imagine, if possible, the situation of the travellers. It is impossible to describe it. In spite of their courage, their sang-froid, their carelessness of danger, they were mute, motionless with stiffened limbs, a prey to frightful terror. Their projectile, the course of which they could not alter, was rushing straight on this ignited mass, more intense than the open mouth of an oven. It seemed as though they were being precipitated towards an abyss of fire. Barbicane had seized the hands of his two companions, and all three looked through their half-open eyelids upon that asteroid heated to a white heat. If thought was not destroyed within them, if their brains still worked amidst all this awe, they must have given themselves up for lost. Two minutes after the sudden appearance of the meteor, to them two centuries of anguish, the projectile seemed almost about to strike it when the globe of fire bursts like a bomb, but without making any noise in that void where sound, which is but the agitation of the layers of air, could not be generated. Nicol uttered a cry, and he and his companions rushed to the scuttle. What a sight! What pen can describe it? What palette is rich enough in colours to reproduce so magnificent a spectacle? It was like the opening of a crater like the scattering of an immense conflagration. Thousands of luminous fragments lit up and irradiated space with their fires. Every size, every color, was there intermingled. There were rays of yellow and pale yellow, red, green, gray, a crown of fireworks of all colors. Of the enormous and much-dreaded globe there remained nothing but these fragments carried in all directions, now becoming asteroids in their turn, some flaming like a sword, some surrounded by a whitish cloud, and others leaving behind them trains of brilliant cosmical dust. These incandescent blocks crossed and struck each other, scattering still smaller fragments, some of which struck the projectile. Its left scuttle was even cracked by a violent shock. It seemed to be floating amidst a hail of howitzer shells, the smallest of which might destroy it instantly. The light which saturated the ether was so wonderfully intense that Michel, drawing Barbicane and Nicol to his window, exclaimed, "'The invisible moon! Visible at last!' And through a luminous emanation, which lasted some seconds, the whole three caught a glimpse of that mysterious disk which the eye of man now saw for the first time." What could they distinguish at a distance which they could not estimate? Some lengthened bands along the disk, real clouds formed in the midst of a very confined atmosphere, from which emerged not only all the mountains, but also projections of less importance. Its circles, its yawning craters, as capriciously placed as on the visible surface. Then immense spaces, no longer arid plains, but real seas, oceans, widely distributed, reflecting on their liquid surface all the dazzling magic of the fires of space, and lastly, on the surface of the continents, large dark masses, looking like immense forests under the rapid illumination of a brilliance. Was it an illusion, a mistake, an optical illusion? Could they give a scientific assent to an observation so superficially obtained? Dared they pronounce upon the question of its habitability after so slight a glimpse of the invisible disk? But the lightnings in space subsided by degrees, its accidental brilliancy died away. The asteroids dispersed in different directions, and were extinguished in the distance. The ether returned to its accustomed darkness. The stars, eclipsed for a moment, again twinkled in the firmament, and the disk so hastily discerned was again buried in impenetrable night. End of chapter
Chapter Sixteen of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter Sixteen The Southern Hemisphere. The projectile had just escaped a terrible danger, and a very unforeseen one. Who would have thought of such a rencontre with meteors? These erring bodies might create serious perils for the travellers. They were to them so many sandbanks upon that sea of ether which, less fortunate than sailors, they could not escape. But did these adventurers complain of space? No not since nature had given them the splendid sight of a cosmical meteor bursting from expansion, since this inimitable firework, which no Ruggieri could imitate, had lit up for some seconds the invisible glory of the moon. In that flash, continents, seas, and forests had become visible to them. Did an atmosphere, then, bring to this unknown face its life-giving atoms? questions still insoluble, and forever closed against human curiosity. It was then half-past three in the afternoon. The projectile was following its curvilinear direction round the moon. Had its course been again altered by the meteor? It was to be feared so. But the projectile must describe a curve unalterably determined by the laws of mechanical reasoning. Barbicane was inclined to believe that this curve would be rather a parabola than a hyperbola. But admitting the parabola, the projectile must quickly have passed through the cone of shadow projected into space opposite the sun. This cone, indeed, is very narrow, the angular diameter of the moon being so little when compared with the diameter of the orb of day, and up to this time the projectile had been floating in the steep shadow. Whatever had been its speed, and it could not have been insignificant, its period of occultation continued. That was evident, but perhaps that would not have been the case in a supposed rigidly parabolical trajectory, a new problem which tormented Barbicane's brain, imprisoned as he was in a circle of unknowns which he could not unravel. Neither of the travellers thought of taking an instant's repose. Each one watched for an unexpected fact, which might throw some new light on their uranographic studies. About five o'clock, Michel Ardin distributed, under the name of dinner, some pieces of bread and cold meat, which were quickly swallowed without either of them abandoning their scuttle, the glass of which was incessantly encrusted by the condensation of vapour. About forty-five minutes past five in the evening, Nicol, armed with his glass, sighted towards the southern border of the moon, and in the direction followed by the projectile, some bright points cut upon the dark shield of the sky. They looked like a succession of sharp points, lengthened into a tremulous line. They were very bright. Such appeared the terminal line of the moon when in one of her octants. They could not be mistaken. It was no longer a simple meteor. This luminous ridge had neither color nor motion, nor was it a volcano in eruption, and Barbicane did not hesitate to pronounce upon it. "'The sun!' he exclaimed. "'What, the sun?' answered Nicol and Michel Ardin. "'Yes, my friends, it is the radiant orb itself lighting up the summit of the mountains situated on the southern borders of the moon. We are evidently nearing the South Pole.' "'After having passed the North Pole,' replied Michel, "'we have made the circuit of our satellite, then?' "'Yes, my good Michel.' "'Then no more hyperbolas, no more parabolas, no more open curves to fear?' "'No, but a closed curve.' "'Which is called?' "'An ellipse. Instead of losing itself in interplanetary space, it is probable that the projectile will describe an elliptical orbit around the moon. Indeed! And that it will become her satellite. Moon of the moon! cried Michel Ardan. 
"'Only I would have you observe, my worthy friend,' replied Barbicane, "'that we are none the less lost for that.' "'Yes, in another manner, and much more pleasantly,' answered the careless Frenchman with his most amiable smile. End of chapter Chapter Seventeen of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter Seventeen Tycho. At six in the evening the projectile passed the South Pole at less than forty miles off, a distance equal to that already reached at the North Pole. The elliptical curve was being rigidly carried out. At this moment the travellers once more entered the blessed rays of the sun. They saw once more those stars which moved slowly from east to west. The radiant orb was saluted by a triple hurrah. With its light it also sent heat which soon pierced the metal walls. The glass resumed its accustomed appearance. The layers of ice melted as if by enchantment, and immediately, for economy's sake, the gas was put out, the air apparatus alone consuming its usual quantity. "'Ah!' said Nicholl. "'These rays of heat are good. With what impatience must the Selenites wait the reappearance of the orb of day?' "'Yes,' replied Michel Ardin imbibing as it were the brilliant ether light and heat all life is contained in them at this moment the bottom of the projectile deviated somewhat from the lunar surface in order to follow the slightly lengthened elliptical orbit from this point had the earth been at the full barbicane and his companions could have seen it but immersed in the sun's irradiation she was quite invisible another spectacle attracted their attention that of the southern part of the moon brought by the glasses to within 450 yards they did not again leave the scuttles and noted every detail of this fantastical continent mounts durfel and leibniz formed two separate groups very near the south pole the first group extended from the pole to the 84th parallel on the eastern part of the orb the second occupied the eastern border extending from the sixty-five degrees of latitude to the pole. On their capriciously formed ridge appeared dazzling sheets, as mentioned by Père Sechi. With more certainty than the illustrious Roman astronomer, Barbicane was enabled to recognize their nature. "'They are snow!' he exclaimed. "'Snow?' repeated Nicholl. "'Yes, Nicholl, snow, the surface of which is deeply frozen.' See how they reflect the luminous rays. Cooled lava would never give out such intense reflection. There must then be water. There must be air on the moon. As little as you please, but the fact can no longer be contested. No, it could not be, and if ever Barbicane should see the earth again, his notes will bear witness to this great fact in his selenographic observations. These mountains of Durfel and Leibniz rose in the midst of plains of a medium extent, which were bounded by an indefinite succession of circles and annular ramparts. These two chains are the only ones met with in this region of circles. Comparatively but slightly marked, they throw up here and there some sharp points, the highest summit of which attains an altitude of 24,600 feet but the projectile was high above all this landscape, and the projections disappeared in the intense brilliancy of the disk. And to the eyes of the travellers there reappeared that original aspect of the lunar landscapes, raw in tone, without gradation of colours, and without degrees of shadow, roughly black and white, from the want of diffusion of light. But the sight of this desolate world did not fail to captivate them by its very strangeness. They were moving over this region as if they had been born on the breath of some storm, watching heights defile under their feet, piercing the cavities with their eyes, going down into the rifts, 
climbing the ramparts, sounding these mysterious holes, and levelling all cracks. But no trace of vegetation, no appearance of cities, nothing but stratification, beds of lava, overflowings polished like immense mirrors, reflecting the sun's rays with overpowering brilliancy. Nothing belonging to a living world, everything to a dead world, where avalanches, rolling from the summits of the mountains, would disperse noiselessly at the bottom of the abyss, retaining the motion but wanting the sound. In any case it was the image of death, without its being possible even to say that life had ever existed there. Michel Ardin, however, thought he recognized a heap of ruins, to which he drew Barbicane's attention. It was about the eightieth parallel, in thirty degrees longitude. This heap of stones, rather regularly placed, represented a vast fortress overlooking a long rift, which in former days had served as a bed to the rivers of prehistorical times. Not far from that, rose to a height of 17,400 feet the annular mountains of Short, equal to the Asiatic Caucasus. Michel Ardin, with his accustomed ardor, maintained the evidences of his fortress. Beneath it he discerned the dismantled ramparts of a town, here the still intact arch of a portico, there two or three columns lying under their base, farther on a succession of arches which must have supported the conduit of an aqueduct, in another part the sunken pillars of a gigantic bridge run into the thickest parts of the rift. He distinguished all this, but with so much imagination in his glance, and through glasses so fantastical, that we must mistrust his observation. But who could affirm, who would dare to say, that the amiable fellow did not really see that which his two companions would not see? Moments were too precious to be sacrificed in idle discussion. The Selenite city, whether imaginary or not, had already disappeared afar off. The distance of the projectile from the lunar disk was on the increase, and the details of the soil were being lost in a confused jumble. The reliefs, the circles, the craters, and plains alone remained, and still showed their boundary lines distinctly. At this moment, to the left, lay extended one of the finest circles of lunar orography, one of the curiosities of this continent. It was Newton, which Barbicane recognized without trouble, by referring to the Mappa Selenographica. Newton is situated in exactly 77 degrees south latitude and 16 degrees east longitude. It forms an annular crater, the ramparts of which, rising to a height of 21,300 feet, seem to be impassable. Barbicane made his companions observe that the height of this mountain above the surrounding plain was far from equaling the depth of its crater. This enormous hole was beyond all measurement, and formed a gloomy abyss, the bottom of which the sun's rays could never reach. There, according to Humboldt, reigns utter darkness, which the light of the sun and the earth cannot break. Mythologists could well have made it the mouth of hell." Newton, said Barbicane, is the most perfect type of these annular mountains, of which the earth possesses no sample. They prove that the moon's formation, by means of cooling, is due to violent causes, for whilst under the pressure of internal fires the reliefs rise to considerable height, the depths withdraw far below the lunar level. I do not dispute the fact, replied Michel Ardin. Some minutes after passing Newton, the projectile directly overlooked the annular mountain of Moray. It skirted at some distance the summits of Blancanus, and at about half-past seven in the evening reached the circle of Clavius. This circle, one of the most remarkable of the disk, is situated in 58 degrees south latitude and 15 degrees east longitude. Its height is estimated at 22,950 feet. The travelers, at a distance of 24 miles, reduced to four by their glasses, could admire this vast crater in its entirety. Terrestrial volcanoes, said Barbicane, 
are but molehills compared with those of the moon. Measuring the old craters formed by the first eruptions of Vesuvius and Etna, we find them little more than three miles in breadth. In France, the circle of Cantal measures six miles across. At Ceylon, the circle of the island is forty miles, which is considered the largest on the globe. What are these diameters against that of Clavius, which we overlook at this moment? "'What is its breadth?' asked Nicol. "'It is one hundred fifty miles,' replied Barbicane. "'This circle is certainly the most important on the moon, but many others measure one hundred fifty, one hundred, or seventy-five miles.' "'Ah, my friends!' exclaimed Michel. Can you picture to yourselves what this now peaceful orb of night must have been when its craters, filled with thunderings, vomited at the same time smoke and tongues of flame? What a wonderful spectacle then, and now what decay! This moon is nothing more than a thin carcass of fireworks, whose squibs, rockets, serpents, and suns, after a superb brilliancy, have left but sadly broken cases." Who can say the cause, the reason, the motive force of these cataclysms? Barbicane was not listening to Michel Ardin. He was contemplating those ramparts of Clavius, formed by large mountains spread over several miles. At the bottom of the immense cavity burrowed hundreds of small extinguished craters, riddling the soil like a colander, and overlooked by a peak fifteen thousand feet high. Around the plain appeared desolate. Nothing so arid as these reliefs, nothing so sad as these ruins of mountains, and, if we may so express ourselves, these fragments of peaks and mountains which strewed the soil. The satellite seemed to have burst at this spot. The projectile was still advancing, and this movement did not subside. Circles, craters, and uprooted mountains succeeded each other incessantly. No more plains, no more seas, a never-ending Switzerland and Norway. And lastly, in the center of this region of crevasses, the most splendid mountain on the lunar disk, the dazzling Tycho, in which posterity will ever preserve the name of the illustrious Danish astronomer. In observing the full moon in a cloudless sky, no one has failed to remark this brilliant point of the southern hemisphere. Michel Ardan used every metaphor that his imagination could supply to designate it by. To him this Tycho was a focus of light, a center of irradiation, a crater vomiting rays. It was the tire of a brilliant wheel, an asteria enclosing the disk with its silver tentacles an enormous eye filled with flames, a glory carved for Pluto's head, a star launched by the Creator's hand and crushed against the face of the moon. Tycho forms such a concentration of light that the inhabitants of the earth can see it without glasses, though at a distance of 240,000 miles. Imagine, then, its intensity to the eye of observers placed at a distance of only 50 miles. Seen through this pure ether, its brilliancy was so intolerable that Barbicane and his friends were obliged to blacken their glasses with the gas smoke before they could bear the splendor. Then, silent, scarcely uttering an interjection of admiration, they gazed, they contemplated. All their feelings, all their impressions, were concentrated in that look, as under any violent emotion all life is concentrated at the heart. Tycho belongs to the system of radiating mountains, like Aristarchus and Copernicus, but it is of all the most complete and decided, showing unquestionably the frightful volcanic action to which the formation of the moon is due. Tycho is situated in 43 degrees south latitude and 12 degrees east longitude. Its center is occupied by a crater 50 miles broad. It assumes a slightly elliptical form, and is surrounded by an enclosure of annular ramparts, which on the east and west overlook the outer plain from a height of 15,000 feet. It is a group of Mont Blancs, placed round one common centre and crowned by radiating beams. 
What this incomparable mountain really is, with all the projections converging toward it, and the interior excrescences of its crater, photography itself could never represent. Indeed, it is during the full moon that Tycho is seen in all its splendor. Then all shadows disappear, the foreshortening of perspective disappears, and all proofs become white. A disagreeable fact, for this strange region would have been marvellous if reproduced with photographic exactness. It is but a group of hollows, craters, circles, a network of crests. Then, as far as the eye could see, a whole volcanic network cast upon this encrusted soil. One can then understand that the bubbles of this central eruption have kept their first form. Crystallized by cooling, they have stereotyped that aspect which the moon formerly presented when under the Plutonian forces. The distance which separated the travellers from the annular summits of Tycho was not so great but that they could catch the principal details. Even on the causeway forming the fortifications of Tycho, the mountains hanging on to the interior and exterior sloping flanks rose in stories like gigantic terraces. They appeared to be higher by three hundred or four hundred feet to the west than to the east. No system of terrestrial encampment could equal these natural fortifications. A town built at the bottom of this circular cavity would have been utterly inaccessible. Inaccessible and wonderfully extended over this soil covered with picturesque projections. Indeed, nature had not left the bottom of this crater flat and empty. It possessed its own peculiar orography, a mountainous system, making it a world in itself. The travellers could distinguish clearly cones, central hills, remarkable positions of the soil, naturally placed to receive the chef d'oeuvre of Selenite architecture. There was marked out the place for a temple, here the ground of a forum, on this spot the plan of a palace, in another the plateau for a citadel, the whole overlooked by a central mountain of fifteen hundred feet. A vast circle in which ancient Rome could have been held in its entirety ten times over. "'Ah!' exclaimed Michel Ardin, enthusiastic at the sight. "'What a grand town might be constructed within that ring of mountains! A quiet city, a peaceful refuge, beyond all human misery! How calm and isolated those misanthropes, those haters of humanity, might live there, and all who have a distaste for social life. All! It would be too small for them, replied Barbicane simply. End of chapter. Chapter 18 of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 18. Grave Questions. But the projectile had passed the enceinte of Tycho, and Barbicane and his two companions watched with scrupulous attention the brilliant rays which the celebrated mountain shed so curiously all over the horizon. What was this radiant glory? What geological phenomenon had designed these ardent beams? This question occupied Barbicane's mind. Under his eyes ran in all directions luminous furrows, raised at the edges and concave in the center, some twelve miles, others thirty miles broad. These brilliant trains extended in some places to within six hundred miles of Tycho, and seemed to cover, particularly towards the east, the northeast, and the north, the half of the southern hemisphere. One of these jets extended as far as the circle of Neander, situated on the fortieth meridian. Another, by a slight curve, furrowed the Sea of Nectar, breaking against the chain of Pyrenees after a circuit of eight hundred miles. Others, towards the west, covered the Sea of Clouds and the Sea of Humours with a luminous network. 
what was the origin of these sparkling rays which shone on the plains as well as on the reliefs at whatever height they might be all started from a common centre the crater of tycho they sprang from him herschel attributed their brilliancy to currents of lava congealed by the cold an opinion however which has not been generally adopted other astronomers have seen in these inexplicable rays a kind of moraines rows of erratic blocks which have been thrown up at the period of tycho's formation and why not asked nicholl of barbicane who was relating and rejecting these different opinions because the regularity of these luminous lines and the violence necessary to carry volcanic matter to such distances is inexplicable eh by jove replied michel ardin it seems easy enough to me to explain the origin of these rays indeed said barbicane indeed continued michel it is enough to say that it is a vast star similar to that produced by a ball or a stone thrown at a square of glass well replied barbicane smiling and what hand would be powerful enough to throw a ball to give such a shock as that the hand is not necessary answered nicholl not at all confounded and as to the stone let us suppose it to be a comet ah those much abused comets exclaimed barbicane my brave michel your explanation is not bad but your comet is useless the shock which produced that rent must have come from the inside of the star a violent contraction of the lunar crust while cooling might suffice to imprint this gigantic star a contraction something like a lunar stomach ache said michel ardin besides added barbicane this opinion is that of an english savant naismith and it seems to me to sufficiently explain the radiation of these mountains that naismith was no fool replied michel long did the travellers whom such a sight could never weary admire the splendours of tycho their projectile saturated with luminous gleams in the double irradiation of sun and moon must have appeared like an incandescent globe they had passed suddenly from excessive cold to intense heat nature was thus preparing them to become selenites become selenites that idea brought up once more the question of the habitability of the moon after what they had seen could the travellers solve it would they decide for or against it michel ardin persuaded his two friends to form an opinion and asked them directly if they thought that men and animals were represented in the lunar world i think that we can answer said barbicane but according to my idea the question ought not to be put in that form i ask it to be put differently put it in your own way replied michel here it is continued barbicane the problem is a double one and requires a double solution is the moon habitable has the moon ever been inhabitable good replied nicholl first let us see whether the moon is habitable to tell the truth i know nothing about it answered michel and i answer in the negative continued barbicane in her actual state with her surrounding atmosphere certainly very much reduced her seas for the most part dried up her insufficient supply of water restricted vegetation sudden alterations of cold and heat her days and nights of three hundred fifty four hours the moon does not seem habitable to me nor does she seem propitious to animal development nor sufficient for the wants of existence as we understand it agreed replied nicholl but is not the moon habitable for creatures differently organized from ourselves that question is more difficult to answer but i will try and i ask nicholl if motion appears to him to be a necessary result of life whatever be its organization without a doubt answered nicholl then my worthy companion i would answer that we have observed the lunar continent at a distance of five hundred yards at most 
and that nothing seemed to us to move on the moon's surface. The presence of any kind of life would have been betrayed by its attendant marks, such as divers' buildings, and even by ruins. And what have we seen? Everywhere and always the geological works of nature, never the work of man. If, then, there exist representatives of the animal kingdom on the moon, they must have fled to those unfathomable cavities which the eye cannot reach, which I cannot admit, for they must have left traces of their passage on those plains which the atmosphere must cover, however slightly raised it may be. These traces are nowhere visible. There remains but one hypothesis, that of a living race to which motion, which is life, is foreign. "'One might as well say, living creatures which do not live,' replied Michel. "'Just so,' said Barbicane, "'which for us has no meaning.' "'Then we may form our opinion,' said Michel. "'Yes,' replied Nicholl. "'Very well,' continued Michel Ardin. "'The scientific commission, assembled in the projectile of the gun-club, after having founded their argument on facts recently observed, decide unanimously upon the question of the habitability of the moon. No, the moon is not habitable. This decision was consigned by President Barbicane to his notebook, where the process of the sitting of the 6th of December may be seen. Now, said Nicholl, let us attack the second question, an indispensable complement of the first. I ask the Honourable Commission, if the moon is not habitable, has she ever been inhabited, Citizen Barbicane? My friends, replied Barbicane, I did not undertake this journey in order to form an opinion on the past habitability of our satellite, but I will add that our personal observations only confirm me in this opinion. I believe, indeed, I affirm, that the moon has been inhabited by a human race organized like our own, that she has produced animals anatomically formed like the terrestrial animals. But I add that these races, human or animal, have had their day and are now forever extinct. Then, asked Michel, the moon must be older than the earth? No, said Barbicane decidedly but a world which has grown old quicker, and whose formation and deformation have been more rapid. Relatively, the organizing force of matter has been much more violent in the interior of the moon than in the interior of the terrestrial globe. The actual state of this cracked, twisted, and burst disk abundantly proves this. The moon and the earth were nothing but gaseous masses originally. These gases have passed into a liquid state under different influences, and the solid masses have been formed later. But most certainly our sphere was still gaseous or liquid when the moon was solidified by cooling and had become habitable. "'I believe it,' said Nicholl. "'Then,' continued Barbicane, "'an atmosphere surrounded it. The waters contained within this gaseous envelope could not evaporate.' Under the influence of air, water, light, solar heat, and central heat, vegetation took possession of the continents prepared to receive it, and certainly life showed itself about this period, for nature does not expend herself in vain, and a world so wonderfully formed for habitation must necessarily be inhabited. But, said Nicholl, Many phenomena inherent in our satellite might cramp the expansion of the animal and vegetable kingdom. For example, its days and nights of 354 hours? At the terrestrial poles they last six months, said Michel. An argument of little value, since the poles are not inhabited. Let us observe, my friends, continued Barbicane that if in the actual state of the moon its long nights and long days created differences of temperature insupportable to organization, it was not so at the historical period of time. The atmosphere enveloped the disk with a fluid mantle. Vapor deposited itself in the shape of clouds. This natural screen tempered the ardor of the solar rays, 
and retain the nocturnal radiation. Light, like heat, can diffuse itself in the air. Hence, an equality between the influences which no longer exists, now that that atmosphere has almost entirely disappeared. And now, I am going to astonish you. Astonish us? said Michel Ardin. I firmly believe that at the period when the moon was inhabited, the nights and days did not last three hundred fifty-four hours. And why? asked Nicholl quickly. Because most probably then the rotary motion of the moon upon her axis was not equal to her revolution, an equality which presents each part of her disk during fifteen days to the action of the solar rays. Granted, replied Nicholl, but why should not these two motions have been equal, as they are really so? Because that equality has only been determined by terrestrial attraction. And who can say that this attraction was powerful enough to alter the motion of the moon at that period when the earth was still fluid? Just so, replied Nicholl. And who can say that the moon has always been a satellite of the earth? And who can say— exclaimed Michel Ardin, that the moon did not exist before the earth. Their imaginations carried them away into an indefinite field of hypothesis. Barbicane sought to restrain them. These speculations are too high, said he, problems utterly insoluble. Do not let us enter upon them. Let us only admit the insufficiency of the primordial attraction, and then— by the inequality of the two motions of rotation and revolution, the days and nights could have succeeded each other on the moon as they succeed each other on the earth. Besides, even without these conditions, life was possible. And so, asked Michel Ardin, humanity has disappeared from the moon? Yes, replied Barbicane after having doubtless remained persistently for millions of centuries, by degrees the atmosphere becoming rarefied, the disk became uninhabitable, as the terrestrial globe will one day become by cooling. By cooling? Certainly, replied Barbicane. As the internal fires became extinguished, and the incandescent matter concentrated itself, the lunar crust cooled. By degrees, the consequences of these phenomena showed themselves in the disappearance of organized beings, and by the disappearance of vegetation. Soon the atmosphere was rarefied, probably withdrawn by terrestrial attraction. Then aerial departure of respirable air, and disappearance of water by means of evaporation. At this period, the moon becoming uninhabitable was no longer inhabited. It was a dead world, such as we see it today. And you say that the same fate is in store for the earth? Most probably. But when? When the cooling of its crust shall have made it uninhabitable. And have they calculated the time which our unfortunate sphere will take to cool? Certainly. And you know these calculations? Perfectly. "'But speak, then, my clumsy savant!' exclaimed Michel Ardin. "'For you make me boil with impatience!' "'Very well, my good Michel,' replied Barbicane quietly. "'We know what diminution of temperature the earth undergoes in the lapse of a century. "'And according to certain calculations, this mean temperature will, "'after a period of four hundred thousand years, be brought down to zero. Four hundred thousand years!' exclaimed Michel. "'Ah! I breathe again. Really, I was frightened to hear you. I imagined that we had not more than fifty thousand years to live.' Barbicane and Nicol could not help laughing at their companion's uneasiness. Then Nicol, who wished to end the discussion, put the second question, which had just been considered again. "'Has the moon been inhabited?' he asked. The answer was unanimously in the affirmative. But during this discussion, fruitful in somewhat hazardous theories, the projectile was rapidly leaving the moon. The liniments faded away from the traveller's eyes, 
mountains were confused in the distance, and of all the wonderful, strange, and fantastical form of the earth's satellite, there soon remained nothing but the imperishable remembrance. End of chapter. Chapter 19 of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 19 A Struggle Against the Impossible. For a long time Barbicane and his companions looked silently and sadly upon that world which they had only seen from a distance, as Moses saw the land of Canaan, and which they were leaving without a possibility of ever returning to it. The projectile's position with regard to the moon had altered, and the base was now turned to the earth. This change, which Barbicane verified, did not fail to surprise them. If the projectile was to gravitate round the satellite in an elliptical orbit, why was not its heaviest part turned towards it, as the moon turns hers to the earth? That was a difficult point. In watching the course of the projectile, they could see that on leaving the moon it followed a course analogous to that traced in approaching her. It was describing a very long ellipse, which would most likely extend to the point of equal attraction where the influences of the earth and its satellite are neutralized. Such was the conclusion which Barbicane very justly drew from facts already observed, a conviction which his two friends shared with him. "'And when arrived at this dead point, what will become of us?' asked Michel Ardin. "'We don't know,' replied Barbicane. "'But one can draw some hypotheses, I suppose?' Two answered Barbicane. Either the projectile speed will be insufficient, and it will remain forever immovable on this line of double attraction. I prefer the other hypothesis, whatever it may be, interrupted Michel. Or, continued Barbicane, its speed will be sufficient, and it will continue its elliptical course, to gravitate forever around the orb of night. A revolution not at all consoling, said Michel, to pass to the state of humble servants to a moon whom we are accustomed to look upon as our own handmaid. So that is the fate in store for us? Neither Barbicane nor Nicholl answered. You do not answer, continued Michel impatiently. There is nothing to answer, said Nicholl. Is there nothing to try? No, answered Barbicane. Do you pretend to fight against the impossible? Why not? Do one Frenchman and two Americans shrink from such a word? And what would you do? Subdue this motion which is bearing us away. Subdue it? Yes, continued Michel, getting animated. Or else alter it and employ it to the accomplishment of our own ends. And how? That is your affair. If artillerymen are not masters of their projectile, they are not artillerymen. If the projectile is to command the gunner, we had better ram the gunner into the gun. My faith, fine savants, who do not know what is to become of us after inducing me— Inducing you, cried Barbicane and Nicholl. Inducing you? What do you mean by that? No recrimination, said Michel. I do not complain. The trip has pleased me. The projectile agrees with me. But let us do all that is humanly possible to do to fall somewhere, even if only on the moon. We ask no better, my worthy Michel, replied Barbicane, but means fail us. We cannot alter the motion of the projectile? No. Nor diminish its speed? No. Not even by lightening it, as they lighten an overloaded vessel? What would you throw out? said Nicholl. We have no ballast on board, and indeed it seems to me that if lightened it would go much quicker. 
slower, quicker. Neither slower nor quicker, said Barbicane, wishing to make his two friends agree, for we float in space and must no longer consider specific weight. Very well, cried Michel Ardin in a decided voice. Then there remains but one thing to do. What is it? said Nicholl. Breakfast, answered the cool, audacious Frenchman, who always brought up this solution at the most difficult juncture. In any case, if this operation had no influence on the projectile's course, it could at least be tried without inconvenience, and even with success from a stomachic point of view. Certainly Michel had none but good ideas. They breakfasted then at two in the morning. The hour mattered little. Michel served his usual repast, crowned by a glorious bottle drawn from his private cellar. If ideas did not crowd on their brains, we must despair of the Chamberton of 1853. The repast finished, observations began again. Around the projectile, at an invariable distance, were the objects which had been thrown out. Evidently, in its translatory motion round the moon, it did not pass through any atmosphere, for the specific weight of these different objects would have checked their relative speed. On the side of the terrestrial sphere nothing was to be seen. The earth was but a day old, having been new the night before at twelve, and two days must elapse before its crescent, freed from the solar rays, would serve as a clock to the selenites, as in its rotary motion each of its points after twenty-four hours repasses the same lunar meridian. On the moon's side the sight was different. The orb shone in all her splendor amidst innumerable constellations, whose purity could not be troubled by her rays. On the disk the plains were already returning to the dark tint which is seen from the earth. The other part of the nimbus remained brilliant, and in the midst of this general brilliancy Tycho shone prominently like a sun. Barbicane had no means of estimating the projectile speed, but reasoning showed that it must uniformly decrease, according to the laws of mechanical reasoning. Having admitted that the projectile was describing an orbit round the moon, this orbit must necessarily be elliptical. Science proves that it must be so. No motive body circulating round an attracting body fails in this law. Every orbit described in space is elliptical. And why should the projectile of the gun club escape this natural arrangement? In elliptical orbits, the attracting body always occupies one of the foci, so that at one moment the satellite is nearer, and at another farther from the orb around which it gravitates. When the earth is nearest the sun, she is in her perihelion, and in her aphelion at the farthest point. Speaking of the moon, she is nearest to the earth in her perigee, and farthest from it in her apogee. To use analogous expressions with which the astronomer's language is enriched, if the projectile remains as a satellite of the moon, we must say that it is in its aposceline at its farthest point, and in its perihelion at its nearest. In the latter case, the projectile would attain its maximum of speed, and in the former its minimum. It was evidently moving towards its apostolical point, and Barbicane had reason to think that its speed would decrease up to this point, and then increase by degrees as it neared the moon. This speed would even become nil if this point joined that of equal attraction. Barbicane studied the consequences of these different situations, and thinking what inference he could draw from them when he was roughly disturbed by a cry from Michel Ardin. "'By Jove!' he exclaimed. "'I must admit we are downright simpletons.' "'I do not say we are not,' replied Barbicane. "'But why?' "'Because we have a very simple means of checking the speed which is bearing us from the moon, and we do not use it.' "'And what is the means?' "'To use the recoil contained in our rockets.' "'Done!' said Nicholl. "'We have not used this force yet,' said Barbicane. "'It is true, and we will do so.' "'When?' asked Michel. "'When the time comes. Observe, my friends, that in the position occupied by the projectile, 
an oblique position with regard to the lunar disk, our rockets, in slightly altering its direction, might turn it from the moon instead of drawing it nearer? Just so, replied Michel. Let us wait, then. By some inexplicable influence, the projectile is turning its base towards the earth. It is probable that at the point of equal attraction its conical cap will be directed rigidly towards the moon. At that moment we may hope that its speed will be nil, then will be the moment to act, and with the influence of our rockets we may perhaps provoke a fall directly on the surface of the lunar disk. Bravo! said Michel. What we did not do, what we could not do on our first passage at the dead point, because the projectile was then endowed with too great a speed. Very well reasoned, said Nicholl. Let us wait patiently, continued Barbicane, putting every chance on our side, and after having so much despaired, I may say I think we shall gain our end. This conclusion was a signal for Michel Ardin's hips and hurrahs, and none of the audacious boobies remembered the question that they themselves had solved in the negative. No, the moon is not inhabited. No, the moon is probably not habitable. And yet they were going to try everything to reach her. One single question remained to be solved. At what precise moment the projectile would reach the point of equal attraction, on which the travellers must play their last card. In order to calculate this to within a few seconds, Barbicane had only to refer to his notes— and to reckon the different heights taken on the lunar parallels. Thus the time necessary to travel over the distance between the dead point and the south pole would be equal to the distance separating the north pole from the dead point. The hours representing the time travelled over were carefully noted, and the calculation was easy. Barbicane found that this point would be reached at one in the morning on the night of the 7th and 8th of December so that, if nothing interfered with its course, it would reach the given point in twenty-two hours. The rockets had primarily been placed to check the fall of the projectile upon the moon, and now they were going to employ them for a directly contrary purpose. In any case, they were ready, and they had only to wait for the moment to set fire to them. "'Since there is nothing to be done,' said Nicholl, "'I make a proposition.' "'What is it?' asked Barbicane. "'I propose to go to sleep.' "'What a motion!' exclaimed Michel Ardin. "'It is forty hours since we closed our eyes,' said Nicholl. "'Some hours of sleep <sighs> will restore our strength.' "'Never,' interrupted Michel. "'Well,' continued Nicholl, "'every one to his taste, I shall go to sleep.' and stretching himself on the divan, he soon snored like a forty-eight pounder. "'That nickel has a good deal of sense,' said Barbicane. "'Presently I shall follow his example.' Some moments after, his continued bass supported the captain's baritone. "'Certainly,' said Michel Ardin, finding himself alone, "'these practical people have sometimes most opportune ideas.' and with his long legs stretched out, and his great arms folded under his head, Michel slept in his turn. But this sleep could be neither peaceful nor lasting. The minds of these three men were too much occupied, and some hours after, about seven in the morning, all three were on foot at the same instant. The projectile was still leaving the moon, and turning her conical part more and more towards her, an explicable phenomenon, but one which happily served Barbicane's ends. Seventeen hours more, and the moment for action would have arrived. The day seemed long. However bold the travellers might be, they were greatly impressed by the approach of that moment which would decide all, either precipitate their fall onto the moon, or forever chain them in an immutable orbit. They counted the hours as they passed, too slow for their wish. Barbicane and Nicol were obstinately plunged in their calculations, Michel going and coming between the narrow walls, 
and watching that impassive moon with a longing eye. At times recollections of the earth crossed their minds. They saw once more their friends of the gun club, and the dearest of all, J.T. Maston. At that moment the Honourable Secretary must be filling his post on the Rocky Mountains. If he could see the projectile through the glass of his gigantic telescope, what would he think? After seeing it disappear behind the moon's south pole, he would see them reappear by the north pole. They must therefore be a satellite of a satellite. Had J. T. Maston given this unexpected news to the world? Was this the denouement of this great enterprise? But the day passed without incident. The terrestrial midnight arrived. The 8th of December was beginning. One hour more, and the point of equal attraction would be reached. What speed would then animate the projectile? They could not estimate it, but no error could vitiate Barbicane's calculations. At one in the morning this speed ought to be, and would be, nil. Besides, another phenomenon would mark the projectile's stopping point on the neutral line. At that spot the two attractions, lunar and terrestrial, would be annulled. Objects would weigh no more. This singular fact, which had surprised Barbicane and his companions so much in going, would be repeated on their return under the very same conditions. At this precise moment they must act. Already the projectile's conical top was sensibly turned towards the lunar disk, presented in such a way as to utilize the whole of the recoil produced by the pressure of the rocket apparatus. The chances were in favor of the travelers. If its speed was utterly annulled on this dead point, a decided movement towards the moon would suffice, however slight, to determine its fall. Five minutes to one, said Nicholl. All is ready, replied Michel Ardin, directing a lighted match to the flame of the gas. Wait, said Barbicane, holding his chronometer in his hand. At that moment weight had no effect. The travellers felt in themselves the entire disappearance of it. They were very near the neutral point if they did not touch it. One o'clock, said Barbicane. Michel Ardin applied the lighted match to a train in communication with the rockets. No detonation was heard in the inside, for there was no air, but through the scuttles Barbicane saw a prolonged smoke the flames of which were immediately extinguished. The projectile sustained a certain shock, which was sensibly felt in the interior. The three friends looked and listened without speaking, and scarcely breathing. One might have heard the beating of their hearts amidst this perfect silence. "'Are we falling?' asked Michel Ardin at length. "'No,' said Nicholl, "'since the bottom of the projectile is not turning to the lunar disk.' At this moment, Barbicane, quitting the scuttle, turned to his two companions. He was frightfully pale, his forehead wrinkled, and his lips contracted. "'We are falling,' said he. "'Ah!' cried Michel Ardin. "'On to the moon?' "'On to the earth!' "'The devil!' exclaimed Michel Ardin, adding philosophically. "'Well, when we came into this projectile we were very doubtful as to the ease with which we should get out of it. And now this fearful fall had begun. The speed retained had borne the projectile beyond the dead point. The explosion of the rockets could not divert its course. This speed in going had carried it over the neutral line, and in returning had done the same thing. The laws of physics condemned it to pass through every point which it had already gone through. It was a terrible fall, from a height of 160,000 miles, and no springs to break it. According to the laws of gunnery, the projectile must strike the earth with a speed equal to that with which it left the mouth of the Columbiad, a speed of 16,000 yards in the last second. But to give some figures of comparison, it has been reckoned that an object thrown from the top of the towers of Notre Dame, the height of which is only two hundred feet, will arrive on the pavement at a speed of two hundred forty miles per hour. Here the projectile must strike the earth with a speed of one hundred fifteen thousand two hundred miles per hour. 
"'We are lost,' said Michel coolly. "'Very well. If we die,' answered Barbicane, with a sort of religious enthusiasm, "'the result of our travels will be magnificently spread. It is his own secret that God will tell us. In the other life the soul will want to know nothing, either of machines or engines. It will be identified with eternal wisdom.' "'In fact,' interrupted Michel Ardin, "'the whole of the other world may well console us for the loss of that inferior orb called the moon.' Barbicane crossed his arms on his breast, with a motion of sublime resignation, saying at the same time, "'The will of heaven be done.'" End of chapter Chapter Twenty of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter Twenty The Soundings of the Susquehanna. "'Well, Lieutenant, and our soundings?' "'I think, sir, that the operation is nearing its completion,' replied Lieutenant Bronsfield. "'But who would have thought of finding such a depth so near and sure, and only two hundred miles from the American coast?' "'Certainly, Bronsfield, there is a great depression,' said Captain Blomsbury. "'In this spot there is a submarine valley worn by Humboldt's current, which skirts the coast of America as far as the Straits of Magellan.' "'These great depths,' continued the lieutenant, "'are not favourable for laying telegraphic cables. A level bottom like that supporting the American cable between Valencia and Newfoundland is much better.' "'I agree with you, Brunsfield. With your permission, lieutenant, where are we now?' "'Sir,' At this moment we have 3,508 fathoms of line out, and the ball which draws the sounding lead has not yet touched the bottom. If so, it would have come up of itself. "'Brooks' apparatus is very ingenious,' said Captain Blomsbury. "'It gives us very exact soundings.' "'Touch!' cried at this moment one of the men at the forewheel, who was superintending the operation. The captain and the lieutenant mounted the quarter-deck. "'What depth have we?' asked the captain. Three thousand six hundred and twenty-seven fathoms,' replied the lieutenant, entering it in his notebook. "'Well, Brunsfield,' said the captain, "'I will take down the result. Now haul in the sounding line. It will be the work of some hours.' In that time the engineer can light the furnaces, and we shall be ready to start as soon as you have finished. It is ten o'clock, and with your permission, lieutenant, I will turn in. "'Do so, sir, do so,' replied the lieutenant obligingly. The captain of the Susquehanna, as brave a man as need be, and the humble servant of his officers, returned to his cabin, took a brandy grog, which earned for the steward no end of praise, and turned in, not without having complimented his servant upon his making beds, and slept a peaceful sleep. It was then ten at night. The eleventh day of the month of December was drawing to a close in a magnificent night. The Susquehanna, a corvette of five hundred horsepower, of the United States Navy, was occupied in taking soundings in the Pacific Ocean about two hundred miles off the American coast, following that long peninsula which stretches down the coast of New Mexico. The wind had dropped by degrees. There was no disturbance in the air. Their pennant hung motionless from the main top gallant mast truck. Captain Jonathan Blomsbury, cousin German of Colonel Blomsbury, one of the most ardent supporters of the gun club, who had married an aunt of the captain and daughter of an honourable Kentucky merchant, Captain Blomsbury could not have wished for finer weather in which to bring to a close his delicate operations of sounding. His corvette had not even felt the great tempest, 
which by sweeping away the groups of clouds on the rocky mountains, had allowed them to observe the course of the famous projectile. Everything went well, and with all the fervour of a Presbyterian, he did not forget to thank heaven for it. The series of soundings taken by the Susquehanna had for its aim the finding of a favourable spot for the laying of a submarine cable to connect the Hawaiian Islands with the coast of America. It was a great undertaking, due to the instigation of a powerful company. Its managing director, the intelligent Cyrus Field, purposed even covering all the oceans of Oceania with a vast electrical network, an immense enterprise, and one worthy of American genius. To the Corvette Susquehanna had been confided the first operations of sounding. It was on the night of the 11th to 12th of December. She was in exactly 27 degrees 7 minutes north latitude and 41 degrees 37 minutes west longitude on the meridian of Washington. The moon, then in her last quarter, was beginning to rise above the horizon. After the departure of Captain Blomsbury, the lieutenant and some officers were standing together on the poop. On the appearance of the moon, their thoughts turned to that orb which the eyes of a whole hemisphere were contemplating. The best naval glasses could not have discovered the projectile wandering around its hemisphere, and yet all were pointed towards that brilliant disk which millions of eyes were looking at at the same moment. "'They have been gone ten days,' said Lieutenant Bronsfield at last. "'What has become of them?' "'They have arrived, Lieutenant,' exclaimed a young midshipman, "'and they are doing what all travellers do when they arrive in a new country, taking a walk.' "'Oh, I am sure of that, if you tell me so, my young friend,' said Lieutenant Bronsfield, smiling. "'But,' continued another officer, "'their arrival cannot be doubted. The projectile was to reach the moon when full on the fifth at midnight. We are now at the eleventh of December, which makes six days. And in six times twenty-four hours, without darkness, one would have time to settle comfortably.' I fancy I see my brave countrymen encamped at the bottom of some valley, on the borders of a selenite stream, near a projectile, half buried by its fall amidst volcanic rubbish. Captain Nicholl beginning his levelling operations, President Barbicane writing out his notes, and Michel Ardin embalming the lunar solitudes with the perfume of his— Yes, it must be so! It is so! exclaimed the young midshipman, worked up to a pitch of enthusiasm by this ideal description of his superior officer. "'I should like to believe it,' replied the lieutenant, who was quite unmoved. "'Unfortunately, direct news from the lunar world is still wanting.' "'Beg pardon, lieutenant,' said the midshipman. "'But cannot President Barbicane write?' A burst of laughter greeted this answer. "'No letters!' continued the young man quickly. The postal administration has something to see to there. Might it not be the telegraphic service that is at fault? asked one of the officers, ironically. Not necessarily, replied the midshipman, not at all confused. But it is very easy to set up a graphic communication with the earth. And how? By means of the telescope at Long's Peak. You know it brings the moon to within four miles of the Rocky Mountains, and that it shows objects on its surface of only nine feet in diameter. Very well. Let our industrious friends construct a gigantic alphabet. Let them write words three fathoms long, and sentences three miles long, and then they can send us news of themselves. The young midshipman, who had a certain amount of imagination, was loudly applauded. Lieutenant Brunsfield allowing that the idea was possible, but observing that if by these means they could receive news from the lunar world, they could not send any from the terrestrial, unless the Selenites had instruments fit for taking distant observations at their disposal. "'Evidently,' said one of the officers, "'but what has become of the travellers? What have they done? What have they seen? That above all must interest us.' Besides, if the experiment has succeeded, which I do not doubt, 
they will try it again. The Columbiad is still sunk in the soil of Florida. It is now only a question of powder and shot, and every time the moon is at her zenith a cargo of visitors may be sent to her. It is clear, replied Lieutenant Bronsfield, that J.T. Maston will one day join his friends. If he will have me, cried the midshipman, I am ready. Oh, volunteers will not be wanting, answered Bronsfield, and if it were allowed, half of the earth's inhabitants would emigrate to the moon. This conversation between the officers of the Susquehanna was kept up until nearly one in the morning. We cannot say what blundering systems were broached, what inconsistent theories advanced by these bold spirits. Since Barbicane's attempt, nothing seemed impossible to the Americans. They had already designed an expedition, not only of savants, but of a whole colony towards the Salonite borders, and a complete army, consisting of infantry, artillery, and cavalry, to conquer the lunar world. At one in the morning, the hauling in of the sounding line was not yet completed. Sixteen hundred and seventy fathoms were still out, which would entail some hours' work. According to the commander's orders, the fires had been lighted, and steam was being got up. The Susquehanna could have started that very instant. At that moment, it was seventeen minutes past one in the morning, Lieutenant Bronsfield was preparing to leave the watch and return to his cabin, when his attention was attracted by a distant hissing noise. His comrades and himself first thought that this hissing was caused by the letting off of steam, but lifting their heads they found that the noise was produced in the highest regions of the air. They had not time to question each other before the hissing became frightfully intense, and suddenly there appeared to their dazzled eyes an enormous meteor, ignited by the rapidity of its course and its friction through the atmospheric strata. This fiery mass grew larger to their eyes, and fell with the noise of thunder upon the bowsprit, which it smashed close to the sem, and buried itself in the waves with a deafening roar. A few feet nearer, and the Susquehanna would have foundered with all on board. At this instant Captain Blomsbury appeared, half-dressed, and rushing on to the forecastle deck, whither all the officers had hurried, exclaimed, "'With your permission, gentlemen, what has happened?' And the midshipman, making himself as it were the echo of the body, cried, Commander, it is they come back again. End of chapter. Chapter twenty one of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne Chapter 21 J. T. Maston Recalled It is they come back again, the young midshipman had said, and every one had understood him. No one doubted but that that meteor was the projectile of the gun club. As to the travellers which it enclosed, opinions were divided regarding their fate. "'They are dead,' said one. "'They are alive,' said another. "'The crater is deep, and the shock was deadened.' "'But they must have wanted air,' continued a third speaker. "'They must have died of suffocation.' "'Burnt,' replied a fourth. "'The projectile was nothing but an incandescent mass as it crossed the atmosphere.' "'What does it matter?' they exclaimed unanimously. "'Living or dead, we must pull them out!' But Captain Blomsbury had assembled his officers, and, with their permission, was holding a council. They must decide upon something to be done immediately. The more hasty ones were for fishing up the projectile. A difficult operation, though not an impossible one. But the corvette had no proper machinery, which must be both fixed and powerful so it was resolved that they should put in at the nearest port and give information to the gun club of the projectile's fall. This determination was unanimous. The choice of the port had to be discussed. 
the neighbouring coast had no anchorage on 27 degrees latitude. Higher up, above the peninsula of Monterey, stands the important town from which it takes its name, but, seated on the borders of a perfect desert, it was not connected with the interior by a network of telegraphic wires, and electricity alone could spread these important news fast enough. Some degrees above opened the Bay of San Francisco. Through the capital of the gold country, communication would be easy with the heart of the Union and in less than two days the Susquehanna, by putting on high pressure, could arrive in that port. She must therefore start at once. The fires were made up. They could set off immediately. Two thousand fathoms of line were still out, which Captain Blomsbury, not wishing to lose precious time in hauling in, resolved to cut. "'We will fasten the end to a buoy,' said he and that buoy will show us the exact spot where the projectile fell. "'Besides,' replied Lieutenant Bronsfield, "'we have our situation exact. Twenty-seven degrees seven minutes north latitude, and forty-one degrees thirty-seven minutes west longitude.' "'Well, Mr. Bronsfield,' replied the captain, "'now, with your permission, we will have the line cut.' A strong buoy, strengthened by a couple of spars, was thrown into the ocean. The end of the rope was carefully lashed to it, and, left solely to the rise and fall of the billows, the buoy could not sensibly deviate from the spot. At this moment the engineer sent to inform the captain that steam was up and they could start, for which agreeable communication the captain thanked him. The course was then given north-northeast, and the corvette, wearing, steered at full steam direct for San Francisco. It was three in the morning. Four hundred and fifty miles to cross. It was nothing for a good vessel like the Susquehanna. In thirty-six hours she had covered that distance, and on the 14th of December, at twenty-seven minutes past one at night, she entered the Bay of San Francisco. At the sight of a ship of the National Navy arriving at full speed, with her bowsprit broken, public curiosity was greatly roused. A dense crowd soon assembled on the quay, waiting for them to disembark. After casting anchor, Captain Blomsbury and Lieutenant Bronsfield entered an eight-oared cutter, which soon brought them to land. They jumped on to the quay. "'The telegraph?' they asked, without answering one of the thousand questions addressed to them. The officer of the port conducted them to the telegraph office through a concourse of spectators. Blomsbury and Bronsfield entered, while the crowd crushed each other at the door. Some minutes later a fourfold telegram was sent out, the first to the naval secretary at Washington, the second to the vice-president of the gun club, Baltimore, the third to the Honorable J. T. Maston, Long's Peak, Rocky Mountains, the fourth to the sub-director of the Cambridge Observatory, Massachusetts. It was worded as follows. In twenty degrees seven minutes north latitude, and forty-one degrees thirty-seven minutes west longitude, on the twelfth of December, at seventeen past one in the morning, the projectile of the Columbiad fell into the Pacific. Send instructions. Signed, Blomsbury, Commander, Susquehanna. Five minutes afterwards, the whole town of San Francisco learned the news. Before six in the evening the different states of the Union had heard the great catastrophe, and after midnight, by the cable, the whole of Europe knew the result of the great American experiment. We will not attempt to picture the effect produced on the entire world by that unexpected denouement. On receipt of the telegram, the naval secretary telegraphed to the Susquehanna to wait in the Bay of San Francisco without extinguishing her fires. Day and night she must be ready to put to sea. The Cambridge Observatory called a special meeting, and, with that composure which distinguishes learned bodies in general, peacefully discussed the scientific bearings of the question. At the gun club there was an explosion. All the gunners were assembled. Vice President, the Honorable Wilcombe, was in the act of reading the premature dispatch, in which J. T. Maston and Belfast announced that the projectile had just been seen in the giant reflector of Long's Peak, 
and also that it was held by lunar attraction, and was playing the part of under-satellite to the lunar world. We know the truth on that point. But on the arrival of Blomsbury's dispatch, so decidedly contradicting J.T. Maston's telegram, two parties were formed in the bosom of the gun-club. On one side were those who admitted the fall of the projectile, and consequently the return of the travellers. On the other, those who believed in the observations of Long's Peak, concluded that the commander of the Susquehanna had made a mistake. To the latter, the pretended projectile was nothing but a meteor, nothing but a meteor, a shooting globe, which in its fall had smashed the bows of the corvette. It was difficult to answer this argument, for the speed with which it was animated must have made observation very difficult. The commander of the Susquehanna and her officers might have made a mistake in all good faith. One argument, however, was in their favour, namely, that if the projectile had fallen on the earth, its place of meeting with the terrestrial globe could only take place on this twenty-seven degrees north latitude, and, taking into consideration the time that had elapsed, and the rotary motion of the earth, between the forty-first and the forty-second degree of west longitude. In any case, it was decided in the gun club that Blomsbury Brothers, Billsby, and Major Elphinstone should go straight to San Francisco, and consult as to the means of raising the projectile from the depths of the ocean. These devoted men set off at once, and the railroad, which will soon cross the whole of Central America, took them as far as St. Louis, where the swift mail-coaches awaited them. Almost at the same moment in which the Secretary of Marine, the Vice-President of the Gun Club, and the Sub-Director of the Observatory received the dispatch from San Francisco, the Honorable J. T. Maston was undergoing the greatest excitement he had ever experienced in his life, an excitement which even the bursting of his pet gun, which had more than once nearly cost him his life, had not caused him. We may remember that the secretary of the gun club had started soon after the projectile, and almost as quickly, for the station in Long's Peak, in the Rocky Mountains, J. Belfast, director of the Cambridge Observatory, accompanying him. Arrived there, the two friends had installed themselves at once, never quitting the summit of their enormous telescope. We know that this gigantic instrument had been set up according to the reflecting system, called by the English front view. This arrangement subjected all objects to but one reflection, making the view consequently much clearer. The result was that, when they were taking observations, J. T. Maston and Belfast were placed in the upper part of the instrument and not in the lower, which they reached by a circular staircase, a masterpiece of lightness, while below them opened a metal well terminated by the metallic mirror, which measured 280 feet in depth. It was on a narrow platform, placed above the telescope, that the two savants passed their existence, execrating the day which hid the moon from their eyes, and the clouds which obstinately veiled her during the night. What, then, was their delight when, after some days of waiting, on the night of the 5th of December, they saw the vehicle which was bearing their friends into space. To this delight succeeded a great deception, when, trusting to a cursory observation, they launched their first telegram to the world, erroneously affirming that the projectile had become a satellite of the moon, gravitating in an immutable orbit. From that moment it had never shown itself to their eyes, a disappearance all the more easily explained as it was then passing behind the moon's invisible disk. But when it was time for it to reappear on the visible disk, one may imagine the impatience of the fuming J.T. Maston and his not less impatient companion. Each minute of the night they thought they saw the projectile once more, and they did not see it. Hence constant discussions and violent disputes between them. Belfast affirming that the projectile could not be seen, J. T. Maston maintaining that it had put his eyes out. "'It is the projectile,' repeated J. T. Maston. "'No,' answered Belfast. "'It is an avalanche detached from a lunar mountain. 
Well, we shall see it tomorrow. No, we shall not see it any more. It is carried into space. Yes. No. And at these moments, when contradictions rained like hail, the well-known irritability of the secretary of the gun club constituted a permanent danger for the Honourable Belfast. The existence of these two together would soon have become impossible, but an unforeseen event cut short their everlasting discussions. During the night, from the 14th to the 15th of December, the two irreconcilable friends were busy observing the lunar disk, J.T. Maston abusing the learned Belfast, as usual, who was by his side, the secretary of the gun club maintaining for the thousandth time that he had just seen the projectile, and adding that he could see Michel Ardan's face looking through one of the scuttles, at the same time enforcing his argument by a series of gestures which his formidable hook rendered very unpleasant. At this moment Belfast's servant appeared on the platform, it was ten at night, and gave him a dispatch. It was the commander of the Susquehanna's telegram. Belfast tore the envelope and read, and uttered a cry. "'What?' cried J. T. Maston. "'The projectile!' "'Well?' "'Has fallen to the earth!' Another cry, this time a perfect howl, answered him. He turned towards J. T. Maston. The unfortunate man, imprudently leaning over the metal tube, had disappeared in the immense telescope. A fall of two hundred eighty feet! Belfast, dismayed, rushed to the orifice of the reflector. He breathed. J. T. Maston, caught by his metal hook, was holding on by one of the rings which bound the telescope together, uttering fearful cries. Belfast called. Help was brought, tackle was let down, and they hoisted up, not without some trouble, the imprudent secretary of the gun club. He reappeared at the upper orifice without hurt. Ah, said he, if I had broken the mirror! You would have paid for it, replied Belfast severely. And that cursed projectile has fallen? asked J. T. Maston. Into the Pacific! Let us go! A quarter of an hour after the two savants were descending the declivity of the Rocky Mountains, and two days after, at the same time as their friends of the gun club, they arrived at San Francisco, having killed five horses on the road. Elphinstone, the brothers Blomsbury, and Billsby rushed towards them on their arrival. "'What shall we do?' they exclaimed. "'Fish up the projectile,' replied J. T. Maston. And the sooner the better. End of chapter. Chapter twenty two of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne Chapter 22 Recovered from the Sea The spot where the projectile sank under the waves was exactly known, but machinery to grasp it and bring it to the surface of the ocean was still wanting. It must first be invented— then made. American engineers could not be troubled with such trifles. The grappling irons once fixed, by their help they were sure to raise it in spite of its weight, which was lessened by the density of the liquid in which it was plunged. But fishing up the projectile was not the only thing to be thought of. They must act promptly in the interests of the travellers. No one doubted that they were still living. Yes, repeated J. T. Maston incessantly whose confidence gained over everybody. Our friends are clever people, and they cannot have fallen like simpletons. They are alive, quite alive, but we must make haste if we wish to find them so. Food and water do not trouble me. They have enough for a long while. But air, air, that is what they will soon want. So quick, quick! And they did go quick. They fitted up the Susquehanna for her new destination. 
her powerful machinery was brought to bear upon the hauling chains. The aluminum projectile only weighed 19,250 pounds, a weight very inferior to that of the transatlantic cable which had been drawn up under similar conditions. The only difficulty was in fishing up a cylindrical conical projectile, the walls of which were so smooth as to offer no hold for the hooks. On that account Engineer Murchison hastened to San Francisco, and had some enormous grappling irons fixed on an automatic system which would never let the projectile go if it once succeeded in seizing it in its powerful claws. Diving dresses were also prepared, which through this impervious covering allowed the divers to observe the bottom of the sea. He also had put on board an apparatus of compressed air very cleverly designed. There were perfect chambers pierced with scuttles, which, with water let into certain compartments, could draw it down into great depths. These apparatuses were at San Francisco, where they had been used in the construction of a submarine breakwater, and very fortunately it was so, for there was no time to construct any. But in spite of the perfection of the machinery, in spite of the ingenuity of the savants entrusted with the use of them, the success of the operation was far from being certain. How great were the chances against them, the projectile being twenty thousand feet under the water! And if even it was brought to the surface, how would the travellers have borne the terrible shock which twenty thousand feet of water had perhaps not sufficiently broken? At any rate, they must act quickly. J. T. Maston hurried the workmen day and night. He was ready to don the diving dress himself, or try the air apparatus, in order to reconnoitre the situation of his courageous friends. But in spite of all diligence displayed in preparing the different engines, in spite of the considerable sum placed at the disposal of the gun club by the government of the Union, five long days, five centuries, elapsed before the preparations were complete. During this time public opinion was excited to the highest pitch. Telegrams were exchanged incessantly throughout the entire world by means of wires and electric cables. The saving of Barbicane, Nickel, and Michel Ardin was an international affair. Every one who had subscribed to the gun club was directly interested in the welfare of the travellers. At length the hauling chains, the air chambers, and the automatic grappling irons were put on board. J. T. Maston, Engineer Murchison, and the delegates of the gun club were already in their cabins. They had but to start, which they did on the 21st of December, at eight o'clock at night, the corvette meeting with a beautiful sea, a northeasterly wind, and rather sharp cold. The whole population of San Francisco was gathered on the quay, greatly excited, but silent, reserving their hurrahs for the return. Steam was fully up, and the screw of the Susquehanna carried them briskly out of the bay. It is needless to relate the conversations on board between the officers, sailors, and passengers. All these men had but one thought. All these hearts beat under the same emotion. Whilst they were hastening to help them, what were Barbicane and his companions doing? What had become of them? Were they able to attempt any bold maneuver to regain their liberty? None could say. The truth is that every attempt must have failed. Immersed nearly four miles under the ocean, this metal prison defied every effort of its prisoners. On the twenty-third instant, at eight in the morning, after a rapid passage, the Susquehanna was due at the fatal spot. They must wait till twelve to take the reckoning exactly. The buoy to which the sounding line had been lashed had not yet been recognized. At twelve, Captain Blomsbury, assisted by his officers, who superintended the observations, took the reckoning in the presence of the delegates of the gun club. Then there was a moment of anxiety. Her position decided, the Susquehanna was found to be some minutes to westward of the spot where the projectile had disappeared beneath the waves. The ship's course was then changed, so as to reach this exact point. At forty-seven minutes past twelve they reached the buoy, 
It was in perfect condition, and must have shifted but little. "'At last!' exclaimed J.T. Maston. "'Shall we begin?' asked Captain Blomsberry. "'Without losing a second. Every precaution was taken to keep the corvette almost completely motionless. Before trying to seize the projectile, Engineer Murchison wanted to find its exact position on the bottom of the ocean. The submarine apparatus destined for this expedition was supplied with air. The working of these engines was not without danger, for at twenty thousand feet below the surface of the water, and under such great pressure, they were exposed to fracture, the consequences of which would be dreadful. J. T. Maston, the brothers Blomsberry, and Engineer Murchison, without heeding these dangers, took their places in the air chamber. The commander, posted on his bridge, superintended the operation, ready to stop or haul in the chains on the slightest signal. The screw had been shipped, and the whole power of the machinery collected on the capstan would have quickly drawn the apparatus on board. The descent began at twenty-five minutes past one at night, and the chamber, drawn under by the reservoirs full of water, disappeared from the surface of the ocean. The emotion of the officers and sailors on board were now divided between the prisoners in the projectile and the prisoners in the submarine apparatus. As to the latter, they forgot themselves, and, glued to the windows of the scuttles, attentively watched the liquid mass through which they were passing. The descent was rapid. At seventeen minutes past two, J. T. Maston and his companions had reached the bottom of the Pacific but they saw nothing but an arid desert, no longer animated by either fauna or flora. By the light of their lamps, furnished with powerful reflectors, they could see the dark beds of the ocean for a considerable extent of view, but the projectile was nowhere to be seen. The impatience of these bold divers cannot be described, and having an electrical communication with the corvette, they made a signal already agreed upon, and for the space of a mile the Susquehanna moved their chamber along some yards above the bottom. Thus they explored the whole submarine plain, deceived at every turn by optical illusions which almost broke their hearts. Here a rock, there a projection from the ground, seemed to be the much sought-for projectile, but their mistake was soon discovered, and then they were in despair. "'But where are they? Where are they?' cried J. T. Maston, and the poor man called loudly upon Nicol, Barbicane, and Michel Ardin, as if his unfortunate friends could either hear or answer him through such an impenetrable medium. The search continued under these conditions, until the vitiated air compelled the divers to ascend. The hauling in began about six in the evening, and was not ended before midnight. "'Tomorrow!' said J. T. Maston, as he set foot on the bridge of the corvette. Yes, answered Captain Blomsberry. And on another spot? Yes. J. T. Maston did not doubt of their final success, but his companions, no longer upheld by the excitement of the first hours, understood all the difficulty of the enterprise. What seemed easy at San Francisco seemed here in the wide ocean almost impossible. The chances of success diminished in rapid proportion, and it was from chance alone that the meeting with the projectile might be expected. The next day, the 24th, in spite of the fatigue of the previous day, the operation was renewed. The corvette advanced some minutes to westward, and the apparatus, provided with air, bore the same explorers to the depths of the ocean. The whole day passed in fruitless research. The bed of the sea was a desert. The twenty-fifth brought no other result, nor the twenty-sixth. It was disheartening. They thought of those unfortunates shut up in the projectile for twenty-six days. Perhaps at that moment they were experiencing the first approach of suffocation. That is, if they had escaped the dangers of their fall. The air was spent, and doubtless with the air all their morale. The air, possibly, answered J. T. Maston resolutely, but their morale never. 
On the twenty-eighth, after two more days of search, all hope was gone. This projectile was but an atom in the immensity of the ocean. They must give up all idea of finding it. But J. T. Maston would not hear of going away. He would not abandon the place without at least discovering the tomb of his friends. But Commander Blomsbury could no longer persist, and in spite of the exclamations of the worthy secretary, was obliged to give the order to sail. On the twenty-ninth of December, at nine a.m., the Susquehanna, heading northeast, resumed her course to the Bay of San Francisco. It was ten in the morning. The corvette was under half-steam, as if regretting to leave the spot where the catastrophe had taken place, when a sailor, perched on the main-top gallant cross-trees, watching the sea, cried suddenly, "'A buoy on the lee bow!' The officers looked in the direction indicated, and by the help of their glasses saw that the object signalled had the appearance of one of those buoys which are used to mark the passages of bays or rivers. But, singularly to say, a flag floating on the wind surmounted its cone, which emerged five or six feet out of water. This buoy shone under the rays of the sun as if it had been made of plates of silver. Commander Blomsbury, J. T. Maston, and the delegates of the gun club were mounted on the bridge, examining this object straying at random on the waves. All looked with feverish anxiety, but in silence. None dared to give expression to the thoughts which came to the minds of all. The corvette approached to within two cables' lengths of the object. A shudder ran through the whole crew. That flag was the American flag. At this moment a perfect howling was heard. It was the brave J. T. Maston who had just fallen all in a heap. Forgetting on the one hand that his right arm had been replaced by an iron hook, and on the other that a simple gutta-percha cap covered his brain-box, he had given himself a formidable blow. They hurried towards him, picked him up, restored him to life. And what were his first words? Ah! Trebly brutes, quadruply idiots, quintuply boobies that we are! What is it? exclaimed every one around him. What is it? Come, speak! It is, simpletons, howled the terrible secretary. It is that the projectile only weighs nineteen thousand two hundred fifty pounds. Well? And that it displaces twenty-eight tons or, in other words, fifty-six thousand pounds, and that, consequently, it floats. Ah! <sighs> what stress the worthy man laid on the verb float! And it was true! All, yes, all these savants had forgotten this fundamental law, namely, that on account of its specific lightness, the projectile, after having been drawn by its fall to the greatest depths of the ocean, must naturally return to the surface and now it was floating quietly at the mercy of the waves. The boats were put to sea. J. T. Maston and his friends had rushed into them. Excitement was at its height. Every heart beat loudly whilst they advanced to the projectile. What did it contain? Living or dead? Living, yes. Living, at least unless death had struck Barbicane and his two friends since they had hoisted the flag. Profound silence reigned on the boats. All were breathless. Eyes no longer saw. One of the scuttles of the projectile was open. Some pieces of glass remained in the frame, showing that it had been broken. This scuttle was actually five feet above the water. A boat came alongside, that of J. T. Maston, and J. T. Maston rushed to the broken window. At that moment they heard a clear and merry voice, the voice of Michel Ardin, exclaiming in an accent of triumph, "'White all, Barbicane, white all!' Barbicane, Michel Ardin, and Nicol were playing at dominoes. End of chapter Chapter Twenty Three, the final chapter, 
of Round the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith, of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Round the Moon by Jules Verne. Chapter 23 The End. We may remember the intense sympathy which had accompanied the travellers on their departure. If at the beginning of the enterprise they had excited such emotion both in the old and new world, with what enthusiasm would they be received on their return? The millions of spectators which had beset the peninsula of Florida, would they not rush to meet these sublime adventurers? Those legions of strangers, hurrying from all parts of the globe toward the American shores, would they leave the Union without having seen Barbicane, Nicol, and Michel Ardin? No! And the ardent passion of the public was bound to respond worthily to the greatness of the enterprise. Human creatures who had left the terrestrial sphere, and returned after this strange voyage into celestial space, could not fail to be received as the prophet Elias would be if he came back to earth. To see them first, and then to hear them, such was the universal longing. Barbicane, Michel Ardin, Nicol, and the delegates of the Gun Club, returning without delay to Baltimore, were received with indescribable enthusiasm. The notes of President Barbicane's voyage were ready to be given to the public. The New York Herald bought the manuscript at a price not yet known, but which must have been very high. Indeed, during the publication of A Journey to the Moon, the sale of this paper amounted to five millions of copies. Three days after the return of the travellers to the earth, the slightest detail of their expedition was known. There remained nothing more but to see the heroes of the superhuman enterprise. The expedition of Barbicane and his friends round the moon had enabled them to correct the many admitted theories regarding the terrestrial satellite. These savants had observed de Vizu, and under particular circumstances. They knew what systems should be rejected, what retained with regard to the formation of that orb, its origin, its habitability. Its past, present, and future had even given up their last secrets. Who could advance objections against conscientious observers who at less than twenty-four miles' distance had marked that curious mountain of Tycho, the strangest system of lunar orography? How answer those savants whose sight had penetrated the abyss of Pluto's circle? How contradict those bold ones whom the chances of their enterprise had borne over that invisible face of the disk which no human eye until then had ever seen? It was now their turn to impose some limit on that selenographic science which had reconstructed the lunar world as Cuvier did the skeleton of a fossil, and say— the moon was this, a habitable world, inhabited before the earth. The moon is that, a world uninhabitable, and now uninhabited. To celebrate the return of its most illustrious member and his two companions, the gun club decided upon giving a banquet, but a banquet worthy of the conquerors, worthy of the American people and under such conditions that all the inhabitants of the Union could directly take part in it. All the headlines of railroads in the state were joined by flying rails, and on all the platforms, lined with the same flags, and decorated with the same ornaments, were tables laid and all served alike. At certain hours, successively calculated, marked by electric clocks which beat the seconds at the same time, the population were invited to take their place at the banquet tables. For four days, from the 5th to the 9th of January, the trains were stopped as they are on Sundays on the railways of the United States, and every road was open. One engine only, at full speed, drawing a triumphal carriage, had the right of travelling for those four days on the railroads of the United States. The engine was manned by a driver and a stoker, and bore, by special favor, the Honorable J. T. Maston, Secretary of the Gun Club. 
The carriage was reserved for President Barbicane, Captain Nicholl, and Michel Ardin. At the whistle of the driver, amid the hurrahs and all the admiring vociferations of the American language, the train left the platform of Baltimore. It travelled at a speed of 160 miles in the hour. But what was this speed compared with that which had carried the three heroes from the mouth of the Columbiad? Thus they sped from one town to the other, finding whole populations at table on their road, saluting them with the same acclamations, lavishing the same bravos. They travelled in this way through the east of the Union, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, Maine, and New Hampshire, the north and the west by New York, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin, returning to the south by Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas, Texas, and Louisiana. They went to the southeast by Alabama and Florida, going up by Georgia and the Carolinas, visiting the center by Tennessee, Kentucky, Virginia, and Indiana, and after quitting the Washington Station, re-entered Baltimore, where for four days one would have thought that the United States of America were seated at one immense banquet, saluting them simultaneously with the same hurrahs. The apotheosis was worthy of these three heroes whom fable would have placed in the rank of demigods. And now will this attempt, unprecedented in the annals of travels, lead to any practical result? Will direct communication with the moon ever be established? Will they ever lay the foundation of a travelling service through the solar world? Will they go from one planet to another, from Jupiter to Mercury, and after a while, from one star to another, from the polar to Sirius? Will this means of locomotion allow us to visit those suns which swarm in the firmament? To such questions no answer can be given. But knowing the bold ingenuity of the Anglo-Saxon race, no one would be astonished if the Americans seek to make some use of President Barbicane's attempt. Thus, some time after the return of the travellers, the public received with marked favour the announcement of a company, limited, with a capital of a hundred million of dollars, divided into a hundred thousand shares of a thousand dollars each, under the name of the National Company of Interstellary Communication. President Barbicane, Vice President Captain Nicholl, Secretary J. T. Maston, Director of Movements Michel Ardin. And as it is part of the American temperament to foresee everything in business, even failure, the Honorable Harry Trollope, Judge Commissioner, and Francis Drayton, Magistrate, were nominated beforehand. This is the end of Round the Moon by Jules Verne, translated by Louis Mercier, eighteen twenty to eighteen seventy five. End of chapter, end of book. Thank you for listening.